Welcome back to the question answer discussion. Uh, and the first question for you is aspirin is chemically. So before going to the question, um, uh, let's know, let's discuss about what is aspirin uh, given for. So aspirin is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug having multiple uses based on the different doses. For example, uh, aspirin can be used uh, uh, to reduce the pain. Uh, that's why it's an analgesic. It can be given to reduce the temperature. That's why it's an antipyretic drug. It can be used to reduce the inflammation. That's why it's an anti-inflammatory drug given for uh, rheumatoid arthritis kind of condition. Also, it has uh, the property to inhibit platelet aggregation. That's why it is given uh, for a post-stroke patient or uh, and a post-myocardial infarction patients. Now, the question is, what is this uh, aspirin chemically? A choice, acetyl salicylic acid. B choice, acetyl oxybenzoic acid. C choice, acetoxybenzoic acid. D, all of the above. So before coming to the answer, we should know the structure of aspirin. So, when you draw a benzene and a carboxyl group, this is called as benzoic acid. So in this benzoic acid, if you attach a hydroxyl group at the second position or at the, or at the ortho position, this is called as a salicylic acid. So now in the salicylic acid, if you replace the hydrogen of the hydroxyl group by an acetyl group, acetyl group is nothing but this. CH3CO group, okay? So if you replace uh, the hydrogen of the salicylic acid by an acetyl group, this is the acetyl group, this, the name of the drug is aspirin. This compound is called as aspirin. Now, so you, you can call it as acetyl salicylic acid. So the answer could be A choice, but if you look at the B choice, it is acetyl oxybenzoic acid. So if you take this group together, that is acetyl group and this oxy group together, that is acetyl oxy group together, the remaining compound is just benzoic acid. So we can, we can also call it as acetyl oxy benzoic acid. If you look at the third option, acetoxy. So if you remove this Y and L from the acetyl and combine it with oxy, it would, it would become acetoxy. Acetyl oxy is also called as acetoxy. So this could be also called as acetoxy benzoic acid. So either you can call it as acetyl salicylic acid or acetyl oxy benzoic acid or acetoxy benzoic acid. So in that case, the answer will be all of the above. Uh, and the question for you is uh, the total number of nitrogen atoms uh, present in the purine and pyrimidine rings are respectively two and four, B choice four and two, C choice two and two, D choice four and four. So before answering this question, uh, we should know what are purines and pyrimidines. Purines and pyrimidines, as you all know, they are nitrogenous bases uh, present in the nucleic acids. Uh, and we should know the structure of purine and pyrimidine to answer this question. First of all, let me draw the structure of pyrimidine. So this is a six-membered ring with the two nitrogen atoms at the alternative position. And this is called as pyrimidine. Okay, so this is pyrimidine. Now, uh, to know the structure of purine, we should know one more uh, heterocyclic ring. And that is called as imidazole. So this is a five-membered ring with the two nitrogen atom at the alternative position, whereas this is what this was a six-membered ring with the two nitrogen atom at the alternative position. So this is called as imidazole. Imidazole. Now, if this pyrimidine and imidazole combine together, if this imidazole and pyrimidine combine together, they form purines. So pyrimidine and imidazole combine together to form this particular structure and this is called as purine. 
okay so uh, three rings i have introduced to you one is pyrimidine which is a six membered ring with two nitrogen atom at the alternative position this is a five membered ring with two nitrogen atom at the alternative position called as imidazole and when pyrimidine and uh, imidazole fuse together they form this new structure called as purine now let's go back to the question uh, number of total number of nitrogen atoms in the purine and pyrimidine respectively so this is a purine so we can count the number of nitrogen atoms one two three four so there are four nitrogen atoms four nitrogen atoms and uh, pyrimidine there are two nitrogen atoms so the answer will be four and two which of the following drug is a purine derivative a choice acyclovir b choice cidovudi c choice citarabine and d choice fluxouridine so to answer this question we should know the important purine bases as well as the important pyrimidine bases So you all know, adenine is a purine base, guanine is a purine base, whereas cytosine, thymine, and uracil, cytosine, thymine, and uracil are pyrimidine bases, pyrimidine nitrogenous bases. Now coming to the choices, acyclovir is an antiviral drug mainly given for herpes infections, and uh, it contains a pure, uh, it contains a nitrogenous base. So to remember that, you should know the other name of acyclovir. So acyclovir is also called as acycloguanosine. Acycloguanosine. So can you identify the nitrogenous base present here? Yes, it is guanine. is guanine guanine plus sugar combines to form guanosine okay and guanine is a purine derivative now coming to the b choice sidovudine sidovudine is an anti hiv drug and the other name of uh, sidovudine is uh, acidothymidine acidothymidine or uh, in short form you tell a is a t which is nothing but acidothymidine so can you identify a nitrogenous base present here yes it is thymine thymine plus sugar forms thymidine okay and thymidine is a pyrimidine derivative thymine is a pyrimidine derivative now coming to the c choice citarabine citarabine is an anti cancer drug uh, mainly given for acute myeloid leukemia and the other name of uh, citarabine is cytosin arabinoside cytosin arabinoside or it is uh, called as arasi it's an anti cancer drug okay so can you identify the nitrogenous base present in cytosin arabinoside of course it's cytosin and cytosin is a pyrimidine base pyrimidine base okay it is cytosin now coming to the last choice fluxouridine the name itself again it's an anti cancer drug the name itself has the uh, nitrogenous base yes this is uracil uracil plus sugar combined to form uridine okay and uridine is a pyrimidine base so our question was uh, among the following drugs which is the purine derivative so this is the purine derivative remaining all drug were pyrimidine derivatives so the answer is acyclovir so dbb which is the blood brain barrier is crossed by which of the following drugs a choice physostigmine b choice neostigmine c choice pyridostigmine d choice all of the above so to answer this question you should remember the concept for any drug for any drug to cross any biological membrane to cross any biological membrane it should be lipid soluble and similarly suppose this is the brain and for a drug to reach the brain it should cross the biological membrane called as bbb blood brain barrier and to cross this blood brain barrier the drug should be highly lipid soluble then only it can reach the brain so now there are three cholinergic drugs is given here like physostigmine neostigmine pyridostigmine which among the three drugs are lipid soluble and physostigmine being having a tertiary amine group is a highly lipid soluble drug whereas neostigmine and pyridostigmine are water soluble drugs so the answer would be a choice physostigmine
uh, which of the following rings contain two nitrogen atoms a choice pyridine b choice pyrimidine c choice pyrazine and d all of the above so before answering this question uh, let's see what are these three rings so remember pyridine pyrimidine and pyrazine all these three compounds are six membered heterocyclic rings with the two nitrogen atom then what is the difference so let's see the structure one by one so this is the structure of uh, pyridine and this is the structure of uh, pyrimidine and this one the structure of uh, pyrazine so what is the difference is that all these uh, three compounds are six membered rings that means total six atoms are there one two three four five six so that is the total number of atoms in all these three cases however the position of nitrogen in the case of pyridine is at the first position and second position so if if it is a one and two if the nitrogen is at the first and second position in the six membered ring that is called as pyridine however if the position of nitrogen is at the first position and the third position one and three position in the six membered heterocyclic ring that ring would be pyrimidine whereas in the case of pyrazine the position of nitrogen is the first position and the fourth position then that would be pyrazine so all these three compounds contain two nitrogen atom if it is one and two position pyridine if the nitrogen position is one and three pyrimidine one and four it's pyrazine so the answer to this question definitely would be all of the above this question is uh, redman syndrome is the adverse reaction of uh, which of the following drugs a choice chloramphenicol b choice vancomycin c choice tetracyclines d choice sulfonamides so uh, the answer to this question is uh, uh, b vancomycin uh, as we all know vancomycin is a glycopeptide antibiotic uh, which is mainly the drug of choice uh, for uh, mrsa infection methicillin resistant staphylococcus aureus infection so it's given as a drug of choice for mrsa infection however when you give uh, uh, the rapid iv infusion of a high dose of vancomycin it can result in certain kind of hypersensitivity reaction which is called as red man syndrome or red neck syndrome it's a kind of a hypersensitivity reaction when you are giving vancomycin in a, as a rapid iv infusion okay so it's also called as red man syndrome red man syndrome so the, so the answer is uh, b choice okay and whereas if you look at the other choices uh, chloramphenicol is also a uh, antibiotic uh, and uh, uh, especially this can also cause a syndrome called as a gray baby syndrome gray baby syndrome uh, especially for uh, premature babies okay gray baby syndrome uh coming to tetracyclines it also causes uh, uh, renal uh, uh, problems and that syndrome is called as uh, Fa fanconi syndrome fanconi syndrome especially this outdated tetracyclines fanconi syndrome coming to the last choice uh, sulfonamides um, again an antimicrobial it can also result in hypersensitivity reaction called as uh, steven johnson syndrome steven johnson syndrome so dbb syndrome by chloramphenicol red man syndrome or red neck syndrome by uh, vancomycin fanconi syndrome by tetracyclines and steven johnson syndrome by uh, sulfonamide so answer to this question is b choice vancomycin the local anesthetic la means local anesthetic with the longest duration of action a choice procaine b choice chlorprocaine c choice lignocaine d choice dibucaine so remember one thing uh, the first two drugs procaine and chloro chlorprocaine they belongs to ester local anesthetic ester local anesthetic whereas lignocaine and dibucaine belongs to amide local anesthetic category okay so i have made a detailed uh, video on the classification of this uh, local anesthetics based on its chemistry if you haven't watched it uh, please do watch it it is the link to that video is given in the description box now coming back to the question which local anesthetic is having the longest duration of action so remember one thing normally ester local anesthetic have uh, less duration of action Uh, whereas amide the local anesthetic have more duration of action although there are certain exceptions generally that is the case ester have low duration of action whereas amide local anesthetic have longest duration of action uh, as i told although the, uh, there is some exceptions okay now out of the various local anesthetic dibucaine is the longest acting local anesthetic okay this is the one with the 
more duration of action okay longer stacking dibukine okay uh, as well as this is dibukine is as well as the uh, also the potent local anesthetic a highly potent local anesthetic drug okay so it belongs to the amid category whereas uh, chlorprocaine is the shortest acting local anesthetic is the shortest acting okay so dibukine is the longest acting local anesthetic whereas uh, chlorprocaine is the shortest acting whereas uh, lignocaine is a very commonly used local anesthetic it's commonly used local anesthetic commonly used local anesthetic so question can come like that longest acting dibukine shortest acting chlorprocaine commonly used uh, local anesthetic is uh, lignocaine and these are uh, these two drugs belongs to the ester local anesthetic category these two drugs belongs to the amate local anesthetic category okay question for you is uh, the average normal body temperature is a choice 37 degree k b choice 98.6 degree k c choice 310 degree k d choice 370 degree k so remember although this question is quite simple if you're not careful you may end up with the wrong choice because we all know the normal body temperature is 37 degree celsius 37 degree celsius however in the choices here it is given in the at kelvin scale k indicates kelvin okay so how to find the temperature uh, in kelvin scale or Uh, 37 degree celsius uh, is how much degree kelvin that is another way of asking this question so remember one thing to find the temperature in kelvin scale add the numerical 273 to the celsius scale temperature so whatever temperature is in the celsius scale add this 273 uh, numerical to that you will get the temperature in kelvin scale so in this question we know 37 degree celsius is the normal body temperature so if i put that 37 here and add 273 to that you will get the temperature in degree kelvin so adding this you will get 310 310 degree kelvin so the answer to this uh, question would be 310 okay so one more question we'll discuss here which is a continuation of uh, this okay so so this is the second question of the day which is the continuation of the first question so this same question can be asked with a different choices like uh, uh, here the unit is given in degree fahrenheit okay so we know 37 degree celsius is the normal body temperature whereas in fahrenheit what is the value okay you all know this thing 98.6 degree fahrenheit but uh, how to find if they give some other value in degree celsius how you will find the uh, temperature in fahrenheit so remember this formula c by 5 is equal to f minus 32 divided by 9 c by 5 is equal to f minus 32 by 9 divided by 9 where c is the temperature in celsius scale and f is the temperature in the fahrenheit scale okay so uh, we'll solve this uh, problem uh, i'll put uh, 37 uh, no, degree celsius for c and we'll try to solve this thing f minus 32 divided by 9 now this value would be uh, will come uh, like 37 into 9 divided by 5 which is equal to f minus 32 so this will be coming around 66.6 uh, is equal to f minus 32 now to find f you will add this 32 to 66.6 so the answer would be 98.6 that will be the f value so the answer to this question is uh, 98.6 degree fahrenheit so remember these two questions uh, 37 degree celsius is the celsius scale temperature whereas uh, 98.6 degree fahrenheit is the fahrenheit scale and if it is given in the kelvin scale the answer is uh, 310 degree kelvin so if you don't want to solve this uh, uh, question or uh, as a new uh, equation you can just remember like this uh, 37 degree celsius is equivalent to 98.6 degree fahrenheit which is equivalent to uh, 310 degree kelvin okay question uh, which of the following drugs uh, is not used now in alzheimer's disease which of the following drug is not used nowadays in alzheimer's disease a choice tacrine b choice galantamide C choice donipasil, D choice rivastigmine. So before coming to the correct choice, 
couple of things you should uh, remember in alzheimer's disease there is a we all know there is a loss of memory there is a loss of memory and how this loss of memory occurs one reason is the degradation of cholinergic neurons or the death of the cholinergic neurons okay so due to the degradation of this cholinergic neuron the level of acetylcholine will be very less in the brain and this will results in the loss of memory and mainly this uh, is age related okay uh, the degradation of cholinergic neuron mainly occurs in the elderly people and therefore alzheimer's disease also called as senile dementia dementia is the loss of memory since it is age related or occurs in the elderly it is also called as senile dementia so now how to improve the condition in alzheimer's disease we all know there is a low, uh, less amount of acetylcholine less amount of cholinergic neuron so one uh, uh, way to improve the condition in alzheimer's disease is to increase the acetylcholine level now how to increase the acetylcholine level in the brain we all know acetylcholine is rapidly metabolized by an enzyme called as acetylcholine esterase or choline esterase so if we can inhibit this enzyme if we can inhibit this acetylcholine esterase enzyme we can increase the acetylcholine level okay so the drugs which inhibit acetylcholine esterase are called as choline esterase inhibitor and if you look at the choice all these drugs are acetylcholine esterase inhibitor they all are acetylcholine esterase inhibitors okay so they therefore they can be used for alzheimer's disease because they increase the level of acetylcholine so they can be used for pre uh, alzheimer's disease they can be used for senile dementia however tacrain is not at all used nowadays okay and in fact it was the drug of choice it was the drug of choice for a long time it was the drug of choice tacrain was uh, the drug of choice for uh, improving the condition in alzheimer's disease however the duration it is tacrain is having a short duration of action okay so one reason is that it is since it is having short duration of action we have to give it for multiple times and the second uh, reason uh, it is a liver toxic hepatotoxic okay so due to this reason short duration of action and hepatotoxicity tacrain is not preferred nowadays whereas the newer drugs like galantamine donipesil rivastigmine they are newer drugs and they have longer duration of uh, newer drugs and they have a uh, longer duration of action and they are not uh, toxic to the liver therefore these drugs are preferred to improve the conditions in alzheimer's disease so the answer to this question which drug is not used nowadays the answer would be definitely tacrain okay this question is a numerical one uh, the question is 100 nm is equal to dash m nm indicates nanometers where m indicates meter the quest so the question is 100 uh, nanometer is equal to how much meters a choice 10 to the power minus 9 b choice 10 to the power 9 c choice 10 to the power minus 7 d choice 10 to the power 7 so before coming to the correct answer remember the concept nano is a very small unit nano is a very small unit which is a one in 1 billion 1 billion is a 10 raised to 10 to the power 9 and one part in that 1 billion is uh, what nano okay or if you uh, uh, make the denominator uh, to the numerator side it would become 10 raised to minus 9 or 10 to the power minus 9 so nano is 10 to the power minus 9 okay so we can write 1 nanometer is equal to 10 to the power minus 9 meter so this is the concept you should remember Okay, one nanometer is equal to ten to the power minus nine meters. So the question here is hundred nanometer. That means I have to multiply hundred on the right side also. That is ten to the power minus nine into hundred meters. So ten to the power minus nine hundred. You can write it as the power of ten to ten to the power two meters. So ten to the power minus nine into ten to the power two minus nine and uh, plus two you can add so it would become ten to the power minus seven meters. Okay, so hundred nanometer would become ten to the power minus seven meter. So if you look at the choice, and the correct uh, option would be uh, C, 
10 to the power uh, minus 7 meters, 100 nanometer. Okay. The question is, uh, which of the following acts as the precursor for catecholamines? A choice, phenylalanine. B choice, tyrosine. C choice, glycine. D choice, alanine. So before coming to the correct choice, a couple of things you should understand. What are catecholamines? So basically, they are amine derivatives of catechol nucleus. And some of these catecholamines acts as uh, neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters. They act as neurotransmitters. And examples of such important endogenous catecholamines, that is, uh, those uh, neurotransmitters uh, synthesized in our body, are uh, dopamine, dopamine, uh, noradrenaline. Noradrenaline is also called as norepinephrine. Then uh, adrenaline, which is also called as epinephrine. And these are the uh, important endogenous catecholamines and they act as uh, neurotransmitters. Now, from where these uh, catecholamines or endogenous catecholamines are synthesized, basically amino acids acts as the precursor for these catecholamines. Amino acids, they are synthesized from amino acids. Now, which amino acids? Now, if you look at the choice, phenylalanine is an amino acid, tyrosine is an amino acid, glycine is an amino acid, alanine is an amino acid. So which among these amino acids acts as the precursor for the synthesis of catecholamines? So that is the other way of asking this question. So to understand this thing, you should know the pathway by which uh, the catecholamines are synthesized. So basically, it st starts with the amino acid phenylalanine. Phenylalanine. Okay. So phenylalanine will be converted to another amino acid called as tyrosine. Tyrosine will be converted to DOPA. DOPA is nothing but dihydroxyphenylalanine. DOPA will be converted to dopamine. Dopamine will be converted to noradrenaline or norepinephrine. Noradrenaline will be converted to adrenaline or epinephrine. So this is the pathway by which the catecholamines are synthesized. And uh, these are all these steps are enzyme catalyzed reactions. They involve enzymes and I'm not going to the details of those enzymes uh, in this thing. Just try to remember phenylalanine, tyrosine, DOPA, dopamine, noradrenal, adrenaline. Okay. So now if, if you look at this uh, pathway, uh, which serve as the precursor for the synthesis of, synthesis of this catecholamines, you would say that uh, it would be phenylalanine. But uh, if you look at the choice, uh, B choice is tyrosine. So in many textbooks, it is given uh, phenylalanine acts as the precursor of uh, catecholamines. However, in a multiple choice question, if there is tyrosine in the choice, then the best answer would be definitely tyrosine, not phenylalanine. The reason is that phenylalanine is an essential amino acid. Phenylalanine is an essential amino acid. Essential amino acid means you have to take it through the diet. Okay, whereas tyrosine is a non-essential amino acid, non-essential amino acid. That means even if you are not getting phenylalanine through the diet, still your body will be able to synthesize these catecholamines from the amino acid tyrosine. Okay, so if your choice contains both phenylalanine and tyrosine, the best answer would be tyrosine. Okay, uh, but if this uh, choice does not contain tyrosine, then you should go for phenylalanine. Okay, so remember this thing, phenylalanine acts as the precursor of catecholamines, but if the cho choice, multiple choice question contains tyrosine as an option, that is the best answer. Okay, don't go for phenylalanine. If both A and B are given, like both phenylalanine and tyrosine, you can go for that one. But if you have to select one option from this thing, the best answer would be tyrosine. The reason is that phenylalanine is you have to take it through the diet. That means even if you're not getting phenylalanine through the diet, our body will be still able, will be able to synthesize these catecholamines from tyrosine because it is a non-essential amino acid. Our body itself will produce tyrosine. So the best answer would be tyrosine. The question is, uh, which of the following is uh, not a protease inhibitor? A choice, nelfinavir. B choice, sacunavir. C choice, abacavir. D choice, ritunavir. So before coming to the correct choice, a couple of things you should remember is that all the drugs given here are antiretroviral drugs. Antiretroviral drugs basically used for treating HIV infections. Okay. So some of the important class of drugs uh, for treating HIV infections include NRTA drugs, which is nothing but nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. Another class is 
non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor non nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor third class include protease inhibitors fourth one integrase inhibitors integrase integrase inhibitors but from this fusion inhibitors are also there and so these are some of the important class of drugs used for treating hiv infection now uh, the question here is that uh, which of the following is not a protease inhibitor not a protease inhibitor so remember one thing all the drugs uh, belonging to protease inhibitor category all the drugs belonging to protease inhibitor category end with the naver the name of the drugs end with the naver the suffix end with naver okay they are so they are also called as the naver drugs some of the examples include indinaver indinaver they end with the naver another example is nelfinaver sacunaver another protease inhibitor is ritonaver another example lopinaver atasanaver amprinaver fosamprinaver so all these drugs uh, end with uh, naver okay indinaver nelfinaver sacunaver ritonaver lopinaver atazanaver amprinaver so they are also called as naver drugs okay so whenever a question comes like which is a protease inhibitor or not a protease inhibitor you should remember protease inhibitor end with the name naver so if you look at this choice nelfinaver and naver uh, sacunaver naver ritonaver naver okay so all these drugs are protease inhibitor whereas abacavir is not a protease inhibitor so the correct choice is abacavir which is not a uh, protease inhibitor now uh, abacavir uh, belongs to this uh, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor category nrt drug okay it belongs to nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor category as i've already mentioned there are four class of uh, enzymes nrt nnrt pa integrase inhibitor all these naver drugs belong to protease inhibitor whereas abacavir belongs to an nrt category so it is not a protease inhibitor it is an nrt drug nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor drug. some of other examples belonging to nrt drugs include zidovudine sidovudine lamivudine lamivudine stavudine apart from this vudine drugs are didanosin tinofovir salsitabine then emtricitabine so all these drugs uh, belongs to nrta category abacavir is also an nrta drug whereas naver drugs belongs to uh, protease inhibitor category question is uh, which of the following is a long acting barbiturates long acting barbiturates a choice phenobarbitone b choice butobarbitone c choice pentobarbitone d choice thiopentone so before coming to the correct choice couple of things you should remember uh, regarding barbiturates are there are a class of drugs uh, having different properties like they were used as a sedative hypnotic drug sedative hypnotic drug the barbiturates were used to induce sedation and hypnosis uh, the second use is that um, uh, phenobarbitone kind of uh, barbiturates has got anti epileptic action so it has got an anti convulsant property and the convulsant anti epileptic property especially phenobarbital apart from this uh, thiopentone sodium thiopentone drug is an uh, is used to induce anesthesia so it has got an anesthetic property anesthetic property example of that barbiturate is thiopentone 
So in these three uses, uh, nowadays, uh, this uh, barbiturates are not clinically used to induce sedation, sedation and hypnosis. It is not uh, used nowadays, whereas uh, phenobarbitone is used as an anticonvulsant drug and the thiopentone um, sodium has used as an anesthetic drug. Apart from phenobarbitone and thiopentone sodium, no other barbiturates are used clinically nowadays. Now, coming back to the question, which of the following is a long-acting barbiturate? A couple of things uh, you should remember. Barbiturates can be divided based on their duration of action. Can be divided into three categories based on their duration of action. One is long acting. Long acting. The second is short acting. The third is ultra short acting. Okay. So barbiturates can be divided into three categories based on the duration of action, long acting, short acting, and ultra short acting. So this phenobarbitone is a long acting barbiturate. Phenobarbitone is a long acting barbiturate, whereas butobarbitone and pendobarbitone, it's a short acting barbiturate. Whereas thiopendone sodium, thiopendone sodium, and one more example, methohexitone. Methohexitone. They're also ultra short acting. So long acting barbiturate, phenobarbitone, short acting uh, butobarbitone and pentobarbitone. And ultra short acting includes thiopentone and methohexitone. And out of this, phenobarbitone and thiopentone is the only barbiturate which are clinically used in nowadays. So the correct um, answer uh, for this question would be definitely phenobarbitone. Okay. This question is, which of the following is not a first generation fluoroquinolones? A choice, ciprofloxacin. B choice, ofloxacin. C choice, norfloxacin. D choice, levofloxacin. So before coming to the correct choice, a couple of uh, points you should remember with respect to fluoroquinolones are, they are fluorinated derivatives of uh, quinolones. They are fluorinated derivatives of quinolones and basically they are synthetic antimicrobial drugs, synthetic antimicrobial drugs and um, specifically they are used to treat anti, uh, tre they are used to treat bacterial infections, okay, antibacterial drugs, synthetic antibacterial drugs. And one more point you should remember with respect to fluoroquinolones are that the drugs, the name of the drugs uh, belonging to this class ends with uh, floxacin. Floxacin, F L O X A C A N. So the drugs belonging to this category ends with the floxacin. Okay. Now this fluoroquinolones, the fluoroquinolones can be divided into two categories based on their origin. Okay. Uh, so they can be first generation as well as they are second generation. So the initially discovered fluoro uh, synthesis fluoroquinolones were the first generation and the fluoroquinolones uh, which were synthesized later were uh, belong to second generation fluoroquinolones. So to remember this first generation fluoroquinolones, remember this mnemonic COPN, COPN, where C stands for ciprofloxacin, C stands for ciprofloxacin, the name of the drug end with the word floxacin, O stands for ofloxacin, P stands for pefloxacin, N stands for norfloxacin. So these four drugs, COPN, remember COPN, ciprofloxacin, ofloxacin, pefloxacin, and norfloxacin belongs to the first generation fluoroquinolones. Whereas second generation includes levofloxacin, again the name ends with the floxacin, lomifloxacin, Gemifloxacin, Gatifloxacin, G A T I, Gatifloxacin, Sparfloxacin, Moxifloxacin, Trovafloxacin. So the name of all these drugs ends with the floxacin. So levofloxacin, lomifloxacin, gemifloxacin, gatifloxacin, sparfloxacin, moxifloxacin, and trovafloxacin belongs to the uh, second generation fluoroquinolone. So you try to remember this uh, COPN, whatever drugs coming other than COPN belongs to this uh, second generation category. Now, coming back to the question, which of the following is not a first generation? Okay, so ciprofloxacin is a first generation, ofloxacin is a first generation, norfloxacin is a first generation. So the answer to this question would be definitely D choice, levofloxacin. This question is, uh, which of the following is uh, not a phenandrine derivative? A choice, morphine, B choice, codeine, 
C choice, tapa variant, D choice, um, all of the above. So before coming to the correct choice, a couple of things you should remember with respect to this question is that all these drugs uh, belongs to uh, opium alkaloid category. They are opium alkaloids. Opium alkaloids, mainly obtained uh, from uh, uh, the uh, poppy seeds, poppy plant, or scientifically called as papaver somnifera. Papaver somnifera. Okay. So these are opium alkaloids, uh, naturally occurring opium alkaloids obtained from this poppy plant, also called as papaver somnifera. And some of this important naturally occurring opium alkaloids, uh, the examples include one is morphine. Other example is codeine. Another example is thebane. Another example is uh, papaverin. So these are some of the important naturally occurring opium alkaloids. Examples of naturally occurring opium alkaloids. So out of this, uh, morphine, codeine, thebane belongs to phenandrine nucleus. Morphine, codeine, and thebane are derivatives of phenandrine nucleus. Whereas papaverin belongs to benz iso derivative benz isoquinoline derivative so the chemistry of morphine codeine thebane are they are derivatives of phenandrine whereas the chemistry of papaverin are they belongs to benz isoquinoline derivative so if you look at this choice morphine and codeine are phenandrine derivative whereas papaverin is benz isoquinoline derivative isoquinoline derivative Okay, so the which of the following is not a phenanthrene derivative, the right choice would be definitely C choice papaverin. Next question is which of the following is a long acting tetracycline? A choice chlortetracycline, B choice demiclocycline, C choice oxytetracycline, and D choice doxycycline. So before coming to the correct choice, a couple of things you should remember. We all know uh, tetracyclines are broad spectrum antibiotics. They are broad spectrum antibiotics. Now, tetra indicates four and cyclic indicates cyclic ring. Okay. So, since it is having four cyclic rings in their structure, they are called as tetracyclines. Okay. Now, based on the duration of action, we can divide, uh, we can classify tet tetracyclines into short acting. Intermediate acting and long acting. Now, when you take the short acting penicillin, the plasma half life, the plasma T half, would come around six to 10 hours. Whereas in the case of intermediate uh, acting, the plasma half life will be 12 to 18 hours. Whereas in the case of long acting, the plasma high of life will be 18 to 24 hours. So since it is having long, more plasma half life, this is long acting and the other one intermediate and short acting. Now the tetracyclines belonging to short acting includes the plain tetracycline. Oxy tetracycline. and chlor tetracycline. So these are the short acting tetracyclines. Now coming to the intermediate acting tetra, intermediate tetracycline, acting tetracyclines, the examples include demiclocycline, and metacycline. Demiclocycline and metacyclines belongs to intermediate acting tetracyclines. Whereas long acting having a half life of 18 to 24 hours, the examples are doxycycline and minocycline. Okay. 
Now coming to our question, which of the following is a long acting tetracycline? Of course, doxy or minu. And the answer would be definitely D choice, doxycycline. Okay. This question is, uh, leucovorin is uh, used to treat the toxicity of A choice, MTX, B choice, 6MP, C choice, thiotepa, D choice, arasi. So before coming to the correct choice, a couple of things you should remember. MTX indicates methotrexate. He's used as an anti-cancer drug as well as an immunosuppressant used in rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. 6MB indicates 6 mercap 2 purine, again an anti-cancer drug. Thiotepa, again an anti-cancer drug. Arasi, also known as citarabin, again an anti-cancer drug. Now, let's see how these uh, drugs uh, act to kill the cancer cells or the mechanism by which they uh, inhibit the cancer cells. So methotrexate are basically uh, inhibit the uh, folic acid metabolism. So they are folate antagonist. They inhibit or they target the folic acid metabolism. They are folate antagonist. So thereby which the uh, tumor cells are uh, killed. Okay. Now, due to this mechanism, the active folic acid the active folic acid in the normal cells also will keep on decreasing. Okay, so whenever you administer folic uh, methotrexate, the active folic acid in the normal cells will be reduced. So to replenish the active folic acid in the normal cell, we have to externally administer the active folic acid, which is called as folinic acid. So whenever methotrexate therapy is given, folinic acid will be co-administered to replenish the folic acid pool okay the other name of folic acid is leucovorin leucovorin so folic acid is also called as leucovorin okay so leucovorin is basically used to decrease the toxicity of uh, the methotrexate so the answer would be definitely a choice methotrexate now coming to the B choice, 6 mercap to purine, again an anti-cancer drug, which act by uh, targeting the purine metabolism. So it is a purine antagonist, purine antagonist. Whereas uh, thiotepa is an alkylating agent, alkylate the DNA. So it is an alkylating agent. Okay, they alkylate the DNA to kill the cancer cells. Whereas arasi is a pyrimidine antagonist. They target the pyrimidine metabolism to kill the cancer cells. So they are pyrimidine antagonist. Okay. So methotrexate is a folate, folic, folate antagonist. Therefore, we have to uh, externally administer active folic acid, which is called as folic acid. And folic acid is also called as leucovorin. So this will replenish the folic, uh, folic acid and they will try to decrease the toxicity of methotrexate. And the answer would be um, a choice. This question is a chemistry-based one. Which of the following is a benzyl penicillin? A choice, penicillin G, B choice, penicillin X, C choice, penicillin F, and D choice, penicillin V. So before coming to the correct choice, we all know this uh, different kinds of penicillins all are biosynthetic penicillin. They all are natural penicillins. Okay. Uh, now, what they are chemically? Okay. So if you attach a benzyl group to the penicillin, it would become benzyl penicillin. And benzyl penicillin is called as penicillin G. Okay, and now if you attach a hydroxy group to this benzyl penicillin, it would become para hydroxy benzyl penicillin. So just benzyl penicillin is penicillin G, whereas para hydroxy benzyl penicillin is penicillin X. Now, if you attach a pentenyl group to the penicillin, pentenyl group to the penicillin that is called as penicillin F. So pentenyl penicillin is penicillin F. Whereas phenoxy methyl penicillin is called as penicillin V. So benzyl penicillin G, para hydroxy benzyl penicillin X, pentenyl penicillin F, phenoxy methyl penicillin uh, penicillin V. So the answer for this question would be definitely A choice, uh, penicillin G. This question is, uh, which of the following organ mainly contains beta-1 receptor? Beta-1 receptor. A choice, heart. B choice, bronchi. C choice, uterus. 
B choice adipose tissue. So we all know that beta one receptor is a kind of adrenergic receptor. Adrenergic receptor. Okay. Now this adrenergic receptor mainly can be divided into alpha receptor are of two types: alpha receptor and beta receptor. Alpha can be further subdivided into alpha one and alpha two. Whereas beta receptors can be subdivided into beta one receptor. beta 2 receptor and beta 3 receptors okay now beta 1 receptors are mainly present in the heart and jg cells of the kidney jg means extra glomerular cells of the kidney so these are the two uh, places where beta 1 receptors are abundantly seen whereas uh, beta 2 are mainly present in the smooth muscles of uh, bronchus uterus gastrointestinal tract urinary tract are also present in the liver blood vessels smooth muscles of blood vessels and eye whereas beta 3 receptors are mainly present in the fatty cells that is adipose tissue adipose tissue okay so uh, Uh, coming to the uh, options uh, in heart the main receptor is uh, beta 1 bronchus it's uh, beta 2 uterus again beta 2 uh, and adipose tissue may beta 3 so the correct uh, choice uh, which of the following organ contain mainly beta 1 receptor the answer would be definitely a choice heart question is uh, which of the following is not used for treating herpes virus not used for treating herpes virus a choice acyclovir b choice idoxuridine c choice valsiclovir and d choice oseltamivir so before coming to the correct choice uh, let's know uh, which are the drugs used for treating herpes infections so the drugs which are used for treating herpes infections are called as anti herpes drugs anti herpes drugs and the examples include uh, all the drugs which end with the name cyclovir those drugs which end with the name cyclovir they belongs to uh, anti herpes drugs okay examples are acyclovir valsiclovir jancyclovir famcyclovir pencyclovir okay so all cyclovir drugs are anti herpes drugs all cyclovir drugs I have made a detailed uh, video on the classification of antiviral drugs, and the link to that video has been given in the description box. So please do check that so that you will get get all the uh, cyclovir drugs. Okay, so cyclovir drugs belongs to anti-herpes drugs. Apart from the cyclovir drugs, other drugs which are used for treating uh, herpes infections include idoxuridine, idoxuridine, trifluoridine. ट्रीफ्लोरीडीडोर and foscarnet is also used as an anti herpes drugs okay now coming to the choice not used for the not used for treating herpes virus acyclovir is there all cyclovir drugs are anti herpes drugs uh, idoxuridine is an anti herpes drug valsiclovir again belonging to a cyclovir drug category so that, that is also used for treating herpes virus now uh, so the answer would be definitely uh, d choice oseltamivir and oseltamivir uh, which is given under the brand name Tamiflu, Tamiflu, is an anti-influenza drug. Anti-influenza drug given for influenza infection. Influenza given for influenza. Anti-influenza drug, especially in the case of H1N1 influenza. H1N1 influenza. 
oseltamivir is given for h1n1 influenza and other drugs which are coming under anti influenza drug category anti influenza drug category include amantadine rimantadine zanamavir and oseltamivir so amantadine rimantadine zanamavir and oseltamivir are anti influenza drug and the d choice oseltamivir is mainly given for h1n1 influenza and the brand name is uh, tamiflu okay this question is which of the following ga is highly inflammable a choice either b choice halothane c choice isoflurane d choice all of the above so ga indicates uh, general anesthetic and if you look at the choice either halothane isoflurane all these are in uh, general anesthetics all these are general anesthetics and all these drugs are given through inhalational route so they are also called as inhalational general anesthetics all these are inhalational general anesthetics now inhalational general anesthetic can be divided into two categories some of the inhalational general uh, general anesthetics are in the form of gases so gaseous inhalational general anesthetic and some of the inhalational general anesthetics are in the form of liquid so liquid inhalational general anesthetic and the examples for uh, gaseous uh, inhalational general anesthetics include nitrous oxide nitrous oxide the molecular formula is n2o nitrous oxide laughing gas it is also called as laughing gas so that, that is a gaseous form another example is entonox 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 is a mixture of nitrous oxide and oxygen mixture of nitrous oxide and oxygen that is entonox another example for gaseous uh, inhalational general anesthetic is the noble gas which is xenon xenon is a noble gas so that also comes under the category gaseous inhalational general anesthetic whereas liquid uh, inhalational general anesthetics include chloroform the molecular formula is chcl3 another example is cyclopropane cyclopropane another example is ether especially diethyl ether they are also in the liquid form another example include halothane they are also in the gaseous liquid form halothane and another example all drugs ending with the, the name fluorine f l u r a n e examples are isoflurane isoflurane the name of these drugs ends with the fluorine isoflurane another example desflurane another example sevoflurane another example methoxyfluorane so liquid uh, inhalational general anesthetic include chloroform cyclopropane ether halothane and all the fluorine drugs isoflurane desflurane sevoflurane methoxyflurane whereas nitrous oxide entonox and xenon are in the gaseous form now out of this cyclopropane and ether cyclopropane and ether are highly inflammable are highly inflammable and they are explosive kind of compounds exp okay so ether and cyclopropane are highly inflammable and they are a kind of explosive type of compounds so the question is which of the following general anesthetic is highly inflammable the answer would be a choice ether okay whereas halothane isoflurane and all are non inflammable okay this question is which of the following is uh, not a polyene antibiotic not a polyene antibiotic a choice amphotericin b b choice nistatin c choice hamycin d choice griseofulvin so before coming to the correct choice couple of things you should uh, remember all these drugs uh, are used to treat fungal infection and they are anti fungal antibiotics anti fungal antibiotics now uh, some of this uh, uh, antibiotics have 
multiple double bones multiple double bone structures are there okay and they are called as polyene compounds polyene means there are multiple double bones okay and the example for polyene compounds include amphotericin b nistatin and hamycin so in all these uh, drugs, amphotericin B, nistatin, and uh, hamycin, there are multiple double bones. Uh, so they are come they come under the category called as polyene. Polyene. Okay. Uh, so the answer to this question is not a polyene antibiotic. Definitely would be D choice, uh, griseofulvin, because amphotericin B is a polyene antibiotic. Nistatin again polyene. Hamycin again polyene. Okay. Whereas griseofulvin uh, belongs to griseofulvin belongs to uh, benzofuran derivative. Benzofuran derivative. Okay, so the chemistry of uh, amphotericin B, nistatin, and hamycin uh, is a polyene antibiotic, whereas griseofulvin is a benzofuran derivative. Okay, now one more difference I would like to explain here. Uh, this amphotericin B, nistatin, and hamycin are obtained from actinomycetes and they are called, obtained from a microorganism called a streptomyces. Streptomyces genus, okay. Streptomyces. Nistatin is also obtained from streptomyces. Hamycin is also obtained from the uh, streptomyces. But the species uh, differs actually. So amphotericin B is obtained from streptomyces nodosus. The source of amphotericin B is streptomyces nodosus. Whereas nistatin, again streptomyces, but the species is norse, N O U r s e i so nistatin is obtained from streptomyces norse whereas amphotericin b is obtained from streptomyces nodosus hamycin is obtained again from streptomyces pimprina streptomyces pimprina whereas griseofulvin is not obtained from streptomyces it is obtained from a fungus called as penicillium penicillium griseofulva Griseofulvin. That's why the name Griseofulvin has come. Okay, so except Griseofulvin, all these drugs are obtained from Streptomyces genus, whereas Griseofulvin is obtained from a fungus called as Penicillium Griseofulva. And another difference is that Amphotericin B, Nistatin, Hamycin has multiple double wounds. They comes under the category Polyene antibiotics, whereas Griseofulvin is a Benzofuran derivative. Okay, which of the following is a third generation bisphosphonate? A choice, ethydronate, B choice, palmidronate, C choice, solidronate, and D choice, all of the above. So before coming to the correct choice, a couple of things you should remember. Bisphosphonate, also known as BPN, abbreviated as BPN, they mainly inhibit the bone resorption. Therefore, this can be used to prevent osteoporosis osteoporosis so the main uh, uh, use of this uh, bisphosphonate kind of drugs uh, is they use they are used to prevent osteoporosis one more point you have to remember the drugs uh, belonging to bisphosphonate end with the, the name dronate d r o n a t all the drugs coming under this category end with the dronate okay now based on a Based on the chronology and the potency, we can divide uh, bisphosphonate into three categories. First generation bisphosphonate, first generation bisphosphonate, second generation bisphosphonate, and third generation bisphosphonate. Okay, based on its chronology and as well as potency, we can divide into three generations. Now, the examples for first generation includes etidronate. Etidronate. So, as I told you, the name of the drug end with the dronate. Etidronate belongs to first generation. One more example you should remember, tiludronate. Tiludronate also belongs to first generation. Whereas, palmidronate, palmidronate, alendronate belongs to the second generation bisphosphonate. Whereas, solidronate, solidronate and residronate and recidronate belongs to the uh, third generation 
bisphosphonate okay so the name of the drugs uh, coming under bisphosphonate category ends with the name dronate dronate and they are of three categories first generation second generation third generation now coming to the um, question which of the following is a third generation bisphosphonate okay so etidronate is first generation palmitronate is second generation and solidronate is definitely third generation and the answer would be definitely c choice solidronate uh, which of the following anti cancer drug is not a nitrogen mustard derivative not a nitrogen mustard derivative a choice uramustin b choice carmustin c choice chlorambucil d choice ifosfamate so before coming to the correct choice we should know which are the nitrogen mustards which are the nitrogen mustards used as an anti cancer drugs okay so the examples include mechlorethamine mechlorethamine melphalan chlorambucil cyclophosphamide i phosphamide uramustin bendamustin so these are the drugs which comes under nitrogen mustard derivative and are used as an anti cancer drug okay now coming to the choice a choice uramustin definitely coming under nitrogen mustard derivative carmustin we have not mentioned it here uh, chlorambucil is a nitrogen mustard derivative i phosphamide is a nitrogen mustard derivative so the answer would be definitely a b choice carmustin now carmustin belongs to nitroso urea derivative nitroso urea derivative okay uh, some other examples of a nitroso urea derivative apart from carmustin includes low mustin low mustin and streptosocin streptosocin are other drugs uh, belonging to nitroso urea derivative so carmustin low mustin and streptosocin are nitroso urea derivative whereas mechlorethamine melphalan chlorambucil cyclophosphamide ifosfamide uramustin and bendamustin belongs to the nitrogen mustard derivative uh, which of the following is not a first line anti tb drug a choice isoniazid b choice ethionamide c choice ethambutol and d choice uh, pyrazinamide so a couple of things you should remember with respect to the treatment of uh, tuberculosis or tb there are mainly uh, two categories of drugs one is a first line drug which is the primary treatment because they are primarily used for the treatment because they are highly effective they are high, they have high efficacy they have high efficacy and the toxicity is comparatively less low toxicity okay so that is a speciality of uh, first line drugs and they are primarily used for the treatment of tuberculosis whereas the second line whereas the second line anti tb drugs they have low efficacy and high toxicity Okay. so they are the uh, reserved category of drugs okay mainly we uh, will be treating tb with the first line drugs and which are the drugs coming under the first line uh, category just remember this mnemonics h r e z e s okay where h stands for isoniazid h stands for isoniazid if you rotate this i it would look like h so that's a way to remember isoniazid r stands for rifampicin z stands for pyrazinamide pyrazinamide in pyrazinamide there is a, the letter z that's why z pyrazinamide e stands for ethambutol 
E stands for ethambutol. And S stands for streptomycin, aminoglycosyl antibiotic. Streptomycin. S stands for streptomycin. Okay. So these are the first line drugs. Just remember H, R, E, Z, E, S. They are the first line drugs. Okay. Now, uh, the coming to the second line drugs, ethionamide. Ethionamide is a second line drug. So don't get confused. Ethambutol is first line, whereas ethionamide is a second line uh, anti-TB drug. Okay. Ethambutol is first line and whereas ethionamide is second line. Apart from that, a cycloserin is a second line anti-TB drug. Then para amino salicylic acid is a second line anti-TB drug. Rifabutin. Rifabutin. Second line anti-TB drug, where rifampicin is the first line uh, anti-TB drug. Then all the fluoroquinolones, uh, fluoroquinolone antibiotics like uh, ciprofloxacin, ofloxacin, mefloxacin, levofloxacin, sorry, uh, levofloxacin, all those fluoroquinolones are uh, second line anti-TB drug. Uh, apart from that, canamycin, amikacin, Capriomycin and thiacetazone. So all these drugs belongs to the uh, second uh, line anti-TB drug, which are the reserved drugs. And these are the primary drugs. So you, you better remember HRZDS belongs to the first generation anti-TB drug, whereas other drugs belongs to uh, the second line category. So coming to the question, which of the following is not a first line, not a first line anti-TB drug? Isonia acid is a first line. Ethionamide, don't get confused. Ethambutol is the first line anti-TB drug, whereas ethionamide is the second line anti-TB drug. So the answer would be definitely uh, ethionamide. Pyrocinamide is again the first line anti-TB drug. Okay. Uh, which of the following drugs is safe in pregnancy? A choice, cotrimoxazole. B choice, amoxicillin. C choice, doxycycline. And D choice, ofloxacin. So let's analyze this uh, choice as very critically. Now, the cotrimoxazole uh, is a combination of uh, sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. So it's a combination of a sulfonamide drug and trimethoprim drug. Now, amoxicillin belongs to penicillin category of drug, penicillins. Doxycycline belongs to tetracycline category of drug, tetracyclines. Whereas ofloxacin belongs to fluoroquinolone category of drugs. Okay, so cotrimoxazole is a sulfonamide drug plus a trimethoprim combination. Amoxicillin belongs to penicillin category of drug. Doxycycline uh, belongs to tetracyclines. Ofloxacin belongs to fluoroquinolones. So remember one thing. Um, penicillins as well as uh, penicillins category of drugs as well as uh, and the cephalosporin drugs, cephalosporin, cephalosporin. Okay, so all penicillins and cephalosporins are safe in pregnancy. They are safe in pregnancy. Okay, uh, so uh, definitely the choice would be which of the following drug is safe in pregnancy. Amoxicillin is a penicillin category of drug. So the answer would be uh, B choice amoxicillin. Now, uh, looking at the choice cotrimoxazole, uh, the sulfonamide drug is basically contraindicated in pregnancy because it has a teratogenic risk. So mainly this will result in neonatal, neonatal hemolysis. Neonatal hemolysis as well as methemoglobinemia. So due to this hemolysis problem and hemoglobinemia problem, this is contraindicated in pregnancy. Cotrimoxazole or sulfonamide drug is contraindicated in pregnancy, whereas penicillin kind of drug is safe in pregnancy. And coming to the third choice, uh, tetracyclines, uh, doxycycline is a tetracycline. They are also contraindicated in pregnancy because the bone growth will be retarded, the neonate. The, there will be retardation of the bone growth, bone growth retardation as well as uh, 
uh, there will be teeth discoloration as well as a deformation teeth deformation would be there teeth deformation as well as discoloration therefore tetracyclines are also contraindicated in pregnancy now coming to the fourth choice fluoroquinolones are also contraindicated in pregnancy because of the cartilage damage cartilage damage as well as uh, tendon damage there is a possibility of cartilage damage and tendon damage therefore uh, ofloxacin or fluoroquinolone category of drug are also contraindicated whereas penicillins as well as cephalosporins are safe in pregnancy and amoxicillin is a penicillin category of drug uh, so the answer would be definitely b choice amoxicillin the anti scabies drug linden is chemically a choice bhc b choice hexachlorocyclohexane c choice carbon tetrachloride and e choice uh, benzyl chloride so a couple of things you should understand lindane is basically used is an insecticide which can be used to kill certain mites and lice kind of parasites okay they are used to uh, kill mites and lice okay this mites in humans it causes a severe itching and the condition is called as scabies scabies is characterized by severe itching in humans as lice, especially the head lice, causes a condition called as pediculosis. So since the lindane can kill these mites and lice, they can be an effective treatment for against the scabies as well as an effective treatment for pediculosis. Now, what is this lindane chemical? So if you look at the structure of lindane, basically it's a cyclohexane ring. It contains a cyclohexane ring with six chlorine atoms. This is the structure of uh, lindane. One, two, three, four, five, six. There are six chlorine atoms. So six chlorine atom in a cyclohexane. So it is also called as hexa. It is chemically hexa chloro cyclohexane. This is uh, lindane is also called as gamexane. It is also called as gamexane. Chemically, it is hexa chloro cyclohexane. Also called as gamexin, and then looking at the choice, lindane is chemically hexachlorocyclohexane, and the choice would be B. And BHC is nothing but benzene hexachloride. This is not benzene, this is cyclohexane. So the answer would be hexachlorocyclohexane, and lindane is used for the treatment of scabies and pediculosis. Also called as gamexin, and chemically it is hexachlorocyclohexane. Uh, the amino acid present in penicillamine A choice, cysteine. B choice phenylalanine, C choice proline, and D choice methionine. So, what is uh, penicillamine? Okay, don't get confused with uh, penicillins. Penicillins are antibiotic, whereas penicillamine is a different drug. Okay, so penicillamines are basically used for the treatment of Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease. And now, what is Wilson's disease? They are basically. Uh, uh, um, inherited disorders due to the excessive accumulation of copper in the body, uh, mainly copper poisoning. So the main reason for Wilson disease is uh, copper poisoning. Okay. Now, penicillamine is the drug of choice. Penicillamine is the drug of choice for this Wilson's disease or copper poison. Now, what is penicillamine chemically? Penicillamine is nothing but dimethyl dimethyl cysteine dimethyl cysteine that is cysteine is the amino acid and if you have uh, if you attach two methyl groups in cysteine that would become dimethyl cysteine and that is what uh, penicillin is chemically okay so uh, looking at the choice cysteine is the amino acid present in uh, penicillamine whereas phenylalanine is an aromatic amino acid it's an aromatic amino acid proline uh, phenylalanine is an aromatic amino acid whereas cysteine is a sulfur containing amino acid it contains sulfur, sulfur containing amino acid, and that is present in the penicillamine. And whereas proline is an amino acid, proline is an amino acid. Coming to methionine uh, is again a sulfur containing amino acid. Cysteine and methionine are sulfur containing amino acid, and cysteine is present in uh, penicillamine. Penicillamine is used in the treatment of Wilson's disease, in fact, the drug of choice, and Wilson's disease is mainly due to the copper poisoning. The amount of sulfur methoxazole present in a 480 mg tablet of septran drug. Septran drug. 
A choice, 400 mg. B choice, 80 mg. C choice, 240 mg. And D choice, 480 mg. So some of the important points you should know with respect to this question is that what is Septran? So Septran is the brand name of a combination drug and uh, that combination drug is called as cotrimoxazole. Cotrimoxazole, it's a combination drug and the brand name of that uh, is Septran. Now, what is this cotrimoxazole combination? What does it include? Okay, so the two drugs are present in cotrimoxazole. One is sulfa methoxazole, which is a sulfonamide drug. Apart from that, trimethoprim is present. So the combination of sulfa methoxazole and trimethoprim is called as cotrimoxazole and the brand name is septran. Okay. Now, another point you should remember, the ratio of sulfa methoxazole, the ratio of sulfa methoxazole, the ratio of sulfa methoxazole and trimethoprim in cotrimoxazole should be 5 is to 1. So in the formulation, tablet or cap, whatever thing, the ratio between sulfa methoxyl and trimethoprim should be 5 is to 1 ratio. That means 5 parts of sulfa methoxyl is present, then 1 part of trimethoprim should be present. Okay, So that is a, a, a ratio of uh, sulfa methoxyl and trimethoprim in this combination. Okay. Now, for example, suppose we take 100 mg of 100 mg of sulfa methoxyl, then what is the amount of trimethoprim? Yes, it should be the 1 by 5 of 100, that would be 20 mg, okay? That would be 20 mg and the total would be, the, the total weight would be 120 mg, 100 plus 20, 120 mg, okay? Suppose we take uh, 200 mg of sulfamethoxyl, what would be the ratio, what would be the weight of trimethoprim? 1 by 5 of uh, 200, that would be 40, that would be 40, okay? That is a 5 is to 1 ratio, uh, that is a 5 is to 1 ratio, sorry, 40. So 5 is to 1 ratio and the total weight would be 200 plus 40 to 40 mg. Now suppose if I take 400 mg of sulfa methoxyl, what would be the weight of trimethoprim? Yes, 1 by 5th of the 400 that is 80 mg and the total weight would be 400 plus 80 that would be 480 mg. Now suppose if I take 800 mg of sulfa methoxyl, what would be the weight of uh, trimethoprim? Yes, it is 160 mg and the total weight would be 960 mg. So remember, whatever trimethoprim you take, the sulfa methoxyl should be five times more than that of trimethoprim. That is five is to one ratio. Sulfa is five parts and trimethoprim is one part. Now if you look at the question, the total weight here given is 480 mg, 480, okay, 480. So in the 480 mg, 400 mg is sulfa methoxyl and 80 mg is trimethoprim. And the question was that what is the amount of sulfa methoxyl present? So the answer would be definitely A choice 400 mg. Okay. So the brand name of uh, this combination, cotrimoxyl, is called a septran. Some other brand names uh, apart from septran include Sepmax. Sepmax is also cotrimoxyl, also Bactrim, B A C T R I M. Bactrim. So bat, they, they are also the brand name of cotrimoxazole. Cotrimoxazole. So the question could be asked in this way also. What is the amount of sulfa methoxyl present in Sepmax or Bactrim or Septram? All the all are the brand, all these three names are the brand names of cotrimoxazole, which is a combination of sulfa methoxyl and trimethoprim in the ratio of 5 is to 1. So you can calculate accordingly. Cotrimazine is the combination of trimethoprim and which drug? A choice, sulfa methoxazole, B choice, sulfa diacin, C choice, clotrimazole, D choice, sulfa doxin. So before coming to the correct choice, a couple of things you should remember with respect to cotrimazine. So this cotrimazine is a fixed dose combination drug, fixed dose combination drug, which has one sulfonamide drug, and one trimethoprim drug. So it's a fixed dose combination of one sulfonamide drug and trimethoprim. And which sulfonamide? And the answer is sulfa diacin. So cotrimacin is a fixed dose combination of sulfa diacin and trimethoprim. Clear? So you can remember from the name itself, cotrimacin. It has a TRIM, the word contains TRIM. 
So that indicates trimethoprim. This uh, cotrim in the word contains acin that indicates sulfadiacin. Sulfadiacin. So TRM indicates trimethoprim, acin indicates sulfadiacin. So it's a fixed dose combination of sulfadiacin and trimethoprim. One more fixed dose combination which has a similar name with, with uh, to that of cotrimazine is cotrimoxazole. So this question can also come for exam, cotrimoxazole. So again, this is a fixed dose combination of one sulfonamide drug and a trimethoprim. However, the sulfonamide here is sulfamethoxazole. Sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. So cotrimoxazole is a fixed dose combination of sulfa methoxazole and trimethoprim. Again, you can remember from the name, TRIM indicates trimethoprim and uh, on this uh, oxazole, oxazole indicates sulfa, sulfa methoxazole, oxazole, okay? So from the name, you can remember cotrimoxazole is sulfa methoxazole and trimethoprim, whereas cotrimazine is sulfa diacin plus trimethoprim, both are fixed dose combination. So remember these two questions. And here the question is asked is what is cotrimazine? It's a combination of trimethoprim and uh, sulfadiacin. So the answer would be definitely B choice. Which of the following anti-cancer drug causes severe vomiting? A choice is platin, B choice cyclophosphamide, C choice actinomycin D, and D choice all of the above. So remember the list of anti-cancer drug which causes severe vomiting. Just remember these alphabets C, C, D, D, L. C stands for cisplatin. The second C stands for cyclophosphamide. And D stands for decarbacin. The second D stands for dactinomycin. Dactinomycin is also called as actinomycin D. Actinomycin D. If you bring this D as the first letter, then it would become dactinomycin. So dactinomycin is also called as actinomycin D. And L stands for the nitrosoluria drug, low mustard. Low mustard. So these are the uh, list of drugs which causes severe vomiting C, C, D, D, L, cisplatin, cyclophosphamide, decarbacin, dactinomycin, and low mustard. So the answer to the question would be definitely all of the above. Now, one more point you should remember which is the uh, drug which is used to treat this vomiting? Which is a, what is the treatment for vomiting? So remember, ondansetrone. Ondansetrone and apripitant. Apripitin. These are the uh, drug of choice. Drug of choice for uh, chemotherapy induced vomiting. Drug of choice for chemotherapy induced vomiting, as well as drug of choice for radiation induced vomiting. So two questions which can come from this thing. Either they can ask which is the drug of choice for chemotherapy induced vomiting. Or either on dancetron or apripitan, which is a drug of choice for radiation induced vomiting, uh, the same answer on dancetron or apripitan. Now, the mechanism of uh, on dancetron is uh, they are, it's a 5 ST3 antagonist. It's a 5 ST3 antagonist. Whereas apripitan is a neurokinin antagonist. It's a neurokinin antagonist. So these are some of the important points you should remember. The list of the drug which causes severe vomiting, CCDDL, and uh, the treatment or the drug of choice for chemotherapy-induced vomiting, radiation-induced vomiting, ondansetron and apripitan, the mechanism of action of ondansetron, 5-HT3 antagonist, the mechanism of action of apripitan, neurokinin antagonist. Which of the following COVID vaccine is not coming in the liquid form? A choice, Covaxin, B choice, Covishield, C choice, Sputnik V, D choice, all of the above. So before coming to this uh, question, 
some of the important points uh, we should remember all these three vaccines covaxin covishield and sputnik v all these three vaccines got approved approval from the dcgi and in fact covaxin and covishield got approval in the early this year itself in january 2021 itself uh, this these two vaccines got approval whereas sputnik v recently got the approval on the 13th april 2021 this sputnik v got approval now Covaxin and Covishield is already in the Indian market, whereas Sputnik V will be coming shortly into the market, probably the um, second half of this year, uh, Sputnik V will be coming to the market. Now, Covaxin is an indigenous vaccine. Covaxin is an indigenous vaccine de uh, developed by the Indian Council of Medical Research and National Institute of Virology. National Institute of Virology developed this Covaxin vaccine and it is uh, manufactured by the Bharat Biotech. So developed by the uh, ICMR along with the National Institute of Virology and uh, manufactured by Bharat Biotech. Whereas uh, Covishield vaccine is developed by AstraZeneca along with the Oxford University along with the Oxford University and AstraZeneca developed this Covishield vaccine. And in India, it is manufactured by the Serum Institute Pune. Serum Institute Pune. Whereas Sputnik V is a Russian vaccine and it is uh, an, um, developed by the institute called as Gamelia Research Institute of Epidemiology and Microbiology. Gamelia Research Institute of Epidemiology and Microbiology developed the, this uh, Russian vaccine called as uh, Sputnik V. And currently, uh, the, in India, the manufacturing has not started yet. And prob most probably, Dr. Reddy's lab or Panisha Biotech will be undertaking the manufacturing of Sputnik V in India. Okay. Now, uh, out of these three vaccines, Covaxins comes in the liquid form. It is coming in the liquid form. Covishield is also coming in the liquid form, whereas Sputnik V is coming in the powdered form. That is, it's, the, it's a freeze-dried form. It's a freeze-dried form or it's a lyophilized form. Freeze-dried form or in a lyophilized form. That means we have to reconstitute freeze-dried form or lyophilized form or in the powder form and we have to reconstitute before the use that is we have to hydrate this thing whereas covaxin and covishield are coming in the liquid form so the question is which of the following covid vaccine is not coming in the liquid form so definitely the answer would be c choice sputnik v now all these three vaccines covaxin covishield and uh, sputnik v the storage temperature the storage temperature for all these three vaccines are two to eight degrees celsius to eight degrees Celsius. However, uh, since the Sputnik V is in the powdered form, the shelf life, the shelf life of Sputnik V will be more compared to Covaxin and Covishield because it is in the powder form or in the lyophilized form. The Sputnik V will be having uh, more shelf life compared to Covaxin and Covishield, and Sputnik V is in the powder form, whereas Covaxin and Covishield is in the liquid form. So the answer to this question would be definitely C choice Sputnik V. Which of the following COVID vaccine is mRNA based? Which of the following COVID vaccine is mRNA based? A choice Covishield, B choice Covaxin, C choice Sputnik V, and D choice Moderna vaccine. So before coming to the correct choice, uh, let's understand certain facts about the different types of vaccines. We all know that there are different kinds of vaccines such as inactivated vaccines or killed vaccine is there, live attenuated vaccine is there, vector-based vaccine is there. However, in the case of COVID-19 vaccines, as of now, globally, there are mainly four kinds of vaccines, mainly four kinds of vaccines. Number one, the RNA-based vaccine, the RNA-based vaccines. Number two, viral vector-based vaccines, viral vector-based vaccines. Third one, the inactivated virus vaccines. 
the inactivated virus vaccines. And the fourth is the protein-based vaccine. So these are the four categories of vaccines available for COVID-19 till date globally. RNA-based, viral vector-based, inactivated virus vaccines, and protein-based vaccines. Now let us look at the examples of vaccines coming under each category. And coming to the first category, that is the RNA-based vaccines. Uh, in fact, this is an uh, mRNA-based vaccine mRNA based vaccines. Now, uh, this, uh, this RNA based vaccine is a nucleic acid based vaccine approach, which in fact is a new approach of making vaccines. Here, what they do is that they use uh, a section of the genetic material of RNA. They use the section of the genetic material RNA that provides instructions to our cells to make certain specific proteins. Now, our immune system will recognize and respond to these specific proteins by antibody production and immune system activation. And therefore, this will help us to fight against the future COVID-19 infections. Now, the examples of mRNA-based vaccines include the Pfizer Biotech COVID vaccine, Pfizer Biotech uh, vaccine. And another example is a Moderna vaccine. Moderna vaccine. So these are the two examples for uh, mRNA based vaccine, Pfizer Biotech vaccine. And this Pfizer Biotech vaccine is also called as a BNT. BNT 162B2. BNT 162B2. And this Pfizer Biotech vaccine is developed by the two pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer, uh, United States, and the Biotech company of Germany, and it's called as BNT162B2. And Moderna vaccine is also an RNA-based vaccine, mRNA-based vaccine, developed by the biotech company Moderna, and is also called as mRNA. mRNA1273. So Pfizer Biotech vaccine and Moderna vaccines belong to the uh, mRNA based uh, category. Now, moving to the second category, that is the viral vector based vaccines. Now, in this viral vector based vaccines, we use normally use a safe virus, normally use a safe virus uh, like uh, adenovirus, uh, which will be used as a carrier or a vector or a platform. Okay, these uh, safe virus will be used as a platform to deliver uh, certain specific proteins which will trigger our immune system. Now, uh, after triggering our immune system, the antibody production will happen and this will uh, help us to protect the future COVID-19 infections. And if you remember this, uh, the case of uh, Ebola, the Ebola vaccine was a classical example for viral vector-based vaccines. Now, the examples of viral vector-based COVID vaccines include our Covishield, Covishield, also called as the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine. And uh, another example is the Russian vaccine called as the Sputnik V, the Russian vaccine Sputnik V. Also, another example uh, of a viral vector-based vaccine include the Johnson & Johnson vaccine called as Janssen vaccine. So all these three examples, like uh, Covishield, Astra AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine, Sputnik V, the Russian vaccine, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine called as the Janssen vaccine belongs to the viral vector-based vaccines. Now, coming to the third category, that is the inactivated virus vaccine. So in this approach, we will be taking the disease carrying virus as such, and they will be inactivated or killed. Okay, the disease carrying virus will be taken and they will be killed or inactivated by either by heat treatment or chemical treatment or by radiation treatment or by radiation they, these whole, uh, the whole virus will be killed and they, they will be become inactive virus. And now 
this will be used as a kind of a vaccine. And the examples of uh, this uh, inactivated or killed vaccines include our indigenous vaccine uh, developed and manufactured in India called as Covaxin, none other than Covaxin, developed um, in India by ICMR and National Institute of Virology, manufactured by the Bharat Biotech. Covaxin is an inactivated virus vaccine. Another example of inactivated uh, vaccines include the Chinese vaccines like uh, Sinovac, Sinovac and Sinopharm X2. So these are um, the Sinovac and Sinopharm X2 are um, uh, developed and manufactured by Chinese companies, Sinovac and Sinopharm companies. And Covaxin, the indigenous vaccine uh, developed in India, it also belongs to inactivated virus vaccines. Now, Moving to the uh, fourth category of, of COVID-19 vaccine, which is the protein-based vaccine. And here uh, we use the specific proteins, specific uh, subunit or the proteins uh, to trigger our immune system. If you remember the childhood vaccines like um, uh, diphtheria, pertussis, uh, tetanus, vac those uh, vaccines uh, belongs to this protein-based vaccines. Okay, now the examples for uh, the protein based vaccine include Covovax, Covovax, developed by the Novavax company, so also called as Novavax, Novavax vaccine, COVID vaccine. Okay, so Covovax or Novavax is developed by the Novavax uh, pharmaceutical company and they belongs to the protein based vaccine. So we have covered all the four kinds of COVID-19 vaccines available globally, RNA based, viral vector based, inactivated virus vaccines and protein based vaccine. Pfizer Biotech and Moderna vaccines belongs to RNA based vaccines, mRNA vaccines. Covishield, Sputnik V, and Janssen vaccines belongs to the viral vector based vaccine. Covaxin, Sinovac, and Sinopharm belongs to the inactivated or killed virus vaccines, whereas Novavax or Co uh, Co Covovax belongs to the protein based vaccines. Now, coming to the questions, which of the following COVID vaccine is an mRNA based vaccine? So, Covishield belongs to viral vector based vaccine. Covaxin belongs to inactivated virus vaccines. Sputnik V again belongs to viral vector based vaccines. Moderna vaccine is an RNA based vaccine. Okay. And if you wanted to remember in the word Moderna, there is mRNA. So it belongs to an mRNA based vaccine. So the answer to this question would be definitely D choice uh, Moderna vaccine. Which of the following COVID vaccine is a single dose vaccine? Which of the following COVID vaccine is a single dose vaccine? A choice, Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. B choice, Moderna vaccine. C choice, Sputnik V vaccine. D choice, Janssen vaccine. So remember the fact all the COVID vaccines available globally till date are of two doses. All the vaccines available globally till date are of two doses except the Johnson & Johnson vaccine except the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, all the vaccines available globally till date are of two doses. And the name of this Johnson & Johnson vaccine is called as Janssen vaccine, which is of a single dose. So Janssen vaccine is a single dose and uh, 0.5 ml is the volume. 0.5 ml is the volume, it's a single dose. Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, it's uh, two doses, each dose uh, 0.3 ml, that is 0.3 ml each, 0.3 ml each. Moderna vaccine also two doses, two doses, and uh, uh, each dose is 0.5 ml, 0.5 ml each. Sputnik V vaccine also two doses. Each uh, dose uh, 0.5 ml and Janssen vaccine, that is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a single dose vaccine and the volume is 0.5 ml. Okay. Apart from this uh, co uh, co vaccine, our indigenous vaccine, 
Covaxin is also two doses. Each dose, 0 0.5 ml. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine Covishield, also two doses. And each dose, 0 0.5 ml. 0.5 ml each. Okay, so the answer to this question is uh, D choice uh, Janssen vaccine single dose vaccine. Remaining all the COVID vaccines are of two doses. Okay, is which of the following COVID vaccine is given through oral route? A choice Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, B choice Moderna vaccine, C choice Sputnik V vaccine, D choice all of the above. E choice, none of the above. So before coming to the correct choice, let's understand certain general facts about vaccines. So most of the vaccines, most of the vaccines are given by injection route, parenteral route. They are given by injection route. However, if you remember the childhood vaccines like the polio vaccine called as the Sabin vaccine, Sabin vaccine. Sabin vaccine is an oral polio vaccine. It's an oral polio vaccine given through the oral route. Also, some rotavirus vaccine, uh, rotavirus vaccine is also given orally. Apart from this, most of the vaccines are given through the parenteral route, that is through the injection route. Okay. Now, coming uh, to the COVID vaccines, what all COVID vaccines available till date, all are given through the injection routes only. What are COVID vaccines available in the market globally are given by injection routes. However, some of the COVID vaccines currently under the development stage include oral COVID vaccines. And one such example is uh, Oravax. Oravax COVID vaccine. Oravax COVID vaccine. And this is under the development stage only. And this is developed by an Indian biotech company called as Primas Biotech. It is an Indian biotech company, Primas Biotech, along with an Israel based company called as Oramet Pharmaceuticals. So these two companies have developed an uh, oral COVID vaccine. However, this is uh, under the preclinical trial that is under the uh, testing in the animals. And the latest report says that they have shown very good efficacy in the animal models. However, it has not yet come to the clinical trials. This is under the development stage only. So it is developed by this uh, uh, Primas Biotech and Oramet Pharmaceutical Company. And also Pfizer is also trying Apart from this, uh, Pfizer is also trying to develop an oral COVID vaccine. Merck is also trying to develop an oral COVID vaccine. However, all these are, are under the development stage only. Okay, so what all COVID vaccines available in the market globally are given through the injection route. So uh, whether it's Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, Moderna vaccine, Sputnik V vaccine, whether it's Covaxin, Covishield, all are given through the injection route and they are given by intra muscular injections. They are given by intramuscular injections and they are given to the upper arm and it is given in the deltoid muscle. Okay. So all the vaccines, COVID vaccines available are uh, currently are given through the intramuscular injections and given to the deltoid muscles. Okay. So the answer to this question would be definitely E choice, none of the above. Which of the following COVID vaccine requires the lowest storage temperature, requires the lowest storage temperature. A choice, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, B choice, Covaxin, C choice, Covishield, D choice, Janssen vaccine, E choice, Sputnik V vaccine. So before coming to the correct choice, let's look at the first choice, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. So we all know that this is a RNA-based vaccine. We have discussed this uh, uh, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine in the previous videos. Please do check those videos. So it's an RNA-based vaccine and it requires a storage temperature of minus 80 degrees Celsius to minus 60 degrees Celsius. Whereas Covaxin, Covishield, Janssen vaccine, Sputnik va vaccine, all these COVID vaccines requires a storage temperature of 2 to 8 degrees Celsius only. Whereas Pfizer Biotech vaccine requires minus 80 degree to minus 60 degrees Celsius. So due to this low temperature requirement, compared to these vaccines, Pfizer Biotech vaccine is a bit difficult to uh, for the storage as well as the shipment. Okay. And uh, if you store at this temperature, it can have a shelf life of six months. 
these vaccines, if you're storing it for two to eight degrees Celsius also, this will be having three to six months shelf life. Okay, but this has to be stored at a very low temperature to get a shelf life of, uh, of six months. You can store this uh, Pfizer biotech vaccine. If you try to store this Pfizer biotech vaccine at a two to eight degrees Celsius, the problem is that it will remain only for five days. The shelf life will be very, very low and so only for five days. So the ideal rec recommended storage temperature for Pfizer biotech vaccine is this minus 80 to minus 60 degrees Celsius. Whereas Covaxin, Covishield, Janssen vaccine, Sputnik V vaccine, all requires only two to eight degrees Celsius. Okay, so the answer to this question, which of the following COVID vaccines requires the lowest storage temperature? Answer would be A choice, Pfizer biotech vaccine. Which among the following drug is the drug of choice, is the drug of choice for black fungus infection. Drug of choice for black fungus infection. A choice, fluconazole. B choice, uh, ketoconazole. C choice, amphotericin B. And D choice, itraconazole. So before coming to this question, some of the important points you should know uh, are more all the fungal infections are called as mycosis. The fungal infections are generally called as uh, mycosis. And this black fungus infection is called as mucor mycosis. Mucor mycosis. Mucor mycosis, which is also known as the black fungus infection. Also, this is known as psychomycosis. Psychomycosis. So these are the two different names for black fungus infection, mucor mycosis and uh, psychomycosis. Psychomycosis. Now, uh, this uh, kind of a black fungus infection or mucor mycosis is a serious fungal infection. However, it's a very rare. But uh, nowadays in this COVID-19 patients, we have seen this uh, black fungus infections are getting into uh, getting affected to these patients, COVID-19 patients. Now, uh, this rare serious fungal infection is caused by a group of fungus called as uh, mucor mycetes. So this black fungus infection or mucor mycosis or psychomycosis is caused by the fungus called as uh, mucor mycetes. Okay, and the two common species of mucormycetes, which causes this black fungus infection, include the rhizopa species, rhizopa species, and the mucor species. So, rhizopa species and mucor species are the two common mucormycetes, which causes this black fungus infections. Now. Uh, there are different types of uh, uh, mucor mycosis. So some mucor mycosis affects the brain, brain, which is called as the cerebral muc mucor mycosis, cerebral mucor mycosis. Another is that uh, it, sometimes it affects the sinus. It is also called as a rhino mucor mycosis. Sometimes it affects both the brain and sinus, which is called as the uh, rhino cerebral my mucor mycosis. Sometimes it affects the lungs, which is called as the pulmonary mucor mycosis. Sometimes in the GIT, gastrointestinal tract, which is called as the GIT, gastrointestinal tract mucor mycosis. And the very common uh, mucor mycosis, uh, which affects the skin, is called as the cutaneous mucor mycosis. So these are the different types of uh, mucor mycosis, cerebral mucor mycosis, rhino mucor mycosis, pulmonary mucor mycosis, GIT mycor mycosis, cutaneous mucor my mycosis. And now coming to the treatment uh, for uh, this uh, black fungus infection or mucor mycosis, since it is a uh, fungal uh, infection, the antifungal drugs are used to treat mucor mycosis, antifungal drugs. Now, uh, which is the drug of choice uh, for uh, the uh, mucor mycosis? The answer is amphotericin B. Amphotericin B or AMB is the drug of choice for the uh, black fungus, fungus infection or mucor mycosis. And if uh, amphotericin B cannot be given, the other second alternative drugs include posaconazole. Fosaconazole and Isavuconazole. So 
So the first drug of choice, the first drug of choice is uh, amphotericin B. And if amphotericin B cannot be administered, the second line drugs uh, include posaconazole and isavuconazole. And remember one more point, these are the only two azole drugs, A is a doly, OLE, azole drugs, which are used, uh, which can be used in the treatment of mucormycosis. Whereas you know uh, other azole drugs like uh, fluconazole, ketoconazole, itraconazole, myconazole, voriconazole, uh, Uriconazole, all those uh, azole drugs cannot be used in the treatment of uh, mucormycosis. The only two azole drugs which can be used in the treatment of mucormycosis include posaconazole and isavuconazole. And that the first drug of choice is amphotericin B, if the and the alternative drugs include posaconazole and isavuconazole. So coming to the question, the drug of choice for black black fungus infection, definitely the answer would be C choice amphotericin B. Which of the following antifungal drug is an imidazole derivative? Which of the following antifungal drug is an imidazole derivative? A choice ketoconazole, B choice fluconazole, C choice itraconazole, and D choice uh, posaconazole. So if you look at the choice, uh, all these drugs ends with the name azole, ketoconazole, Azole, A is a do LE. All these drugs ends with the name Azole. So what are these Azoles? So they, uh, the derivatives of uh, this uh, Azoles are widely used as uh, antifungal drugs. And they are nothing but, they are five membered rings. They are five membered rings, heterocyclic rings containing nitrogen atoms. So they are nothing but they are five membered heterocyclic rings containing nitrogen atoms and they are extensively used as um, antifungal drugs. So we can uh, classify this assholes into different categories out of which I will explain uh, two categories here. So some of the assholes contain two nitrogen atoms, two nitrogen atoms at the alternative position and they are called as imidazoles. They are called as imidazoles. If it contains two nitrogen atoms at the alternative position, that is what the first and the third position, that is called as the imidazole. Whereas if it contains three nitrogen atoms, if it contains three nitrogen atoms, that is called as triazoles. The name tri indicates three nitrogen atoms. So these are the two different cat, uh, important categories of azoles, imidazoles and triazoles. And the derivatives of imidazoles and the triazoles are extensively used as antifungal drugs. Now we should know which are the drugs belonging to imidazole derivative category and which are the drugs belonging to triazole derivative category. Okay, so you can remember from this uh, mnemonics, C, O, M, E, K. C, O, M, E, K. C stands for clotrimazole. O stands for oxyconazole. M stands for myconazole. E stands for econazole. And K stands for ketoconazole. So uh, all these drugs, uh, remember this uh, Com, com K, this is the mnemonics, and they belong to the imidazole derivative and they are extensively used as antifungal drugs. Clotrimazole, oxyconazole, myconazole, econazole, and ketoconazole, they belong to the imidazole derivative and they contain two nitrogen atoms at the alternative position. Whereas the triazoles, which contains three nitrogen atoms, uh, the examples of drugs include, you can remember from this mnemonic, flu VIP. Flu indicates uh, fluconazole. V stands for voriconazole. I stands for itraconazole. There is one more drug which starts with I that is called as isavuconazole. 
Isavuconazole. We have discussed this drug in our previous video. Yesterday's video, we have discussed this drug, Isavuconazole. And P stands for Posaconazole. So all this drug, flu VIP, remember the mnemonic flu VIP, fluconazole, voriconazole, itraconazole, isavuconazole, and posaconazole belongs to the triazole category, whereas uh, CUMK belongs to uh, the imidazole category of drugs. Okay, so the answer to this question, which of the following antifungal drug is an imidazole derivative? Ketoconazole belongs to uh, imidazole category. Uh, fluconazole belongs to triazole category. Itraconazole belongs to triazole category. Posaconazole belongs to triazole category. So the answer to this question is A choice ketoconazole. And one more thing you should remember out of these azole derivatives, okay, we have uh, explained the different drugs belong, coming under the azole category. Out of this, the different azole drugs, only two drugs uh, that is isavuconazole that is isavuconazole and posaconazole are the only two drugs which, can, which, are, which is effective against black fungus infection. We have explained this thing in the pre yesterday's video. So do watch those uh, video. So these are the only two azole derivatives out of all these drugs. The only two azole drugs which are effective against the black fungus infection or mucor mycosis uh, include isavuconazole and posaconazole. Whereas all these drugs, they are not effective against black fungus infection or mucor mycosis. Isavuconazole and posaconazole are, are the only two azole drugs which are effective against black fungus infection. Uh, which of the following is called as a roundworm? A choice, Ascaris lumbricoids. B choice, Ancelostoma duodenale. C choice, Trituris tritura. D choice, Strongyloid cercoralis. And E, e choice, Vitreria bancrofti. So before coming to the correct choice, all these are uh, parasitic worms or called as helminths. So they all, all of these worms are called as parasitic worms or helminths. And all these helminths given in this choice belongs to a phylum called as nematodes. They belongs to nematodes. Nematodes. Now coming to the choice, Ascaris lumbricoids is the scientific name of roundworm. It is a scientific name of roundworm. Whereas B choice, Ancelostoma duodenale, is the scientific name for hookworm. Scientific name for hookworm. Whereas Trituris tritura is the scientific name for whipworm. Coming to D choice, Strongyloid stercoralis is the scientific name of threadworm. Coming to E choice, Vacheraria bancrofti is the scientific name and it is also called as filarial worm, which causes filariasis, filarial worm. Now, apart from these uh, nematodes, you should remember two more nematodes. And another example is uh, enterobias. Enterobias vermicularis is also a nematode. Enterobias vermicularis is also a nematode. And uh, that is a scientific name of pinworm. Pinworm. One more thing uh, you try to remember that is uh, Draconculus. Draconculus medinensis. Medinensis. Draconculus medinensis. Medinensis. And there's a scientific name of Guniavu. There's a scientific name of Guniavu. So all these nematodes and uh, the corresponding name is given. Roundworm belongs to Ascaris lumbricoids, hookworm, Ancelostoma duodenale, whipworm, Trituris tritura, threadworm, Strongyloid stercoralis, filarial worm, Vitreria bancrofti, pinworm, Enderobias vermicularis, and uh, Gunia worm, the scientific name is uh, Draconculus medinensis. The drug of choice, the drug of choice for 
these nematode infestations. Um, now, uh, I have given the list of important uh, nematode as depicted here. Uh, roundworm, hookworm, whipworm, pinworm, threadworm, filarial worm, and gunia worm. Now remember, the first line treatment or the drug of choice for most of the nematode infestations, for most of the nematode infestation include drugs from Benz imidazole category. Benz imidazole category. That is, the drugs coming under this benzimidazole category is the drug of choice for most of the nematode infestations. Although there are some exceptions that I would uh, discuss in, the, in this video very shortly. Now, which are those drugs coming under this uh, benzimidazole category? The drugs are thiabendazole. Mebendazole, albendazole. There are some more derivatives like triclabendazole and all that. So, but these are some of the important uh, benzimidazole uh, uh, derivatives which are used as an anthelminthic drug, especially for nematode infestations. And out of this, thiabendazole was the first was the first benzimidazole and the helminthic drug. First, benzimidazole and helminthic drug. However, the drugs uh, developed later on, uh, such as mebendazole and albendazole, were more effective, uh, more effective compared to thiabendazole. Therefore, thiabendazole is uh, no longer used nowadays. Whereas uh, mebendazole and albendazole, these are the two benzimidazole drugs which are more preferred drugs. Now, the problem with this uh, benzimidazole derivative drugs, the problem with this uh, thiabendazole, mebendazole, albendazole is that they undergo a very high first pass metabolism. First pass metabolism. So all these drugs undergo a very uh, high first pass metabolism. And due to this first pass metabolism, these drugs would become inactive. All these drugs would become inactive except except albendazole. That means this albendazole, although e even if it undergoes phosphorus metabolism, it would be converted to an active metabolite called as albendazole sulfoxide. So albendazole also will undergo phosphorus metabolism. However, it will be converted to albendazole sulfoxide, which is an active metabolite. Whereas mebendazole, if, if it undergoes a first pass metabolism, it will be converted to an inactive metabolite. It will be converted to an inactive metabolite. Uh, where uh, thiabendazole also would be converted to an inactive metabolite. However, albendazole will be converted to an active metabolite. And due to these uh, reasons, uh, albendazole, uh, and this uh, one more thing, this albendazole sulfoxide will be having a very high tissue distribution, very high tissue di distribution. Also, it is an active metabolite of albendazole. So therefore, the most effective benzimidazole, the, therefore the most effective benzimidazole derivative against this uh, um, uh, helminth infestations are albendazole. Okay. Now, in the case of uh, roundworm, hookworm, uh, whipworm, and pinworm, the drug of choice or the first line drug is albendazole. In all these uh, roundworm, hookworm, whipworm, pinworm, the drug of first line treatment or the drug of choice is albendazole. However, uh, mebendazole can be used as an alternative drug. But in the case of threadworm, it is not the benzimidazole drug. It is not the benzimidazole drug. Here, the drug of choice is a semi synthetic drug called as ivermectin. So, the drug of choice for threadworm is ivermectin. Now, coming to the filarial worm, the drug of choice is a diethyl, diethyl carbamazine, diethyl carbamazine citrate. In short, it is called as DEC. DECC, diethyl carbamazine citrate, is the 
a drug of choice for filarial worm in fact this was the first drug uh, this was the first drug for filariasis uh, caused by westeria bancrofti and in fact the drug of choice too now coming to the last nematode that is the gunia worm here the drug of choice is a metronidazole Here, the drug of choice is metronidazole. You also know that this drug is a potent or a powerful anti-amoeba drug, and that is a metronidazole is also the drug of choice for gunia worm. So, the drug of choice for roundworm, hookworm, whipworm, and pinworm is uh, the benzimidazole drug called as albendazole. Whereas in the case of threadworm, it is ivermectin. In the case of filarial worm, it is a DECC, which is diethyl carbamazine citrate. And in the case of um, gunia worm. the drug of choice is uh, metronidazole and remember this kind of question uh, would also be asked uh, in the name of the scientific name like uh, which is the drug of choice for uh, strongyloid stercoralis which is the drug of choice for strongyloid stercoralis so you should know strongyloid stercoralis is the scientific name of threadworm and the drug of choice is ivermectin and drug of choice is ivermectin similarly the scientific names of uh, all these worms you should try you try to remember uh, all the scientific names of uh, these worms uh, which are the following drug is a non catecholamine which are the following drug is a non catecholamine a choice adrenaline b choice dopamine c choice noradrenaline d choice isoprenaline and e choice uh, phenylephrine so before coming to the correct choice if you look at the choice all these drugs adrenaline uh, dopamine noradrenaline isoprenaline phenylephrine they belongs to adrenergic drug all these drugs belongs to adrenergic drug category adrenergic drugs are also known as sympathomimetic drugs so all these drugs belongs to adrenergic category or sympathomimetic mimetics sympathomimetic drugs now we know that uh, adrenergic drugs can be classified into two categories based on its chemistry so the one category is called as catecholamines catecholamines And the second category is called as non catecholamines and now what is the difference between catecholamines and non catecholamines as the name indicates the catecholamines contain a structure called as catechol okay so now what is catechol it is nothing but a benzene ring with the two hydroxyl group at the first and the second position so in benzene ring if there are two hydroxyl groups nearby that structure is called as catechol so in this catecholamines whatever drugs you take it contains this nucleus called as catechol whereas non catecholamines they do not contain this catechol nucleus it does not have this catechol nucleus okay so that is the basic difference of catecholamines and non catecholamines now you should remember which all drugs coming under catecholamines category so you can remember with uh, this mnemonic called as admin a t m i n okay try to remember this mnemonic so that you can remember the drugs a stands for adrenaline so adrenaline contains catechol nucleus so they are called they comes under catecholamine category and d stands for dopamine dopamine apart from dopamine the other uh, the, there are some other drugs starting with the that is dobutamine that also contain catechol nucleus dobutamine then dopexamine d o p e x a m a dopexamine it also contains a catechol nucleus one more drug uh, starting with the d dipivifrin d i p i p e f r i n e dipivifrin okay basically it's a pro drug of adrenaline so all these uh, drugs uh, starting with the d dopamine dobutamine dopexamine and dipivifrin or contains catechol nucleus now m belongs to methyl dopa methyl dopa methyl dopa also contains uh, catechol nucleus i stands for isoprenaline
and N stands for noradrenaline. So try to remember this mnemonic admin, adrenaline, dopamine, dobutamine, dopexamine, dipivifrine. M stands for methyl dopa, I stands for isoprenaline, and N stands for noradrenaline. So all these drugs contain the catechol nucleus and they are com they comes under the category called as catecholamines. Whereas the other adrenergic drugs, for example, phenylephrine. Phenylephrine, amphetamine. hydroxyamphetamine, ephedrine, also pseudoephedrine, then uh, xylometazolin, xylometazolin, then oxymetazolin, oxymetazolin, nafasolin, and clonidin. All those, uh, uh, all these drugs do not contain catechol nucleus and they come under non-catecholamine category. So better you remember the drugs coming under catechol the catecholamine category and the other drugs, all other drugs other than these drugs will be coming under non-catecholamine category. Okay, so now if you look at the choice, adrenaline, dopamine, noradrenaline, isoprenaline, all these drugs are contained catechol nucleus, so they come under the catecholamines, whereas phenylephrin is not coming under this mnemonic ADMIN, so you can straight away go with the answer, answer is phenylephrin, this is a non-catecholamine, okay. Which of the following drug is called as phenyl salicylate? A choice salol, B choice salsonin, C choice salicylate, D choice all of the above. So first thing you should remember, uh, all these three drugs, salol, salsonin and salicylate, they belong to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They belong to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs which are used to uh, reduce the pain, inflammation as well as the temperature. So salol, salsonin and salicylate are NSAIDs and chemically they are derivatives of salicylic acids. So chemically all these three drugs are basically derivatives of salicylic acid and um, coming to the structure of salicylic acid. So this is called a salicylic acid. 2-hydroxy benzoic acid. You draw benzoic acid and the second position if you put OH, this is called a salicylic acid. Now, uh, in the salicylic acid, if you replace, in the salicylic acid, if you replace the hydrogen of a carboxyl group with a phenyl group, C6H5 group, phenyl group, if you replace this hydrogen with a phenyl group, this is called as phenyl salicylate. This is called as phenyl salicylate. This structure is called as salicylic acid. So if you replace this hydrogen with the phenyl group, this is called as phenyl salicylate. And phenyl salicylate is commonly called as phenyl salicylate is commonly called as salol. Now coming to the second choice, salsonin. If you replace uh, the if you replace the hydrogen of carboxylic acid with the sodium. CO minus Na plus. The sodium salt of salicylic acid is called as sodium salicylate. Sodium salicylate. The sodium salt of salicylic acid is called as sodium salicylate. This is commonly called as salsonin. So the correct answer for this question is age A, which of the following is called as phenyl salicylate? The answer is A choice salol. Salicylate is actually the condensed uh, the condensed form of uh, two molecules of salicylic acid. The condensed form of two molecules two molecules of salicylic acid is called as salicylate. Which of the following drug is a selective COX two inhibitor? A choice diclofenac, B choice pyroxicam, C choice ketrolac, and D choice uh, nimesulide. So all these drugs, diclofenac, pyroxicam, uh, ketorolac and nimesulide, they belong to one category uh, called as um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So all these drugs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs basically used to reduce the pain, uh, temperature as well as inflammation. Now NSAIDs can be uh, broadly divided into two categories. 
one is the non selective non selective cox inhibition inhibitors and the second one is selective cox 2 inhibitor selective cox 2 inhibitor so in non selective cox inhibitor it inhibit both cox 1 and same as well as cox 2 and same whereas in the selective cox 2 inhibitor it inhibits only the cox 2 enzymes now uh, coming to the examples of selective cox 2 inhibitor all the most of the drugs uh, uh, end with a name called as coxib c o x i b the suffix of the drugs is mainly mainly coxib and the examples are selicoxib selicoxib rofecoxib valdicoxib etoricoxib lumaricoxib paricoxib and nimicilide so all, all the drugs uh, uh, most of the drugs which is uh, coming under the selective cox2 inhibitor category cox2 inhibitor category end with the name coxib selicoxib rofecoxib valdicoxib etoricoxib lumaricoxib paricoxib um one exception is nimicilide which is also a relatively a selective cox2 inhibitor they belong to selective cox2 inhibitor whereas the aspirin ibuprofen uh, diclofenac mefenamic acid all those uh, drugs belongs to uh, non selective cox inhibitor inhibitor category okay so the right answer for this question the selective cox2 inhibitor the correct answer is nimicilide Uh, diclofenac pyroxicam ketorolac all belongs to this uh, non selective cox inhibitor category which of the following process is required to convert mannose to mannitol a choice oxidation b choice reduction c choice hydrolysis d choice cyclization so before coming to the answer first we should know what is mannose so as we all know mannose is a carbohydrate mannose is a carbohydrate with six carbon atoms and an aldehyde group that's why they come under the category aldohexose so basically it is an isomer of our glucose okay so let's look at the structure of mannose there will be six carbon So as you all know, in the case of carbohydrate, there will be multiple hydroxy groups, polyhydroxy, either aldehyde or ketone. So this is an aldohexose, so aldehyde group, six carbon and multiple uh, hydroxy group is there. So this is the structure of mannose. Now the question is, which process is required to convert mannose to mannitol? We should know the structure of mannitol. So the only difference is that uh, uh, instead of this aldehyde, if you write the alcoholic group. and uh, if you write the remaining things the same that is mannitol so this is the structure of mannitol the question is which process is required for the this conversion so uh, everything same except the top group so this is aldehyde this is alcohol so that means addition of one more hydrogen to here so the basically addition of hydrogen is basically reduction so this process is reduction so the correct choice would be definitely uh, b choice reduction so mannose is converted to mannitol by the process called as reduction and the question is uh, which of the following drug is a dhfr inhibitor a choice sulfa methoxazole b choice methotrexate c choice 5 fu d choice captopril so dhfr means uh, dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor and the correct answer is methotrexate which is an anti cancer drug as well as uh, the drug given for rheumatoid arthritis is a dhfr inhibitor drug dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor
whereas the a choice that is sulfa methoxazole which is an uh, antibacterial uh, drug sulfonamide drug which is a bacteriostatic drug it is a bacteriostatic drug inhibit the enzyme called as dihydro pteroate synthetase dihydro pteroate synthetase inhibitor so sulfa methoxazole which is a sulfonamide inhibit dihydro pteroate synthetase enzyme and it's a bacteriostatic drug methotrexate is a dhfr inhibitor and the c choice 5 fu means 5 fluorouracil 5 fluorouracil which is an anti cancer drug and um, uh, the mechanism of action is that it inhibit thymidylate synthetase enzyme it inhibit thymidylate synthetase inhibitor thai medilate synthetase inhibitor which is an anti cancer drug and coming to the choice d captopril which is an uh, anti hypertensive drug captopril which is an anti hypertensive drug inhibit the enzyme called as uh, angiotensin converting enzyme ace angiotensin converting enzyme so it inhibit uh, ac angiotensin converting enzyme so it is an ace inhibitor ac inhibitor captopril which is an anti hypertensive drug is an ace inhibitor so the correct choice for this question methotrexate inhibit the enzyme dihydrofolate reductase enzyme the question is uh, position of hydroxyl groups in the drug morphin a choice c2 and c4 carbon b choice c3 and c6 c choice c4 and c8 d choice c5 and c10 so to know this question uh, if you know the structure of morphine it's quite easy to find out the answer so let's draw the structure of morphine so morphine has this phenolic oh also this al uh, alcoholic oh so this ring structure is called as phenanthrene structure there is a nitrogen tertiary nitrogen and this two carbons are linked together by either bridge there is a double bond at this position so this is a structure of uh, morphine and the numbering is like 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 this is the ninth 10th position 11 12 13 14 15 and 16 and nitrogen is at the 17th position so this is how the numbering goes on now the question was the position of hydroxyl group in morphine so it's easy to answer c3 and c6 are the positions where the hydroxyl groups are present and if the question was that uh, which which all carbon contain the double bond the answer would have been c7 to c8 carbon contain the double bond um, and uh, if the question was uh, uh, about the either bridge either this is the either bridge if the uh, either bridge is between c4 and c5 so this is the atom where the either bridge is seen either bridge and if the question was that uh, the position of nitrogen the answer would have been 17th position is at the 17th position is at where the nitrogen is seen so this is the structure of morphine and the correct answer is c3 and c6 and the question is uh, the number of double bonds the total number of double bonds uh, present in linoleic acid the total number of double bonds present in linoleic acid a choice 1 b choice 2 c choice 3 and d choice 4 so the first thing before coming to the answer the first thing you should know linoleic acid is an unsaturated fatty acids it is an unsaturated fatty acids it is an unsaturated fatty acid so mainly we have uh, uh, five unsaturated fatty acids they are one is palmitoleic acid palmit oleic acid there is an unsaturated fatty acid the second one is oleic acid this is also an unsaturated fatty acid then linoleic acid linoleic acid fourth one is linolenic acid 
and the fifth one is arachidonic acid So all this five, palmitolic, oleic acid, linoleic acid, linolenic acid, and arachidonic acid, they are basically, they are unsaturated fatty acid. Unsaturated means they will be con containing a double bond. They will be containing mm, double bonds, actually. And the number of double bonds, the total number of double bonds in uh, each of this thing, let us look into that. So palmitolic and oleic acid, they contain only one double bond. Both palmit and uh, palmitolic acid as well as oleic acid, they contain one double bond. Whereas linolenic acid uh, contains two double bonds. Linolenic acid contains three double bonds. And arachidonic acid contains four double bonds. So you can remember one, one, two, three, four. And you can remember this abbreviation as P-O-L-L-A. -L -L they are unsaturated fatty acid. P-O-L-L-A. -L -L okay, now uh, among this unsaturated fatty acids, this three fatty acids, Okay, linolic, linolenic, and arachidonic, they are also in the essential fatty acid category. So, linolic, linolenic, and arachidonic are also essential fatty acid. So, the coming to the choice, the number of double bonds present in linolenic acid, the answer is here, linolenic, answer is definitely answer 3. Next is which of the following is a saturated fatty acid? A choice, capric acid, B choice, lauric acid, C choice, stearic acid, D choice, arachidic acid, E choice, all of the above. So before coming to the correct answer, we should know the important saturated fatty acids. And uh, mostly the saturated fatty acids are uh, mainly, mostly, they are even numbered carbons, actually. They have even number of carbons, actually. And the most important ones are, one is caproic acid, caproic acid. The second important one is caprylic acid. Third is capric acid, lauric acid, then comes myristic acid, then comes palmitic acid, then stearic acid, then arachidic acid. It is arachidic acid. Yesterday we have discussed arachidonic acid. Arachidonic is a, acid is an unsaturated fatty acid. So these are the important saturated fatty acids, and mostly they are even number of they have even number of carbon. Let's see the number of carbon atoms also in each of these fatty acids. Number of carbon atoms. So, uh, lauric acid, uh, this uh, caproic acids contain uh, six carbons. Total six carbons are there. Whereas caprylic contains eight. Capric contains ten. Lauric acid contains 12, myristic acid contains 14, palmitic acid contains 16, stearic acid contains 18, and arachidic acid contains 20. So just remember it in this order so that you can just add it to add it to in each of these things 6 8 10 12 14 16 18 20 some of the some sometimes the question will be like uh, a 14 carbon containing saturated fatty acid sometimes the question will be a, a fatty acid containing 16 carbon the answer would be palmitic acid sometimes the question will be an 18 carbon containing fatty acid answer is stearic acid okay so all these are saturated fatty acid now coming to our um, question which of the following is a saturated as you can see capric acid is a saturated lauric stearic arachidic all are fa saturated fatty acid so definitely the answer would be all of them. Uh, identify the this particular compound. Identify this compound. A benzene ring is there. One carboxyl group at this position. One carboxyl group at this particular position. Name of this compound. A choice, thalic acid. B choice, isophthalic acid. C choice, terephthalic acid. And D choice, benzoic acid. So normally, when you draw a benzene ring, to draw a benzene ring and put a carboxyl group this is called as benzoic acid the structure is called as benzoic acid now in benzoic acid in benzoic acid so this is the structure of benzoic acid now you put a one more carboxyl group at at the adjacent position or the ortho position or the nearby position if you put one more carboxyl group this compound is called as phthalic acid now, in this benzene ring, 
or in this benzoic acid, if you put the second carboxyl group at the meta position or the alternative position, this is called as isophthalic acid. Now, in the benzoic acid structure, if you put the carboxyl group at the para position or the fourth position, this is the first position, second position, third position, fourth position. So, uh, uh, opposite position, carboxyl group at the and one carboxyl at the opposite position. This is called as terephthalic acid. Okay. So, this particular structure is called as uh, terephthalic acid. Uh, so, if the carboxyl group is nearby, at 1 and 2 position, this is called as thalic acid. If the carboxyl group is at 1 and 2 nearby position, it is called as thalic acid. If the carboxyl group in the benzene is at 1 and 3 position, it is called as iso isophthalic acid. If the carboxyl acid in the benzene is at 1 and 4 position, it is uh, called as terephthalic acid. So the correct answer for this question will be definitely terephthalic acid. This question is, which of the following is an, is an effect of morphine? A choice euphoria, B choice dysphoria, C choice constipation, D choice all of the above. So basically morphine you all know it's an, it's an opioid analgesic. It is an opioid analgesic. And the morphine mainly, uh, the drug morphine mainly acts on three receptors. One is called as the mu receptor, the second receptor is called as the kappa receptor and the third receptor is called as delta receptor so morphine acts on all these three receptors and it's a powerful analgesic and this analgesic effect is mediated by the action on, on all these receptors so analgesic effect is mediated by action on all these receptors mu uh, receptor kappa receptor as well as delta receptors apart from analgesic effect morphine also have respiratory depression effect respiratory depression effect that is mediated by all these three receptors respiratory depression effect also morphine decreases the gi motility morphine decreases the gi mot motility which results in constipation so constipation is also mediated by all these receptors so analgesia is uh, mediated by mu receptor kappa and delta respiratory depression is also mediated by mu kappa delta constipation is also mediated by mu kappa and delta another effect of morphine is sedation sedative effect sedation is mediated by mu as well as kappa sedation is mainly mediated by mu and kappa only another effect of morphine is the meiosis effect pinpoint pupil meiosis effect it is mediated by both mu and kappa receptor and um, uh, apart from that uh, morphine produces euphoric effect euphoria the kick effect the kick effect so that is mainly mediated by euphoric effect of morphine is mainly mediated by mu receptor whereas the opposite effect of euphoria that is called as a dysphoric effect dysphoria so dysphoria is mainly mediated by the action on kappa receptors so the euphoric effect of morphine is mediated by mu receptor and the dysphoric effect of morphine is mediated by kappa receptor analgesic action is mediated by all the, these three receptors respiratory depression is also mediated by all these three receptors constipation is also mediated by all these receptors whereas sedation is depends on is mediated by mu as well as kappa meiosis is also mediated by mu and kappa so the question was which of the following is an effect of morphine so euphoria is an effect dysphoria is also an effect of morphine constipation is also an effect of morphine so the answer would be definitely all of the above question is the drug of choice for tonic clonic seizure a choice ethosuximide b choice valproate c choice carbamazepine d choice phenytoin so before coming to the answer Tonic clonic seizures are basically they are generalized seizures. They are generalized seizures. Generalized seizures. And that means they affect the whole brain. They affect the whole brain. So it is also called as generalized tonic clonic seizure. So tonic clonic seizure is also called as generalized tonic clonic seizure. It is also called as grand mal epilepsy. The other name of tonic clonic seizure is grand mal epilepsy. Now coming to the uh, question, the drug of choice for uh, uh, grand mal epilepsy or generalized tonic clonic seizure, the answer is valproic acid. 
or sodium valproate so valproic acid is the drug of choice for drug of choice for generalized tonic clonic seizure valproic is also valproic acid is also the drug of choice for atonic seizures atonic seizure in the case of atonic seizure also the drug of choice is valproic acid it is also the drug of choice for myoclonic seizure myoclonic seizures Okay. and uh, so the drug of choice for tonic clonic uh, seizure the correct answer is valproic acid or sodium valproate and is also the drug of choice for atonic seizure as well as myoclonic seizure there is a first choice that is the ethoxamide ethoxamide uh, actually that is ethoxamide is the is the first line drug ethoxamide is the first line drug given for absent seizures or it is a drug of choice for absent seizures is a drug of choice for absent seizures whereas carbamazepine is the drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia trigeminal neuralgia phenytoin can be used for generalized tonic clonic seizures as well as fo focal seizures but it is not a the drug of choice actually for generalized tonic clonic seizures etc the drug of choice for generalized tonic clonic seizure the answer is valproic acid and ethoxamide is the first line drug for absent seizures and um, apart from the generalized tonic clonic seizure valproic is uh, valproic acid is also the drug of choice for atonic seizures as well as the myoclonic seizures question is uh, morphine is a complex dash skeleton a choice tetracyclic b choice pentacyclic C choice tricyclic and D choice bicyclic. So, uh, in other words, this question uh, can be also asked in a fashion like how many cyclic rings are there in morphine? The number of cyclic rings present in the morphine. So, to answer this question, we should know the structure of morphine. So, let me draw the structure of morphine. So, morphine will look like this. So basically, uh, this is a phenanthrene ring, uh, kind of ring, and these two carbons are joined together by an ether bridge. Okay. Apart from that, one more cyclic fusion is coming here with a nitrogen atom attached to a methyl group. So uh, there is an unsaturation between these two carbons. There is a hydroxyl group at this carbon, one more hydroxyl group at this carbon. So this is the entire structure of morphine. Okay. So uh, the question was the number of cyclic rings or the, it's a um, complex dash skeleton. So this ring, this benzene ring could be considered as the first ring. This could be considered as the first ring. This could be considered as a second ring. This could be considered as the third ring this could be considered as the fourth ring and apart from that this also could be considered as a ring and it is the fifth ring okay so if you ask the number of cyclic rings or the number of uh, fused rings present in uh, morphine the answer would be five so the correct choice would be pentacyclic so morphine is a complex pentacyclic skeleton Hope you understood this question. This question is which of the following is an NSAD? Which of the following is an NSAD? That is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. A choice diclofenac, B choice diclofenamide, C choice dichlorphenamide and D choice all of the above. So although it's a simple question, sometimes you end up in a wrong answer. So let's look into the correct answer. So we all know that diclofenac is an NSAD diclofenac gel or diclofenac spray all these diclofenacs are basically non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug which is used to reduce the play, pain and as well as inflammation however diclofenamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor carbonic anhydrase inhibitor 
so uh, diclofenamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and the chemistry is basically it's a sulfonamide derivative it's a sulfonamide derivative so it is not an nsaid diclofenamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor and the chemistry is it's a sulfonamide derivative and basically it's a, since it is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor it is used in the treatment of glaucoma use of diclofenamide is uh, is that it is used in the treatment of glaucoma also it is also found to be effective in the treatment of drug resistant epilepsy drug resistant epilepsy okay so diclofenamide is different it's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor sulfonamide derivative used in the treatment of glaucoma also it is shown to be effective in drug resistant epilepsy and dichlorphenamide is the other name of diclofenamide so basically diclofenamide and dichlorphenamide are they are basically same they are both are sulfonamide derivative both are carbonic anhydrase inhibitor it is the other name of diclofenamide so it can be used in the treatment of glaucoma as well as it is used in the treatment of or shown to be effective in the drug resistant epilepsy so the question here is which of the following is an nsaid the correct answer is definitely diclofenac not the all of the above the correct answer is diclofenac Next question is which of the following is a DNA virus? A choice herpes zoster, B choice VZV, C choice adenovirus, D choice papilloma virus, and uh, E choice all of the above. So herpes zoster uh, is a DNA virus. Then VZV is nothing but varicella zoster virus is also a DNA virus. Adenovirus is also a DNA virus. papilloma virus is also a dna virus so the correct answer would be all of the above all these virus uh, are basically dna virus and as you know herpes zoster uh, is a dna virus which causes the disease shingles so herpes zoster causes the disease called as shingles varicella zoster uh, uh, virus causes the chicken pox adenovirus basically they cause uh, sore throat sore throat conjunctivitis conjunctivitis and papilloma virus cause uh, says warts warts so all this virus uh, herpes zoster varicella zoster virus adenovirus papilloma virus they are all dna virus and these are the disease main disease which is caused by these virus now let's look into which are which are the rna virus category so rna virus category so let's uh, learn which are the important rna virus so for the first one is coming in under the rna virus is ortho mixo virus ortho mixo virus uh, which uh, mainly cause influenza like disease influenza now the second category of rna virus are actually para mixo virus para mixo virus so they basically causes this mumps measles etc okay now the third rna virus category are actually rubella virus rubella virus actually causes german measles german measles now the fourth uh, category which comes under rna virus is the rhabdovirus rhabdovirus they basically cause rabies the rabies is a rhabdovirus caused by rhabdovirus now another category which comes under rna virus category is retrovirus retrovirus and you know uh, you know that hiv is a retrovirus hiv is a retrovirus which mainly causes the aids okay another uh, some of other categories let me in, include it in the others others categories so uh, others like the co- corona is an rna virus ebola uh, is caused ebola is actually an rna virus then uh, nipa all these pandemic diseases recently happened nipa okay then uh, so all these are actually rna virus also this uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome sars 
is also caused by an RNA virus. Another one, Middle East, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. It is also caused by an RNA virus. So, influenza, mumps, measles, German measles, rabies, AIDS, Corona, Ebola, Nipah, SARS and MERS. All these are caused by RNA virus. Whereas, chicken pox, shingles, sore throat, conjunctivitis, warts, all these are caused by these DNA virus. So, the correct answer for this question, as I already mentioned, which of the following is a DNA virus? All these are DNA virus. So, the correct answer would be definitely all of the above. The question is, uh, which of the following is uh, not a true ketone body? Which of the following is not a true ketone body? A choice, acetone. B choice, acetoacetate. C choice, beta hydroxybutyrate. And D choice, all of the above. So, as you all know, uh, ketone bodies are they are basically water soluble compounds they are basically high energy yielding molecules uh, which are uh, mainly produced in the liver uh, from the fatty acids they are produced from the fatty acids uh, they are produced in the liver they are water soluble compounds they are energy yielding molecules so mainly there are three ketone bodies one is acetone the second one is acetoacetic acid Aceto acetic acid. The third one is beta hydroxy butyric acid. So, what all given here A, B, C, they are all ketone bodies. Now, when you look at the structure of acetone, structure of acetone is CH3, C double bond O, CH3. Now, when you look at the structure of acetoacetic acid, the structure look like this, CH3, C double bond O, CH2, COH, acetoacetic acid. Now, coming to the structure of beta hydroxybutyric acid, the structure would be, first let me draw the structure of butyric acid, CH3, CH, CH2. So it should be CH3, CH2, CH2, COH. Now this is the alpha carbon because this is attached to the functional group. So this is the alpha carbon. This is the beta carbon. So in this beta carbon, one hydroxy group is attached. So that is why it is beta hydroxybutyric acid. So these are the three ketone bodies. Acetone, acetoacetic acid, beta hydroxybutyric acid. Now the question was which of the following is not a true ketone body now if you look at the acetone there is a proper keto group is there there is a true keto group is here if you look at the structure of acetoacetic acid here also there is a true keto group is there whereas in beta hydroxybutyric acid there is no proper ketone group this is an OH group hydroxyl group there is no proper ketone group so this is not considered to be a, not a true ketone body not a true ketone body because there is a, it's a hydroxyl group, there is no ketone group here actually. The proper ketone group is there. Whereas in acetone and acetoacetic acid, there is a proper ketone group. So which of the following is not a true ketone body? The answer would be beta hydroxybutyrase is not a um, true ketone body. Whereas acetone and aceto, acetoacetate are true ketone bodies. Beta hydroxybutyrate is not a true ketone body. This question is uh, the nitrogenous base. The nitrogenous base present in the drug zidovudine. The nitrogenous base present in the drug zidovudine. A choice adenine, B choice guanine, C choice cytosine, D choice thymine, and E choice uracil. So, as you all know, zidovudine is one of the first anti HIV drug, first anti HIV, anti HIV drug which belongs to the category nucleoside reverse transcriptors inhibitor okay so this is one of the first anti hiv drug which was developed for the hiv virus and it belongs to the category nucleoside reverse transcriptors inhibitor or nrta category now the the all these the choice what what is given here all all these are nitrogenous bases adenine is a nitrogenous base guanine is a nitro and these two belongs to the purine base they have the basic structure called as purine. So, adenine and guanine are the purine derivatives. Cytosine, thymine, uracil, they are pyrimidine derivatives. 
they are pyrimidine derivatives so basically nitrogenous nitrogenous bases are of two types purine derivatives as well as pyrimidine derivatives the purine bases are adenine and guanine the pyrimidine bases are cytosine thymine and uracil now the coming to the uh, question zidovudine contains which of this which of the following bases for answering the answering this question you should know the other name of zidovudine zidovudine is also called as azidothymidine Azidothymidine. Azidothymidine or A abbreviated as A Z T. So if you know the other name of Zidovudine, the answer is quite easy to find out. There contains the name uh, thymine. So you can straight away uh, get the answer. Zidovudine contains thymine base. So the answer would be definitely uh, D choice uh, thymine. Sometimes the question will be like uh, zidovudine uh, is a dash derivative. Is it a purine derivative or a pyrimidine derivative? Then also, then also you can answer uh, thymine belongs to the pyrimidine derivative. So the answer would be definitely pyrimidine. So please remember the other name of zidovudine that is azidothymidine or AZT is the first anti-HIV drug which belongs to the category NRTI. And if you know this uh, other name of zidovudine, that is azidothymidine, you can uh, tell that the nitrogenous base present is thymine, which is a pyrimidine derivative. Okay, so the correct answer is definitely thymine. Question is, uh, mercaptopurin, mercaptopurin is the active metabolite of A choice cyclophosphamide, B choice cortisone, C choice prednisone, uh, D choice acetyoprin, E choice zidovudine, and F choice diazepam. Uh, so first of all, you should know the drugs given here, cyclophosphamide, cortisone, prednisone, acetyoprin, zidovudine, all these are basically prodrugs. They are prodrugs. Prodrug means they will be as such inactive and they have to be converted to an active metabolite. So Cyclophosphamide, cortisone, prednisone, acetyoprin, as well as pseudovudine is also a product. That means they are not active as such. It has to be converted to an active metabolite by the enzyme. However, diazepam is not a product. It is already active. It is an already an active drug. It is an already an active form of the drug. Okay. Whereas all these five uh, drugs are actually prodrugs. They are inactive. Now, cyclophosphamide is a prodrug which will be, which has, it's an anti-cancer drug which has to be converted to the active metabolite called as phosphoramide mustard. Phosphoramide mustard. So the active metabolite of cyclophosphamide is phosphoramide mustard. That is actually uh, act, uh, creating that cytotoxic effect, anti-cancer drug. Cyclophosphamide is an anti-cancer drug. And phosphoramine mustard is actually uh, creating that cytotoxic effect. Now, cortisone is also a prodrug. It comes under the uh, corticosteroid category. Now, this uh, prodrug has to be converted to cortisol. So that active form of cortisone is cortisol, also called as hydrocortisone. Hydrocortisone. Now, prednisone, again, uh, another um, uh, product with the active metabolite of uh, prednisone is prednisolone. Now, acetyoprin is an immunosuppressant as well as an anti cancer drug. It is also a product. It has to be converted to the active metabolite, and the active metabolite is 6 mercaptopurin. 6 mercaptopurin. So acetylpurine is a product and the active metabolite is 6 mercaptopurine Pseudovudine, the anti-HIV drug, is also a product and the active form is pseudovudine triphosphate. Pseudovudine triphosphate. So this active form will be actually creating the effect. Pseudovudine triphosphate will be actually killing the HIV virus actually. Now diazepam is already an active drug. It's not a product. It's already an active drug. And uh, even after metabo metabol metabolization, it will be converted to an active form called as oxazepam. Oxazepam. So diazepam is already active. However, even after metabolization, it will be converted to an active metabolite. An active metabolite. That's why this uh, diazepam, which comes under the benzodiazepine, benzodiazepine category, diazepam have a long duration of action because this is as such is an active and after metabolization also it is converted to an active metabolite called as oxazepam so the duration of action of diazepam will be more 
So the correct uh, answer for this question is mercaptopurin is active metabolite of uh, the answer is a D choice as a thiopurin. This question is which of the following is not a prodrug? Which of the following is not a prodrug? A choice inalapril, B choice ramipril, C choice perindopril, D choice benacipril and E choice lisinopril. So before coming to the answer, uh, let's understand about these drugs. So basically all these drugs are uh, drugs belong to a category called as ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. They belong to the class called as ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, mainly used in the, as a first line drug for the treatment of one of the first line drug for the treatment of hypertension. Hypertension. So basically, they are they are used as an antihypertensive drug. They are they can decrease the BP. They are used as an antihypertensive drug, and they belong to the class AC inhibitors. So let's come to the mechanism. Normally, in our body, angiotensin one, angiotensin one, is converted to angiotensin two. Okay, angiotensin one is converted to angiotensin two by an enzyme called as angiotensin converting enzyme so angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 using angiotensin converting enzyme this angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor it is a potent vasoconstrictor that means it will constrict the blood vessels so if it constricts the blood vessels the blood pressure the blood pressure will increase the blood pressure will increase so angiotensin is a potent vasoconstrictor which will increase the blood pressure now if you wanted to reduce the blood pressure you have to bring down the you can bring down you can reduce the production of angiotensin 2 so one strategy to reduce the angiotensin 2 is to inhibit this enzyme is to inhibit this enzyme called as angiotensin converting enzyme so that angiotensin 2 production will be very less so this class of drugs are these drugs are called as angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors so these are those drugs inalapril ramipril perindopril benacipril lisinopril they are ace inhibitors the mechanism is that they inhibit the angiotensin converting enzyme so that angiotensin 2 production will be less so that you can bring down the bp now uh, coming to the uh, question all these drugs all these drugs are basically all these drugs are uh, mainly pro drugs all the most of these ac inhibitors are they are pro drugs that means uh, to increase the bioavailability, they are given in the form of, in the prodrug form. For example, perindopril, uh, inalapril is a prodrug, ramipril is a prodrug, perindopril is a prodrug, benacipril is a prodrug. However, lisinopril is not a prodrug. So all these four drugs, uh, they are prodrug, and the active form of inalapril is enalaprilat. Enalaprilat. You can just uh, add the word at in front of that name. The active form of ramipril is ramiprilat. Ramiprilat. Just add the word at. The active form of perindopril is perindoprilat. Perindoprilat. The active form of benacipril is benaciprilat. So they are given in the prodrug form to increase the bioavailability and these are the active forms. However, lisinopril, lisinopril and one more drug called as captopril. Captopril. These two drugs, they are not, pro, not, not a prodrug. Not a prodrug. They are as such active. Lisinopril and captopril are not prodrugs. So you can remember, uh, remember this mnemonics like all ACE inhibitors, all angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors are prodrugs. All AC inhibitors are prodrugs except LC. LC means lisinopril and captopril. So all AC inhibitors are prodrug except lisinopril and captopril. Uh, lisinopril and captopril are they are not prodrugs. Remaining all, all are prodrugs. Okay, so the correct answer is which of the following is not a prodrug? The answer is E choice lisinopril. This question is valproic acid is chemically A choice 2 methyl pentanoic acid, B choice 2 ethyl pentanoic acid. C choice 2 propyl pentanoic acid and D choice 2 butyl pentanoic acid. So, as you all know, valproic acid, uh, valproic acid, it's a broad spectrum, valproic acid, it's a broad spectrum, broad spectrum anti epileptic drug.
broad spectrum anti epileptic drug which is in fact the drug of choice uh, for many kind of epilepsies like uh, generalized tonic clonic seizure is also the drug of choice for atonic seizure is also the drug of choice for myoclonic seizure it is also the drug of choice for lennox gestalt syndrome lennox gestalt syndrome and in fact it's a broad spectrum anti epileptic drug okay now coming to the structure chemically this valproic acid belongs to the category called as aliphatic carboxylic acid derivative they belongs to the derivative of aliphatic carboxylic acid now uh, from the word you can identify the name valproic acid contains two words val and pro pro okay so val indicates val indicates valeric acid val indicates valeric acid which is actually pentanoic acid which is actually pentanoic acid pentanoic acid you know it's a five carbon acid now pro pro indicates propyl group propyl pro means propyl val means pentanoic acid which comes from the word valeric acid now let me draw the structure of pentanoic acid which is a five carbon acid so this is uh, ch3 ch2 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 coh so this is called as pentanoic acid the numbering will be 1 2 3 4 and 5 now in this pentanoic acid in this pentanoic acid the second carbon will be attached to a propyl group pro means propyl so ch2 ch2 ch3 so this is the propyl group which is attached to the second carbon so the this five carbon acid is called as pentanoic acid the five carbon acid is called as pentanoic acid now you have attached a propyl group to the second carbon so it is two propyl two propyl pentanoic acid so the correct nomenclature would be two propyl pentanoic acid the iupac nomenclature of the iupac nomenclature of halothane a choice 2 fluoro 2 fluoro 2 chloro 1 1 1 tribromoethane b choice 2 chloro 2 bromo 1 1 1 trichloroethane c choice 2 bromo 2 chloro 1 1 1 trifluoroethane d choice 2 chloro 2 bromo 1 1 1 tribromoethane so before coming to the correct answer as you all know halothane halothane is a general anesthetic it is a general anesthetic it is a general anesthetic which is given through the inhalational route so it is an inhalational general anesthetic in fact it is a volatile compound so it is a volatile inhalational general anesthetic and it exists as a liquid not as a gas it exists as a liquid so it is a liquid volatile inhalational general anesthetic liquid volatile inhalational general anesthetic okay now coming to the structure of uh, uh, halothane basically it contains two carbon so this is the first carbon this is the second carbon now in this first carbon there are three fluorine atoms so this is the first carbon and it contains three fluorine atom now coming to the second carbon it has a bromine atom it has a chlorine atom also contains a hydrogen okay so this is the stru correct structure of uh, halothane so this is the first carbon and this is the second carbon okay now the uh, the nomen the uh, since it is a two carbon compound the last name would be ethane it is a ethane two carbon hydro carbons are called as ethane e t h a n e ethane now in the second carbon it is 2 bromo the correct nomenclature will be 2 bromo second carbon also contains chlorine it is 2 chloro 2 bromo 2 chloro now the first carbon contains uh, three fluorine atoms so it it will be 1, 1,1 trifluoro three fluorine atom trifluoroethane 
so 2 bromo 2 chloro 1 1 1 trifluoroethane so this is the correct nomenclature of halothane general anesthetic the answer to this question is c choice 2 bromo 2 chloro 1 1 1 trifluoroethane which is the most abundant which is the most abundant cyp450 enzyme involved in metabolizing drugs a choice cyp3a4 b choice cyp2d6 c choice cyp2c9 d choice cyp2c19 and e choice cyp1a2 so before coming to the correct answer let's understand what is cyp450 so they are basically a super family of uh, iron containing heme containing enzyme they are basically heme containing enzyme they are heme containing enzyme involved in the metabolism of uh, many compounds including the endogenous compounds like steroids steroids lipids so they are involved in the metabolism of endogenous compounds uh, like steroids lipid they are also involved in the metabolism of uh, exogenous compounds like many drugs what we take uh, like the toxic substances the pollutants what we inhale they are also involved in the metabolism of various carcinogens okay so basically they are uh, involved in the metabolizing of uh, uh, various endogenous substance as well as exogenous compound and they may they are may primarily seen in the liver as well as the gi tract gastrointestinal tract they are primarily seen in the liver as well as the gi tract now the cytochrome p450 system can be classified into different uh, enzymes based on their family subfamily as well as this uh, gene locus in the chromosome they are of different types like cyp3a4 is there 2d6 2c9 2c19 1a2 2b6 lot of enzymes are there in the 450 system now out of this uh, nearly 50 percentage of the drugs are metabolized nearly 50 percent of the drugs are metabolized by cy3a4 Whereas uh, the uh, 2C, 2D6, CYP 2D6 metabolize approximately 20%. So, this is the basically the relative percentage. Okay. So, 50% of the drugs are metabolized or approximately 50% of drugs are metabolized by CYP 3A4. 2D6 involves in the metabolism of 20% of drugs. Now, coming to 2C9, approximately 15 to 16% of the drugs are metabolized by 2C9. Whereas 2C19 uh, are involved in metabolizing 10% of the drugs. 2A1 or A2, uh, CYP1A2 is also involved in metabolizing 10% of the drugs. So, the majority of the drugs are metabolized by CYP3A4. Okay. So, the correct answer for this question was the uh, most abundant uh, CYP450 enzyme involved in metabolizing drug. Answer would be definitely A choice CYP3A4. Which anti HIV drug? Which anti HIV drug is an orally administered entry inhibitor? A choice Maraviroc, B choice Enfuvertide, C choice Rilpivirin, and D choice Raltigravir. So, before coming to the correct answer, we know that in the case of uh, uh, HIV treatment, the anti HIV drugs are of uh, can be mainly anti HIV drugs can be divided into. Uh, mainly four categories uh, the first one was uh, fusion inhibitor or entry inhibitor fusion or entry inhibitor the second one was uh, reverse transcriptor in uh, reverse transcriptors inhibitors uh, like uh, nucleoside reverse transcriptors inhibitor uh, second one is a non nucleoside reverse transcriptors inhibitor the third category was uh, integrase inhibitor. Integrase inhibitor. The fourth category was uh, protease inhibitor. These were the uh, main um, uh, uh, different classes of drug used in the treatment of HIV. Fusion inhibitors or entry inhibitor, reverse transcriptors inhibitor, integrase inhibitor and protease inhibitor. Okay. Now, the question is that uh, uh, which of the following drug belong to the orally administered entry inhibitor. So, mainly two entry inhibitors or fusion inhibitors were Enfuvertide was the one example. The drugs 
belonging to this category was Enfu Virtide and Marav Rock. So these were the two example examples belonging to the fusion inhibitor category. So as you can see, choice A and choice B, they are entry inhibitors. They are actually entry inhibitors. They are entry inhibitors. They are entry inhibitors or fusion inhibitors. Whereas the rilpivirin, this belongs to non-nucleoside reverse non-nucleoside reverse transcriptors inhibitor category, NNRTA category. Whereas raltigravir belongs to integrase inhibitor category. So definitely the answer would be one among from Maraviroc and Enfuvertide because the question has been asked like which of the following is an orally administered entry inhibitor. So these are the two uh, important entry inhibitors Maraviroc and Enfuvertide. Now the question is among these two which is the orally administered drug. So the answer is Maraviroc this is the only orally administered entry inhibitor whereas Enfuvertide is a peptide. Enfuvertide is a peptide. So this cannot be given orally because it will be degraded when you are giving it orally. So it is always given through the parenteral route. Parenteral route. Okay. So whereas Maraviroc is given through the oral oral route. So the uh, orally administered entry inhibitor, the drug, the correct answer would be definitely A choice Maraviroc. So the following route of administration has got the maximum bioavailability. A choice intravenous. B choice intramuscular, C choice subcutaneous, D choice oral. Although the question is very simple, let's understand what is uh, bioavailability. So bioavailability is nothing but the fraction of the drug, the fraction of administered drug, the fraction of administered drug which reaches reaching the systemic circulation, reaching the blood, reaching the plasma reaching the systemic circulation so this is the definition of bioavailability fraction of drug administered drug reaching the systemic circulation now bioavailability is calculated from the plot of plasma concentration plasma concentration versus time graph so this is the uh, if, you, if you can plot the plasma concentration with time you can calculate the bioavailability so let's uh, draw a graph so this is the plot of concentration of uh, drug in plasma concentration of the drug in plasma and uh, the x-axis let's take it as time y-axis is the concentration of drug in the plasma now assume this is the plot so in this plot uh, uh, so in this graph this is the con maximum concentration so the this, this maximum concentration is called as the c max so c max is the maximum concentration and the time at which max c max is attained or the time at which it's, uh, maximum concentration is attained is called as t max so this is the plot of plasma concentration with the time you will get the c max you will get the t max now this entire area in this graph this entire area in this graph is called as the area under the curve area under the curve auc okay so area under the area under the curve auc gives the extent of absorption so auc is the measure of the extent of absorption extent of absorption and it's used to calculate the bioavailability from AUC you can calculate the bioavailability the fraction of drug reaching the systemic circulation you could calculate by AUC so normally bioavailability is measured from the area under the curve uh, through which uh, AUC of which route you are administering it could be oral route or it could be an intramuscular route or it could be a subcutaneous route divided by area under the curve of IV. IV is considered normally to be 100 percentage bioavailable. So bioavailability is AUC of which route you are administering oral or intramuscular or subcutaneous divided by area under the curve AUC IV and if you multiply it with 100 you will get the percentage bioavailability. You will get the percentage bioavailability. Now normally Indra, as I already told, intravenous route is considered to be 100. The bioavailability of intravenous route is normally considered to be 100 percentage because you are directly giving it to the vein, so it will reach the blood actually. So 100 percentage it is bioavailable. Whereas intramuscular route normally it is 70, 
5 to 100 percentage. Same with the subcutaneous, it is 75 to 100 percentage. Whereas the oral route is highly variable, it's highly variable and it can vary from even 1 to 100. So that is the variation of oral um, bioavailability. When you are drug, when you are administering a drug through oral route, it can vary from one to hundred. So the maximum uh, bioavailability could be attained by uh, intravenous route. So the correct answer would be uh, a choice intravenous route. Is the drug remaining in the body after three half life? In first order kinetics, the drug remaining in the body after three half lives. A choice twelve point five percentage. B choice 75 percentage, C choice 87.5 percentage, D choice 50 percentage. So as you all know, half life or T half is defined as the uh, time required to reduce the plasma concentration to half of its original value. T half is defined as the time required to reduce the plasma concentration to half of its original value. Now let us take 100 as the initial value. So after the first half life, after the first half life, after the first half life, 100 would become 50. So in the body after first half life, it will be 50, only 50, 50 amount would be present. The drug remaining will be 50. Now after the second half life, after the second T half, this 50 would become 25. That means after second half life, the drug remaining in the body would be 25. Now after third half life, after third half life, 25 would become 12.5. So the drug or the amount of drug present in the body after third half life will be 12.5 percentage. So here the question asked was the drug remaining in the body after three half life. So after three half life, the drug remaining in the body will be definitely 12.5 percentage. So answer would be A choice 12.5 percentage. Now the same question could be asked it in a different way. Elimination after three half life. Elimination after three half life in first order kinetics. Now here the question the first in the first in this case it was the drug press the drug present in the body after three half life. But, but here the question asked is elimination. How much got eliminated? So as you know, when hundred became fifty after first half life, how much got eliminated? the amount which was got amount which got eliminated the amount which got eliminated will be 50 when 100 became 50 50 got eliminated after first half life in the second half life 50 became 25 so how much how much got eliminated 25 got eliminated now in the third half life 25 became 12.5 so how much got eliminated so it will be 12.5 so here the question was what is the elimination after three half life so in the after first half life 50 got eliminated after the second half life 25 got eliminated after the third half life 12.5 got eliminated so if you, if you can add all these three all these three you will get the amount eliminated after the three half life which will be the sum of 50 plus 25 plus 12.5 and the answer would be 87.5 percentage so here the answer would be c choice 87.5 percentage hope you understood this question which of the following is the active metabolite which of the following is the active metabolite of the drug carbamazepine a choice carbamazepine 10 11 epoxy b choice carbamazepine 5 6 epoxy C choice carbamazepine 6 7 epoxy and D choice 2 hydroxy carbamazepine. So, before coming to the correct answer, let us understand some of the important points regarding carbamazepine. Carbamazepine is abbreviated as CBZ, CBZ or carbamazepine. So, as you all know, it is one of the first discovered, one of the first discovered anti epileptic drug. One of the first discovered anti epileptic drug mainly used in the treatment of seizures mainly used in the treatment of seizures one of the first discovered anti-epileptic drug now coming to the important uses of uh, uh, carbamazepine 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 is the drug of choice for the drug of choice for focal epilepsy drug of choice for focal seizures drug of choice for focal seizures 
it is also the drug of choice for it is also the drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia so it is a drug of choice for focal seizures it is a drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia it can also be used as an alternative it can be also be used as an alternative in bipolar disorder normally you know lithium is considered to be the drug of choice in bipolar disorder lithium is considered to be the drug of choice however carbamazepine can be used as an alternative in um, for lithium in bipolar disorder carbamazepine can also be used in neuropathic pain it can also be used in neuropathic pain so these are some of the important uses of carbamazepine now coming to the chemical uh, uh, chemical structure and its classification carbamazepine comes under the chemical classification of immunostilbene category it comes under the classification of immuno still been category immuno still been category in the chemical classification it comes under immuno still been category now coming to the actual structure it's a derivative of dibenzazepine it's a dibenzazepine derivative it's a dibenzazepine derivative so that is a chemical Uh, uh, structure of uh, carbamazepine it's a derivative of di benz acepine so in this word let's draw the structure of acepine first so let me draw the structure of acepine so acepine is a seven membered ring acepine is a seven membered ring this is a seven membered ring with one nitrogen atom so 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 so it's a seven membered ring with one nitrogen atom so that is called as acepine now here dibenz dibenz means two benz benzene groups are there so one benzene group let me draw in the right side so this is one benzene group i have drawn it on the right side of acepine another benzene comes on the left side so this is the structure of dibenz acepine okay now uh, this nitrogen contains a car co ns2 group which is the car carboxamide group so this entire structure this entire structure is called as carbamazepine this entire structure is called as carbamazepine okay so an acepine ring is there and two benzene ring, rings are there one on the right side one on the left side now the numbering of this carbamazepine is like this this is the first one two three four nitrogen comes the five six 7 8 9 and this is 10 and this carbon is 11 so this is the numbering of carbamazepine now coming to the the question was which is the following is the active metabolite now coming to the metabolism of carbamazepine coming to the metabolism of carbamazepine so mainly carbamazepine is metabolized by a class of enzyme present in the liver called as cytochrome p450 it is metabolized by cytochrome p450 mainly two types of cytochrome p450 that is one is cytochrome cyp3 a4 is one enzyme which metabolizes carbamazepine another car uh, C, um, cytochrome enzyme is cyp2 c8 so cyp3 a4 and cyp2 c8 are the two important enzyme which metabolizes carbamazepine and the process of metabolism is called as oxidation process so carbamazepine is metabolized by the process called as oxidation now what exactly happens so this is the structure of carbamazepine this oxidation happens between 10th carbon and 11th carbon okay 10th carbon and 11th carbon so after the oxidation what happens uh, this kind of structure would be formed the double bond would be replaced by a cyclic ring cyclic ring uh, with oxygen atom so this kind of structure is called as epoxide so this kind of structure is called as epoxide and that epoxide has come between the 10th and the 11th carbon so it is called as carbamazepine 10,11 epoxide so this is the active metabolite of carbamazepine carbamazepine 
10 11 epoxy and the structure of uh, carbon mercipane 10 11 epoxide is this particular thing the oxidation happen between the 10th and 11th carbon so this is called as carbon mercipane 10 11 epoxy now coming to the question which of the following is the active metabolite of the drug carbon mercipane the answer the correct answer is a choice carbon mercipane 10 11 epoxy 5 5 diphenyl imidazolidin 24 dion is used as dash a choice sedative hypnotic b choice local anesthetic c choice anti-epileptic and d choice anti-hypertensive drug now uh, let me uh, first of all let us draw the structure of uh, imidazolidin so imidazolidin is nothing but a five membered ring with the two nitrogen atom so this is a structure of imidazolidin and uh, in, in this structure uh, the numbering would be this is the first atom this is the second atom this nitrogen is the third one this is the fourth one and this is the fifth one now this particular structure is called as imidazolidin imidazolidin so in this imidazolidin the question was that 5 5 diphenyl imidazolidin 2 4 dion so in the second position if you put a double bone and the fourth position if you put a double bone the structure would be imidazolidin 2,4 dion 2,4 dion now at the fifth position you need to attach two phenyl rings so this is the fifth position let me draw one phenyl here so this is one phenyl so this is the second phenyl now the structure would be 5,5 5 diphenyl imidazolidin 2,4 dion now this imidazolidin 2,4 dion imidazolidin 2,4 dion is called as hyaldan 2 is also called as hyaldan 2 so that means this particular structure could also be called as 5,5 5 diphenyl hyaldan 2 5,5 5 diphenyl hyaldan 2 that 5 5 diphenyl hydantoin is nothing but the chemical name of phenytoin. So, phenytoin is 5 5 diphenyl hydantoin. That means this particular name, what is given here, is nothing but phenytoin. Now, coming to the use of phenytoin, as you all know, phenytoin is used in the treatment of generalized, could be used for the treatment of generalized tonic clonic seizure. Generalized tonic clonic seizure. It can also be used in focal seizures. It is also used as an anti-arrhythmic drug. It is also used as an anti-arrhythmic drug. So these are some of the uses of uh, phenytoin. So the question is uh, use of phenytoin basically. So the correct answer from the option would be C choice anti-epileptic drug. Therapeutic drug monitoring is done for A choice penicillin, B choice phenytoin, C choice lignocaine, D choice erythromycin and E choice all of the above. So before coming to the correct answer, let's understand what is therapeutic drug monitoring or TDM. So it is nothing but measuring the concentration, measuring the drug concentration, measuring the drug concentration in plasma. Now why we need to measure the drug concentration in plasma? Basically done to done to adjust the dose of that particular to adjust the dose of a drug to adjust the dose of a drug now to adjust the dose of a drug you need to measure the drug concentration in plasma that phenomenon is called as or that process is called as therapeutic drug monitoring or TDM now comes the question why you need to do a TDM why therapeutic drug monitoring need to be done so in certain disease condition, so in the case of certain disease, the response cannot be the response to a particular drug, response to a particular drug cannot be measured immediately. Response cannot be measured. Response to that particular drug cannot be measured. So in that, that case, you cannot adjust the dose of a drug based on the response because it cannot be measured uh, because the response cannot be measured response cannot be measured in such cases you need to do a tdm one example is in the case of epilepsy 
epilepsy you cannot adjust the dose uh, of a, that particular drug based on the response and in that case you, you need to do a tdm in the second case why you need to do a tdm second case certain in the case of certain drugs in the case of certain drugs with low therapeutic index in the case of certain drug with the low therapeutic index abbreviated as ti if the therapeutic index is low uh, you need to do a tdm ideally a tdm could be done actually now what is this therapeutic index or ti so basically it's the it's a uh, it's an indicator to measure the safety of a drug it indicate measure the safety of a particular drug it is an indicator to the safety of a drug how much a drug is safe if the therapeutic index is higher if the therapeutic index is high if the therapeutic index is high the drug is very safe the drug is safe whereas if the therapeutic index is low if the therapeutic index is low the drug is not safe it is unsafe it's not a safe drug so that is the that's the meaning of uh, therapeutic index it measure the safety of a drug now which are which are the drugs having low therapeutic in index because if the drug is having a low therapeutic index you can you need to do a tdm okay now coming to the examples of drugs with low therapeutic index drugs with low therapeutic index you can remember this mnemonics the vip gentleman the vip gentleman bought car on the vip gentleman bought car on diwali the vip gentleman bought car on diwali the stands for theophilin so theophilin is a drug with low therapeutic index theophilin in vip v stands for valproic acid valproic acid which is an anti epileptic drug where the therapeutic index is low i stands for immunosuppressants immunosuppressant drugs some of the examples are cyclosporin is having low therapeutic index tacrolimus is having low therapeutic index sirolimus is an immunosuppressant having low therapeutic index now in vip p stands for phenytoin p stands for phenytoin in, in the case of gentle gentleman gen stands for gentamicin gentamicin it is an aminoglycoside antibiotic aminoglycoside antibiotic where the therapeutic index is low then uh, car car means carbamazepine carbamazepine it is also carbamazepine is an anti epileptic drug the therapeutic index is low now in diwali di stands for digoxin wa stands for warfarin it's an anti coagulant drug having low therapeutic index in diwali li stands for lithium it is a drug used or the drug of choice for the mania or bipolar Uh, disorder bpd the lithium is also having a low therapeutic index so these are the some of the drugs which is having low therapeutic index so theophylline requires is a drug with low therapeutic index it, it tdm need to be done valproic acid therapeutic drug tdm has to be done in all these immunosuppressants you need to do a tdm in the case of phenytoin you need to do a tdm in the case of gentamicin tdm is required in the case of carbamazepine tdm is required in the case of digoxin tdm is required in the case of lithium tdm is required however in the case of warfarin tdm is not necessary in the case of warfarin although warfarin is coming under the low therapeutic index drug in the uh, in the case of warfarin tdm is not necessary because you can measure the prothrombin time can measure the prothrombin time that is the inr ratio you can measure inr ratio inr you can measure 
and therefore you need to measure the drug concentration in the plasma so although warfarin comes under the low therapeutic index drug you therapeutic drug monitoring is not necessary whereas in the case of lithium digoxin carbamazepine gentamicin phenytoin immunosuppressants theophylline valproic acid in all these cases uh, tdm is required now coming to the question therapeutic drug monitoring is done for so the correct answer would be b choice phenytoin question is which of the following is not an antigen presenting cell a choice dcs b choice langerhans cells c choice t cells d choice b cells and e choice all of the above now coming before coming to the answer let's understand what is this antigen presenting cells abbreviated as apc antigen presenting cells they are also called as phagocytic cells they also phagos phagocytic cells now the pri as you know the primary function of this antigen presenting cell is to capture the microbes they capture the microbes or it could be antigens also they capture these antigens then they transport it to the lymphoid organs they transport these microbes to the lymphoid organs after this it process these antigens these antigen presenting cells it process they process these um, uh, microbes or antigens finally they display these microbes or antigen processed antigens or processed microbes they display them to the lymphocytes display them to the lymphocytes and that's how the immune activation or immune suppression would happen and this is the normal function of an antigen presenting cells also called as phagocytic cells now coming to the important examples of antigen presenting cells the important ones are dcs the important examples are dcs also called as dendritic cells dcs are abbreviated as uh, sorry dendritic cells are abbreviated as dcs dendritic cells another example uh, of uh, antigen presenting cells which is represented by the symbol called as macrophages so macrophages is also an important antigen presenting cells macrophages then another example for antigen presenting cell is langerhans cells langerhans cells so they are also antigen presenting cells another example is b cells so these are the very common examples for antigen presenting cells dendritic cells macrophages langerhans cells and b cells out of this the most efficient antigen presenting cells are the most efficient and if the question is the most efficient antigen presenting cells the answer is dcs and macrophages okay so dcs and macrophages are the more most efficient antigen presenting cells now coming to the question which of the following is not an antigen presenting cell so dc is an antigen presenting cell langerhans cells are antigen presenting cells uh, b cells are antigen presenting cell so definitely the answer would be t cells they are not an antigen presenting cell the correct answer is c choice t cells mesangial cells mesangial cells are macrophages present in a choice brain b choice liver c choice spleen d choice kidney e choice placenta so before coming to the correct answer let's under understand about macrophages macrophages they are represented by this particular symbol macrophages so as i have discussed in my previous video they are specialized antigen presenting cells they are specialized antigen presenting cells mainly involved in the detection phagocytosis and destruction of foreign substances foreign substance include bacteria virus various antigens etc so this is a uh, important function of macrophage they are specialized antigen presenting cells now in different organs macrophages are are having different name so let's understand uh the name of macrophages present in each organ let's start with brain so in brain the macrophage is called as microglia so microglia are the macrophages present in the brain now coming to liver 
The macrophage is present in liver. The important macrophages are Kupffer cells. So Kupffer cells are the macrophages present in the liver. Coming to the spleen. So spleen is considered to be one of the major lymphoid organ. It has multiple macrophages. If the important ones are red pulp macrophages, marginal zone macrophages, metallophilic macrophages, and littoral cells. So these are the important macrophages present in the spleen. Now coming to the lymph node, the lymph node, the macrophages are called as sinus macrophages. Also they have medullary macrophages. So sinus macrophages and medullary macrophages are present in the lymph node. Now coming to the intestine. So the macrophages present are called as M cells. M cells are the abbreviation of microfold cells. Microfold cells mainly seen in the Peyer's patches. So M cells are the macrophages present in the intestine. Now coming to lungs, the macrophages are called as alveolar macrophages. Now coming to skin, the macrophage present is called as Langerhans cells. Now coming to bone, the macrophage present is called as osteoclast. Osteoclast is the macrophage present in bone. Now coming coming to connective tissue, the name of macrophage is histiocytes. All these are macrophages, known with different names. So histiocytes are the macrophages present in the connective tissue. Now in blood, the macrophages are basically monocytes. So monocytes are considered to be the macrophages present in the blood. Now coming to placenta, the macrophage is called as Hofbar cells. Hofbar cells. Now coming to kidney. Macrophage present is called as mesangial cells. So mesangial cells are the macrophages in the kidney. Okay. Now coming to the um, question. Mesangial cells are macrophages present in. We have just discussed. So the right answer would be D choice kidney. In brain it will be microglia cells. In liver it's, it is Kupffer cells. In spleen there are multiple macrophages. Red pulp macrophages. Metallophilic macrophages, littoral cells. In placenta, it is Hofbar cells. So the answer to this question is D choice kidney. And the question is, what is the half life of a drug having a volume of distribution of 80 liters and a clearance of 2.8 liters per minute? A choice 10 minutes, B choice 20 minutes, C choice 30, D choice 40 and E choice 50. So the question asked here is about the half life, T half, half life. And the factors or the parameters what is given here is volume of distribution as well as the clearance. So the question asked is about half-life abbreviated as T half. So we know that uh, half-life of a normally first order kinetic the equation is 0 0.693 divided by K. Now what is K? So K is nothing but the elimination rate constant. It is the elimination rate constant. However, in this equation uh, or in this numerical, they have not given the value of K. Rather, they have given volume of distribution, VD they have given. Also, they have given clearance, abbreviated as CLR. So, VD and clearance has been given. Uh, so, we know that uh, elimination rate constant K is equal to clearance divided by volume of distribution. Now, substituting this value, this uh, uh, K, in the T half equation, T half would become 0 0.693 the whole divided by instead of K you can substitute this equation that is clearance divided by volume of distribution. Now solving this equation 0 
VD will be come in the numerator, volume of distribution will come in the numerator and clearance will be in the denominator. So this is the equation for uh, T half. So either you need to remember this equation or you can remember T half is equal to 0 0.693 divided by K and where K is equal to clearance divided by VD. Okay. Now it's just now it's just a matter of uh, adding that values. Now uh, t half is equal to 0.693. So the volume of distribution what they have given here is uh, 80 liters. So into 80 liter and clearance what they have given is 2.8 liter per minute. Liter per minute. Now this liter and liter will get cancelled. Now this minute will come in the uh, numerator. So the equation will be 0 0.693 into 80 divided by 2.8 minutes. Now uh, 0 0.693 you could consider it like 0 0.7. 0 0.7. Now uh, this uh, 0 0.7 and 2.8 will get cancelled. So this the, the denominator it will be 4. And 80 by 4, you will get approximately 20. So 20 minutes is the half-life of a drug containing, uh, half-life of a drug having a volume of distribution of 80 liters and a clearance of 2.8 liter per minute. So the correct answer would be definitely B choice, 20 minutes. We are going to discuss five important questions from the Andy Convulsion chapter. So the first question is, patients with both primary generalized tonic cloning and absent seizure is best managed by a choice ethosuximide b choice carbamazepine c choice valproic acid and d choice phenytoin now you know that we have already discussed in our previous video we have told that in the case of absent seizures in the case of absent seizure the drug of choice the drug of choice is ethosuximide However, in the case of generalized tonic clonic seizure, generalized tonic clonic seizure, the drug of choice is valproic acid. Now, ethosuximide have only one use, that is, it is used only in absent seizures, and in fact, it is a drug of choice. However, if absent seizure, if absent seizure is accompanied by, with generalized tonic clonic seizure generalized tonic clonic seizure you cannot use ethosuximide and in fact the drug of choice is valproic acid itself so if the question is just absent seizure only then the correct choice is ethosuximide the drug of choice is ethosuximide if absent seizure is accompanied by other seizures like generalized tonic clonic seizure then the correct answer is valproic acid so the correct answer to this question is c choice valproic acid now let's come to the second so the question is which of the following anti epileptic drug is like is likely to cause hyponatremia as a side effect especially in elderly patients a choice phenobarbital b choice carbamazepine c choice valproic acid and d choice phenytoin sodium so one of the important point you need to remember here is uh, carbamazepine carbamazepine abbreviated as cbz it has an additional action which is it has the property to increase the antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin ADH. It has the property to increase ADH level. Now what is the function of ADH? The ADH function is to uh, the retention of water, water retention, retention of water to retain water actually. So when ADH level is increased or carbamazepine can increase the ADH level, the water retention also will increase. Now if the water retention is increasing, this will result, this can result in dilution of ions. It will dilute the ions in our body. Now important ion or one of the important ion in our body is sodium ion. So this can result in the dilution of uh, sodium ion and uh, the concentration of sodium in the blood will come down and this is called as hyponatremia now since this uh, uh, hyponatremia has occurred due to the dilution this is also called as 
dilutional hyponatremia so since uh, carbamazepine increases the ADH level the final result is that it can cause dilutional hyponatremia now this is very common in elderly patients so it is contraindicated so in fact carbamazepine is contraindicated in elderly people why because in elderly people there will be already water retention so if you give carbamazepine it will further in increase the ADH level and this will further aggravate this um, dilutional property and can result in dilutional hyponatremia so the correct answer for this question is B choice carbamazepine this will cause hyponatremia which of the following anti-epileptic drug is used as analgesic so we all know carbamazepine abbreviated as CBS has the property to decrease the pain that means it is used as an analgesic it can be used as an analgesic mainly it is a drug of choice for it is a drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia trigeminal neuralgia so carbamazepine in fact that is the drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia so the answer would be either a choice or b choice carbamazepine is the drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia now if carbamazepine cannot be given phenytoin can be used as an alternative drug phenytoin can be used in, as an alternative drug in trigeminal neuralgia in trigeminal neuralgia it is an alternative drug for carbamazepine in trigeminal neuralgia that means phenytoin can also have, is also an analgesic it can also decrease the pain so it is also an analgesic so the correct answer for this question would be carbamazepine and phenytoin which is b choice now coming to the fourth question which of the following anti epileptic drug is not an enzyme inducer not an enzyme inducer a choice phenobarbital b choice carbamazepine C choice valproic acid, D choice phenytoin sodium. So you, we, we have already discussed that anti-epileptic drugs are mainly metabolized by microsomal enzymes in the liver, which is mainly the cytochrome P450 family of enzymes. Now out of this thing, this phenobarbital is a potent enzyme inducer. It is a potent enzyme inducer. Similarly, carbamazepine is also a potent enzyme inducer. Similarly, phenytoin sodium is also a potent enzyme inducer. However, this valproic acid is not an inducer. It is a potent microsomal enzyme inhibitor. So valproic acid is an inhibitor whereas all other these uh, anti anti-epileptic drugs are enzyme inducer. So the question was which of the following anti-epileptic is not an enzyme inducer. The correct answer would be C choice valproic acid. Now coming to the final question. Which of the following anti-epileptic drug produce weight loss when given for longer duration? Now the important point you need to remember uh, topiramate. Apart from having this anti-epileptic drug, it is approved for the treatment of it is approved for the treatment of obesity. It is approved for the treatment of obesity because it has the property to decrease the weight. It will cause weight loss. It will cause weight loss. So the, this is this could be considered as a side effect. It can decrease the weight. How this has led to the approval approval of this particular drug for in the treatment of obesity. So the anti-epileptic drug which produces weight loss. The correct answer is uh, D choice, topiramate. This question is uh, basically regarding the anti dot, and the question is anti dot for ethylene glycol poisoning. A choice. Ethanol, B choice, pyridoxine, C choice, nitroglycerin, D choice, formipisole, and E choice, sodium thiosulfate. So, before coming to the correct answer, let's understand what is an anti dot. So, it's a remedy, basically, it's defined as a remedy to counteract. It's a remedy to counteract the harmful effects of, counteract the harmful effects of drug poisoning or drug toxicity 
so basically it's a remedy to counteract the harmful effects of drug poisoning as well as drug toxicity now let's uh, come to some important drug poisoning and the antidote use for that so in the case of uh, methanol poisoning the antidote is fomipizole Fomipizole is the antidote for methanol poisoning. In the case, in the choice, if fomipizole is not there, you please look for the choice ethanol. Okay, normally, normally ethanol is not preferred. Fomipizole is the preferred one. However, if the question does not contain fomipizole, just look for whether ethanol is given. So, in methanol poisoning, the antidote is fomipizole or ethanol. And uh, in the case of uh, ethylene glycol poisoning. Fomipizole is the antidote, the same in the case of methanol poisoning. So, Fomipizole is the antidote for ethylene glycol poisoning. Now, in the case of acetaminophen, acetaminophen is the chemical name of paracetamol. So, in that case, or in the paracetamol poisoning, the antidote is N acetyl cysteine. N acetyl cysteine. Now, the fourth question that is atropine. In the case of atropine poisoning, atropine is a anticholinergic drug. So, in the case of atropine poisoning, you need to give a cholinergic drug, and the antidote is physostigmine. Physostigmine is a cholinergic drug, atropine is an anticholinergic drug. Now, coming to benzodiazepine, like diazepam, in the case of benzodiazepine poisoning, the antidote is flumazenil. Flumazenil. Now coming to cyanide, in the case of cyanide poisoning, the antidote is hydroxocobalamin. 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 So if hydroxocobalamin is not there, another antidote is amyl nitrite in the presence of sodium thiosulfate Na2S2O3. So either hydroxocobalamin or amyl nitrate in combination with the sodium thiosulfate Na2S2O3. Now coming to digoxin poisoning. The antidote used is Digifab, that is the brand name, Digifab or another uh, same, uh, belonging to the same category but another brand, Digibind, Digibind. So this is the antidote for uh, uh, digoxin poisoning, basically they are digoxin specific antibodies, antibodies against digoxin, they are digoxin specific antibody. Digifab or Digibine, they are digoxin specific antibody which is used as the, as the antidote for digoxin poisoning. Now coming for, to the iron poisoning, the antidote is desferoxamine. Desferoxamine or it is also called as deferoxamine. Desferoxamine is also called as deferoxamine is the antidote for, antidote for iron poisoning. Now, in the case of isoniacid, the antidote is vitamin vitamin B6, which is also called as pyridoxin. Now, in the case of organophosphorus compound, again, they belongs to cholinergic category. In the case of organophosphorus compound poisoning, the antidote will be an anticholinergic drug. Definitely, it will be atropin. Carbamate also belongs to cholinergic category. So, definitely, the antidote will be an anticholinergic drug. Atropin. Now, very commonly asked question: the uh, antidote for opioid poisoning or morphine poisoning. The answer is naloxone. Naloxone is the antidote for opioid poisoning or morphine poisoning. Now, coming to salicylates like aspirin. Aspirin, there is although there is no specific antidote, the no, normally the urine alkalinization will be the mainly done alkalinization urine alkalinization will be done uh, or in the case of severe very severe um, aspirin poisoning the dialysis will be done so salicylate poisoning urine alkalinization or dialysis is the method used now coming to the beta blocker poisoning like propranolol propranolol uh, the antidote is glucagon 
ഗ്ലൂക്കഗോൺ ഗ്ലൂക്കഗോൺ സെയിം വിത്ത് ദാറ്റ് ഓഫ് കാൽഷ്യം ചാനൽ ബ്ലോക്കർ ദാൻഡി ഡോട്ട് ഈസ് ഗ്ലൂക്കഗോൺ നോ കമ്മിങ് ടു ഹെപ്പാരിൻ പോയിസണിങ് ഹെപ്പാരൻ ഇസ് എൻ ആൻഡി കോയിൽ ഡ്രഗ് സോ ഇൻ ദ കേസ് ഓഫ് ഹെപ്പാരിൻ പോയിസണിങ് ദാൻഡി ഡോട്ട് ഈസ് പ്രോട്ടമിൻ സൾഫേറ്റ് now coming to the last question in the case of warfarin the antidote is vitamin k vitamin k is the antidote however if warfarin poison is accompanied by severe bleeding in the case of severe bleeding of warfarin poisoning in addition to vitamin k the major antidote will be four factor four factor prothrombin 4 factor prothrombin complex concentrate so if warfarin poisoning is accompanied by severe po- bleeding the antidote is 4 factor prothrombin complex concentrate pcc abbreviated as pcc pcc is nothing but prothrombin complex concentrate the full name is 4 factor prothrombin complex concentrate or fft fresh frozen plasma so if the question is uh, what is the antidote for warfarin poisoning with a severe bleeding look for either pcc or fft that is fresh frozen plasma or prothrombin complex concentrate in addition to vitamin k so the answer to question ethylene glycol poisoning the antidote is fomipizole answer is d choice this question is uh, which of the following is a semi essential amino acid a choice phenylalanine b choice tyrosine c choice arginine d choice alanine e choice glutamic acid so before coming to the correct answer let's understand the type of amino acid, types of amino acids so it can be basically divided into two categories one is called as the essential amino acid the second one is called as a non essential amino acid now the basic difference between these two that is essential and non essential amino acid is in the case of essential amino acid they are those they are not these amino acids are not synthesized in our body whereas in the case of non essential they are synthesized in our body that is the primary difference between essential amino acid and non essential amino acid now uh, uh, since this essential amino acid is not synthesized in the body you have to take it through the diet you need to take it through the diet that is very important because it is not synthesized in the body now essential amino acid is also called as indispensable amino acid the other name of essential amino acid is indispensable amino acids whereas non essential amino acid is also called as dispensable amino acid so the other name of non essential amino acid is dispensable amino acid now coming to the examples of uh, these let's uh, start with the essential amino acid so essential amino acid you can remember with this mnemonic pvt private tim hall please remember this mnemonic private tim hall where p stands for phenyl alanine V stands for valine T stands for threonine The second T stands for tryptophan I stands for isoleucine M stands for methionine H stands for histidine a stands for arginine 
and L stands for lysine the second L stands for leucine so these 10 amino acids are, uh, are these 10 amino acids are basically the essential amino acid that means it is not synthesized in the body you have to take it through the diet now among this 10 this histidine and arginine this histidine and arginine they comes under a special category called as semi essential amino acid category histidine and arginine comes under semi essential category why because uh, this histidine and arginine is synthesized in adults they are synthesized in adults whereas in the growing children in the case of growing children in the case of children they are not synthesized that's why they are called as semi essential so ha histidine and arginine they belongs to semi essential category they are synthesized in adults whereas in the case of children they are not synthesized so considering this uh, essential amino acid if you if you ask how, how many absolutely essential amino acid absolutely essential amino acid out of that out of this 10 uh, other than this histidine and arginine are absolutely essential because they are not at all synthesized in either adults or children so the number of the number of um, essential absolutely essential amino acid the number is 8 whereas semi essential that is histidine and arginine that is 2 okay so that's why the total number is 10 for essential whereas the absolutely essential number is 8 and semi essential is 2 so whatever what all amino acids which is not coming under this category will come under non essential amino acid so you no need to remember it separately you study uh, the essential amino acid completely and what all amino acid not coming in that category can be included in non essential however i will include a mnemonic for non essential also you can remember by this mnemonic ga 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 PSC tire G A G A G A P S C tire where G stands for glycine A stands for alanine the second G stands for glutamic acid A stands for aspartic acid the second uh, third G stands for glutamine third A stands for asparagine P stands for the amino acid proline S stands for serin C stands for cysteine and tyre stands for tyrosine you can remember if you want you can remember this uh, GA 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 PSC tyre code otherwise you study uh, the essential amino acid all the 10 amino acid what all amino acid is not coming under that category you can you could include it in the non essential amino acid okay so coming to the question which of the following is a semi essential the correct uh, choice here uh, we have discussed semi essential could be remembered by ha histidine and arginine the right answer is c choice arginine whereas phenylalanine is a essential amino acid tyrosine is a non essential amino acid <coughs> alanine is a non essential amino acid glutamic acid is a non essential amino acid whereas arginine and histidine is a semi essential amino acid correct answer is c choice arginine question is which of the following is a xanthine derivative a choice theophylline b choice theobromine c choice paraxanthine d choice caffeine and e choice all of the above so before coming to the correct answer let's understand what is xanthine so xanthine is a purine derivative it is a purine derivative and chemically it is 2 comma 6 dioxypurine 2 6 dioxypurine is what is xanthine is so 2 6 dioxypurine is called as xanthine now uh, the theophylline theobromine paraxanthin caffeine all these are xanthine derivatives they are all xanthine derivatives now what is the difference between theophylline theobromine uh, paraxanthin and caffeine theophylline in theophylline 
there are only two methyl groups and uh, the position of that methyl group is at 1,3 dimethyl xanthine. So all of them are xanthine derivatives and theophylline there are two methyl groups and the methyl group is at the first position and the third position so it is 1,3 dimethyl xanthine. Now what is theobromine? That is also a xanthine derivative. It contains two methyl groups. So, but however, that methyl group is at the third position and seventh position. So, it is 3,7 dimethyl xanthine. Now, what is paraxanthine? They also contain two methyl groups and the position is at 1 and 7. So, it is 1, 7 dimethyl xanthine. So, theophylline is 1, 3, theobromine is 3, 7 and paraxanthine is 1, 7. All of them are dimethyl xanthine derivatives. Now, caffeine contains 3 methyl groups. It contains 3 methyl groups. So, you can take this number from here, 1, 3, 7. So, it contains 3 methyl groups. It is 1, 3, 7 trimethyl Sandin. So, caffeine is 1, 3, 7 trimethyl sandin. It contains 3 methyl groups. So, normally theophylline is a bronchodilator. It is a bronchodilator. Theobromine has a mild diuretic. It is having a mild diuretic action. Also, it is a cardiac stimulant. cardiac stimulant and caffeine as you all know it's a, it is a CN stimulant caffeine is a CN stimulant paraxanthine is a metabolite of caffeine it is a metabolite of caffeine okay so, the correct answer for this question, which of the following is in a sandin derivative, all of this theophylline, theobromine, parasandin, caffeine are sandin um, derivatives. So, the correct answer is E choice, all of the above. Question is um, which of the following coenzyme is derived from vitamin B5? A choice TPP, B choice FMN, C choice NAD, D choice coenzyme A, COA, E choice. PLP. So, before coming to the correct answer, let us understand a few points about coenzymes. So, generally uh, for an enzyme, there are mainly two parts. One is the protein part, protein part would, would be there and the other one is a non-protein part. The protein part of the enzyme is called as apoenzyme and the non-protein part of the enzyme is called as coenzyme. Okay, so basically coenzymes are the non-protein part. They are the non-protein part. Okay, now coenzymes, they are also called as uh, second substrate. Coenzymes, they are also called as second substrates or they are also called as co-substrates so the other name of uh, coenzymes are second substrates or co-substrates why because they have an affinity with the enzyme that's why they are called the second substrates or the co-substrates now let's look at the important examples for coenzymes important coenzymes and mostly uh, the coenzymes are derived from uh, the water soluble vitamin B complex. Most of the coenzymes are derived or the, or the precursors of this coenzymes. The precursors are the precursors are vitamin B complex. Okay, vitamin B complex. Now let's look into the different important uh, coenzyme. Number one, uh, TPP. TPP is a coenzyme and the uh, it's the abbreviation of thiamine. TPP is a coenzyme. The abbreviation, uh, the it's abbreviated form, and it is called as thiamine pyro 
phosphate. So TPP is a coenzyme which is called as thiamine pyrophosphate and it is derived from which vitamin you can tell from the name there is a vitamin with the thiamine so it is derived from thiamine vitamin thiamine B complex vitamin thiamine is nothing but vitamin B1 vitamin B1 is also called as thiamine vitamin B1 so TPP is derived from vitamin B1 coming to the second important one FMN FMN is the abbreviated form of flavin mononucleotide. Flavin mononucleotide. Uh, and it is derived from the vitamin. From this word flavin, you can remember the vitamin with the flavin name. Yes, it is riboflavin. So it is derived. Uh, FMN is derived from the vitamin called as riboflavin. And riboflavin is nothing but vitamin B2 vitamin b2 so fmn is a coenzyme which is derived from vitamin b2 Now the third important one fmn other than fmn it is fad fad the full form is the full name is flavin adenine dinucleotide so here also there is that word flavin is there so definitely it is derived from riboflavin the precursor of FAD is riboflavin, that is vitamin B2. So you can remember from the name FMN flavin, FAD flavin. So riboflavin is the vitamin and vitamin riboflavin is vitamin B2. Now coming to the fourth important one, that is NAD+. NAD+. So the NAD+, is also a coenzyme. The full name is nicotinamide. nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide so in nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide the abbreviated form is called as nad plus it is a coenzyme it's a coenzyme and uh, it is derived from the vitamin niacin can remember N for niacin, N for niacin, so it is derived from niacin vitamin and niacin is the name of vitamin B3. So niacin is also called as vitamin B3. So NAD plus is derived from vitamin B3. Also you can remember NADP plus. NADP plus. So this is the phosphate, phosphate derivative of NAD that is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide P stands for phosphate. It is the same as that of uh, NAD plus. Only thing one phosphate is there so that is NADP plus. So here also nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. So NAD plus is also derived from niacin. Niacin is also known as vitamin B3. So NAD plus, NADP plus nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. P stands for the phosphate group and it is derived from niacin that is vitamin B3. Now coming to the other important one that is the PLP. So PLP is also a coenzyme. The full name is pyridoxal phosphate. Pyridoxal phosphate. And now it is derived from the name itself pyrid, pyridox. That is it is derived from the vitamin called as pyridoxin. Pyridoxin. Pyridoxin is basically vitamin B6. Vitamin B6. Now, another important coenzyme that is co COA, that is nothing but coenzyme A. Coenzyme A. Okay, coenzyme A is abbreviated as COA. It is derived from the vitamin pantothenic acid. The vitamin precursor is pantothenic acid. In fact, vitamin pantothenic acid is vitamin B5. Pantothenic acid is vitamin B5. Now, another important one is uh, TH4. TH4 is a coenzyme. The full name is uh, tetrahydrofolate. The full name is tetrahydrofolate. So as the name indicates, it is derived from folic acid. It is derived from folic acid and folic acid is vitamin 
ബി നയൻ ഫോളിക് ആസിഡ് ദ അതർ നെയിം ഇസ് വൈറ്റമിൻ ബി നയൻ സോ ടി എച്ച് ഫോർ ഇസ് ഡിറൈവ്ഡ് ഫ്രം വൈറ്റമിൻ ബി നയൻ നോ കമ്മിങ് ടു ദ അനദർ ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻറ്റ് വൺ ദറ്റ് ഈസ് ബയോസൈറ്റിൻ സോ ബയോസൈറ്റിൻ ഇസ് ഓൾസോ ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻറ്റ് കോ എൻസെയിം ആൻഡ് ഇറ്റ് ഈസ് ഡിറൈവ്ഡ് ഫ്രം ദ വൈറ്റമിൻ ബയോട്ടിൻ 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 ഇസ് ദ അതർ നെയിം ഓഫ് വൈറ്റമിൻ ബി സെവൻ ബയോട്ടിൻ ഇസ് വൈറ്റമിൻ ബി ബി സെവൻ സോ ബയോസൈറ്റിൻ ഇസ് കോ എൻസെയിം ഡിറൈവ്ഡ് ഫ്രം വൈറ്റമിൻ ബി സെവൻ and uh, so these are the important uh, coenzymes which are uh, derived from the uh, water soluble b complex vitamins now coming to the question uh, which of the following coenzymes is de- derived from vitamin b5 so tpp is thiamine pyrophosphate it is derived from vitamin b1 fmn is flavin mononucleotide which is derived from vitamin b2 NAD plus is a nicotin adin nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide which is derived from vitamin B3 or niacin coenzyme COA is coenzyme which is derived from vitamin B5 PLP is pyridoxal phosphate which is derived from vitamin B6 so the correct answer for this question is D choice coenzyme A the question is what is the angle of insertion in the case of intravenous injection angle of insertion in the case of intravenous injection that is iv injection a choice 45 degree b choice 25 degree c choice 60 degree d choice 90 degree e choice 15 degree so mainly you need to know the angle of insertion mainly for four parenteral injections in the case of four parenteral injection you need to know the angle of insertion this could be asked for the question so the first one is uh, intramuscular root intramuscular root so the angle of insertion is 90 degree now the second root that is a subcutaneous root the angle of insertion is 45 degree the third one is the intravenous root the angle of insertion is 25 degree 25 degree and the fourth one that is the intradermal root intradermal injection the angle should be between 10 degree to 15 degree between 10 and 15 degree okay so these four uh, angle of insertion you, you should know so this picture would give a clear idea so this is the intramuscular injection so the needle should be inserted in the right angle so this angle is called as 90 degree and in the case of uh, uh, subcutaneous root this ang- angle should be 45 degree whereas in the case of intravenous root this angle should be 25 degree in the case of intra intradermal root the angle should be between 10 and 15 degree okay now you can this uh, picture again will give a better idea so this is the epidermis region this is the dermis region this is the subcutaneous tissue and this is the intra the inside region is the muscle region so as you can see in the case of intramuscular injection the injection is on to the deep tissue so this angle is 90 degree there is in this case of subcutaneous injection the injection is given to the subcutaneous tissue marked at, marked in yellow so this angle is 45 degree now in the case of intravenous injection you are injecting into the vein and this angle is 25 degree whereas in the case of intradermal you are inserting into the epidermal region and this angle is basically 10 to 15 degree so now coming back to the question what is angle of insertion in the case of intravenous injection the correct choice would be definitely b choice 25 degree so hope you understood this question this is who is considered to be the father of indian pharmacology a choice oswald schmidberg b choice sri ramnath chopra c choice gallen d choice mahadev lalscroft e choice nanathan so let's understand some of the important facts of different branches in pharmaceutical science so coming to the father of pharmacology or father of uh, modern pharmacology that designation is given to oswald schmidberg Oswald Schmidberg is considered to be the uh, father of pharmacology or father of modern pharmacology modern pharmacology now the designation father of indian pharmacology is given to sri ramnath chopra
Sri Ramana Chopra is considered to be the father of Indian pharmacology. Now the Greek physician Galen is considered to be Galen is considered to be the father of pharmacy. Now coming to the father of pharmacy education in India, it is Professor Mahadeva Lal Shkroff. Professor M. L. Shkroff is considered to be the father of pharmacy education in India. Now coming to the father of pharmacognosy, it is uh, Pedanius Dioscorides. Pedanius Dioscorides. Whereas the father of Indian pharmacognosy, the designation is given to Dr. Chandrakant Kokate. Dr. Chandrakant Kokate. Dr. C. Kokate is considered to be the father of Indian pharmacognosy. Now, father of medicine, you all know, it's Hippocrates. Now, you, you can also remember the World Pharmacist Day. This could also be asked for the exam. World Pharmacist Day. World Pharmacist Day is on, as you all know, it's on September 25th. September 25th. Okay, so these are some of the important facts uh, with respect to different pharma pharmaceutical branches. Now, consider to be the consider, coming to the question uh, today's question, uh, the father of Indian pharmaco pharmacology. The right answer is B choice, Sri Ramnath Chopra. Oswald Schmidberg is considered to be the father of pharmacology or modern pharmacology. Galen is considered to be the father of pharmacy. Mahadeva Lalshrop is considered to be the pharma father of uh, pharmacy education in in India. Pharmacy education in, in in India whereas Nanath Sen is considered the father of reverse pharmacology reverse pharmacology question is which of the following anti-HIV drug belonging to NNRT category is an enzyme inhibitor A choice nevirapin B choice ifavirans C choice itravirin D choice Dilaveridin and E choice all of the above. So in one of our previous video we have did a detailed classification of anti HIV drugs. So if you have if you have not watched that video please watch it the link to that video I will be giving it in the description box. So please watch it I have given the detailed classification of anti HIV drugs. Now one of the anti HIV drugs which I have explained there is belonging to NNRTA category. Now, what is NNRTA category? So, they are basically an anti-HIV uh, category of drugs called as non-nucleoside non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So this is a, one of the important anti-HIV drugs called as non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So which are the drugs belonging to that NNRTA category? We have already discussed in the previous video. Uh, NNRTA could be classified into two categories. There is a first generation NNRT, the second generation NNRT. Now which are the drugs belonging to first generation NNRT? That is one is nevirapin. The second is ifavirenz. The third important one is Dilaverd. So these three drugs belong, into, belong to the first generation NNRT. Whereas the second generation uh, NNRT, the important drug is Itravirin. Itravirin. Also other drugs are there, Rilpivirin. I have explained it in that previous video. So these are the four important drugs which belongs to NNRT category. Now you can remember this mnemonic. Need. N E E D. Whereas N stands for nevirapin, E stands for ifavirin, e, the second E stands for itravirin, D chan, uh, st uh, stands for delaverdin. So all of these are uh, the four important NNRT drugs. Now out of this four important NNRT drugs, nevirapin is an enzyme inducer. It is an enzyme inducer. Whereas ifavirin is also an enzyme inducer an enzyme inducer. Itravirin is also an enzyme inducer. Whereas Delaverdin is an enzyme inhibitor. So 
all this out of this four drugs the th first three drugs niv uh, nevirapine ifavirenz and uh, itravirenz they are all enzyme inducers whereas uh, the dilaverdin is an enzyme inhibitor okay now coming to the question uh, which of the following anti hiv drug belonging to nnrt category is an um, enzyme inhibitor as i told you you can remember this mnemonics need in this need the first three drugs are uh, are enzyme inducer whereas dilaverdin is an enzyme inhibitor so the correct answer would be d choice dilaverdin question is heterocodine is chemically a choice 3 methyl ether of morphine b choice 6 methyl ether of morphine c choice 3 6 diacetyl morphine d choice morphinyl ethyl morphine and e choice oxy dimorphine so these are all um, basically morphine derivatives so in our question answer discussion series in the question number 52 we have given the detailed explanation for the morphine structure so the morphine structure we have explained it in detail on the question number 52 so those who have not watched it do watch it so we'll get a, a clear picture of the morphine structure now lo let's look into the choice so in the morphine structure uh, at the third position if you introduce a methyl group in the hydroxyl hydrogen that will become 3 methyl ether of morphine so 3 methyl ether of morphine is basically called as codeine so 3 methyl ether of morphine is uh, codeine whereas uh, if this uh, uh, methyl group is attached to the hydrogen of the hydroxyl group at the sixth position that will become 6 methyl ether of morphine and 6 methyl ether of morphine is called as heterocodeine so 6 methyl ether of morphine is heterocodeine now if you attach a acetyl group at the 3 and 6 position that will become 3 6 diacetyl morphine this is called as heroin so 3 6 diacetyl morphine is called as heroin or brown sugar now coming to the d choice morphinyl ethyl morphine so this is uh, the name of homocodeine so homocodeine is chemically morphinyl ethyl morphine and this homocodeine the other name of homocodeine is folcodeine basically codeine and this folcodeine they are all anti tussive drugs they are all anti tussive drugs so the other name of homocodeine is folcodeine so folcodeine is chemically morphinyl ethyl morphine now coming to the last choice that is the oxy dimorphine uh, pseudo morphine is called as oxy dimorphine pseudo morphine so pseudo morphine is chemically oxy dimorphine so coming back to the question heterocodeine is chemically uh, the correct answer is b choice 6 methyl ether of morphine this question is washing soda is chemically washing soda is chemically a choice anhydrous sodium carbonate b choice hydrated sodium carbonate c choice anhydrous sodium sulfate d choice hydrated sodium sulfate e choice sodium bicarbonate so basically let's look at the first choice sodium carbonate that is anhydrous sodium carbonate so let's draw the structure of sodium carbonate so sodium carbonate is, it is na2co3 that is sodium carbonate let's look at the second choice that is the hydrated sodium carbonate basically the hydrated form na2co3 na2co3 10 10h2 that is a hydrated form of sodium carbonate now the third choice that is the anhydrous sodium sulfate the formula is na2so4 that is the anhydrous sodium sulfate coming to the fourth choice that is the hydrated sodium sulfate the most common hydrated sodium sulfate is na2so4 10h2 now coming to the fourth choice sodium bicarbonate the molecular formula is nah co3 nhco3 okay so coming to the first choice this anhydrous without any water content the, the anhydrous form of sodium carbonate is called as soda ash so anhydrous sodium carbonate the molecular formula na2so3 sorry na2co3 is called as soda ash whereas the hydrated form of sodium carbonate is called as washing soda 
so the molecular formula of washing soda is Na2CO3 10H2 that is a hydrated form of sodium carbonate is called as washing soda now coming to Na2SO4 that is an anhydrous form of sodium sulfate this is also called as uh, sul soda sulfate of soda sulfate of soda also it is called as the thenardrite so anhydrous sodium sulfate is called as thenardrite or simply sulfate of soda now coming to the fourth choice Na2SO4 10H2 this is a hydrated form of sodium sulfate and this is called as commonly called as global salt so global salt is chemically the hydrated form of sodium sulfate the molecular formula is Na2SO4 10H2 now coming to uh, sodium bicarbonate NaHCO3 this is also called as baking soda baking soda okay so uh, coming to the question washing soda is chemically so it is not the hyd anhydrous form it is a hydrated form of sodium carbonate the correct answer is b choice uh, hydrated sodium carbonate whereas the anhydrous sodium carbonate is called as soda ash soda ash anhydrous um, sodium uh, sulfate uh, is called as thenardrite we have already written here hydrous hydrated sodium sulfate is called as global salt and uh, sodium bicarbonate is called as baking soda is which of the following benzodiazepine drug is short acting a choice diazepam b choice fluoracepam c choice nitrazepam d choice triazolam e choice midazolam so before coming to the correct answer let's understand a few facts about benzodiazepine so benzodiazepines abbreviated as bdz they have mainly three uses one is they can be used as a sedative hypnotic drug they can be used as a sedative hypnotic drug they can also be used as an anti-anxiety drug they can also be given uh, in the treatment of epilepsy that is that is an anti-convulsant drug so these are some of the important uses of uh, Benzodiazepine, sedative hypnotic, they are anti anxiety drugs, they are also can be used as an anti convulsant drug. Now, based on the duration of action, based on the duration of action, benzodiazepines could be divided into three categories one is long acting, the second one is short acting. The third one is ultra sh short acting. So this classification that is long acting, short acting, ultra short acting is based on the duration of action. That means long acting drug benzodiazepine has a duration of action between 24 to 48 hours. Whereas short acting benzodiazepines have a duration of action from ranging from 12 to 24 hours. Whereas ultra short acting has a duration of action which is less than 6 hours. It is less than 6 hours. Okay. Now, which all drugs, which all benzodiazepines belongs to each of this category? So, let's start with the long acting benzodiazepine. So for this you can remember this mnemonic DCC, DCC, FCC. So D stands for diazepam, C stands for clonazepam, the second C stands for clobazam, F stands for fluoracepam, The C, this C stands for chlordisipoxide. The last C stands for chlor, chlorazepate. So, room, you can remember this uh, mnemonic DCC, 
FCC. Okay, so these are the important drugs which belongs to the long-acting benzodiazepine category. Now coming to the second category that is short-acting. Short-acting benzodiazepine. You can remember this mnemonic. All NIT hotel. All NIT All NIT hotel are short. All NIT hotels are short. So all stands for Alprazolam. So Alprazolam is a short acting uh, um, benzodiazepine. NIT, N sta uh, NIT stands for Nitrasipam. Nitrasipam is a short acting benzodiazepine. In the hotel, hotel, H stands for halasipam. So halasipam is a short acting benzodiazepine. O stands for oxasipam. T stands for timasipam. T E stands for timazipam. L stands for lorasipam. So you can remember this mnemonic all NIT hotels are they are basically short acting okay alprazolam nitrasipam halasipam oxasipam timasipam and lorazipam now coming to the last category that is the ultra short acting ultra short acting benzodiazepine you can remember this mnemonic utm where t stands for triazolam and M stands for midazolam. So triazolam and midazolam have a duration of action less than 6 hours. Therefore, they belongs to ultra short acting benzodiazepine category. Now coming to the question. Which of the following drug is uh, short acting? So, uh, dicepam, we have studied the mnemonic DCC, FCC. So, di so dicepam is a long acting benzodiazepine. Fluoracepam, DCC, FCC, we have studied it in the long acting uh, benzodiazepine. So, fluoracepam is also long acting. Nitrasipam, we have studied the mnemonic all night hotels are short. So, NIT means all NIT hotels are short. So, N N N N nitrasipam, they are basically short acting triazolam midazolam i asked you to remember utm so they are basically uh, uh, ultra short acting ultra short acting so the correct answer for this question the short acting drug the answer is c choice nitrasipa kidney is um, which of the following drug causes the teratogenicity called as epstein's anomaly a choice lithium, B choice phenytoin, C choice valproic acid, D choice thalidomide, and E choice corticosteroids. So, before coming to the answer, let's understand about the teratogenicity. So, normally, when a fetus, when a fetus is exposed to certain drugs, when a fetus is exposed to certain drugs uh, during the pregnancy time. During the during the pregnancy, this can result in a congenital malformation. So when certain when fetus is exposed to certain drugs during the pregnancy, this can result in a congenital malformation. This congenital malformation is called as teratogenicity. So ideally telling such drugs, such drugs should be avoided to prevent this teratogenicity. That means it should be, it is contra, such drugs are contraindicated in the pregnancy because it could, it could result in a teratogenicity. Okay. Now let's come to certain examples and its teratogenic effect. So lithium when given during pregnancy, there is high chance to cause the teratogenic effect call, called as Epstein's anomaly. So, the teratogenic effect of uh, lithium is Epstein's anomaly. The teratogenic 
arsenic effect of chloramphenicol that chloramphenicol causes gray baby syndrome now coming to valproic acid the teratogenicity is called as neural tube defect coming to thalidomide the teratogenicity is called as phocomelia coming to corticosteroids corticosteroids when given during pregnancy the teratogenicity is called as facial cleft it can result in facial cleft now coming to tetracyclines the teratogenic effects are mainly one is yellow colored teeth yellow teeth also it can result in a bone growth defect so yellow teeth and bone growth defect is the teratogenic effect of tetracyclines now coming to fluoroquinolones the it can result in the teratogenic mainly cartilage damage cartilage and uh, tendon damage cartilage and tendon damage alcohol the teratogenic effect is called as fetal alcohol syndrome fetal alcohol syndrome now warfarin the teratogenic effect is called as fetal warfarin syndrome the teratogenicity of phenytoin is called as fetal hydantoin syndrome Now coming to the last one this penicillamine the, the teratogenicity is called as uh, mainly the loose skin is the teratogenic effect of penicillamine so these are the some of the important teratogenicity and the drugs involved in that now coming to the question uh, the drugs which uh, causes epstein's anomaly the answer is uh, lithium lithium causes epstein's anomaly phenytoin causes fetal hydantoin syndrome valproic acid causes uh, neural tube defect thalidomide causes phocomelia and corticosteroids mainly causes the facial cleft the right answer is a choice lithium this question is which of the following drug can be used as a life saving measure in the case of amanita phalloides poisoning a choice physostigmine b choice atropine C choice silimarin D choice N-acetyl cysteine and E choice both C and D so amanita phalloides so let's understand uh, the fact about amanita phalloides so it belongs to the mushroom category amanita phalloides is a mushroom so the question is basically regarding the mushroom poisoning so the important thing you need to remember there are different types of mushrooms and uh, the depending on the different species of mushroom the symptoms are different and the treatment is also different okay now let's understand a few fact about mushroom poisoning mushroom poisoning is also called as mycetism the other name of mushroom poisoning is mycetism okay now there are mainly two kind types of mushroom poisoning one is the early mushroom poisoning early mushroom poisoning the second one is called as the delayed mushroom poisoning now what is the basic difference between the early mushroom poisoning and delayed mushroom poisoning is that in the case of um, early mushroom poisoning the symptoms the symptoms will start within 30 minutes the symptoms will start within 30 minutes in the case of early mushroom poisoning whereas in the case of delayed mushroom poisoning the symptoms will be uh, starting after 12 hours only okay it may take even one day also so here the symptoms are delayed that it will take at least 12 hours whereas here it will be an immediate symptom that will be within 30 minutes now uh, which are the species of mushroom that causes uh, early mushroom poisoning now uh, there are mainly four species uh, which causes the early mushroom poisoning one important one is uh, boletus mushroom boletus mushroom 
the second one is um, clitocybe mushroom species clitocybe mushroom the third one is inocybe mushroom so boletus clitocybe and as well as inocybe mushroom they all uh, belongs to the early mushroom poisoning one more is there that is amanita muscaria species amanita muscaria species okay so this four these four mushroom they are basically cause the early mushroom poisoning in the case of uh, delayed uh, mushroom the main example is amanita phalloides amanita phalloides species okay so delayed mushroom poisoning in the case of delayed mushroom it is amanita phalloides species whereas in the case of early mushroom poisoning the main species are boletus clitocybe inocybe as well as amanita muscaria species now let's understand uh, let's come to the early mushroom poisoning early mushroom poisoning so as i told the main species are boletus the second one is clito uh, clitocybe the third important one is inocybe so this three mushroom species boletus clitocybe as well as inocybe the main content the main content here it is muscari the main content present in these uh, three species are muscarin and you know that muscarin is actually a cholinergic kind of drug cholinergic kind of drug so the symptoms here mainly the symptoms what will be symptoms which happens during the poisoning of boletus or clitocybe or inocybe are mainly cholinergic symptoms will be the main symptoms cholinergic symptoms will be the main the mainly diarrhea lacrimation excessive secretion will be there lacrimation then uh, the heart rate will be there that is a classical symptom of uh, cholinergic so bradi cardia so basically all these are actually cholinergic symptoms are the main symptoms which happens the happens during the poisoning of boletus clitocybe and inocybe the reason is that it contains the main content is muscarin which is a cholinergic kind of component cholinergic component so the symptoms also will be cholinergic symptoms like diarrhea lacrimation bradycardia therefore the treatment when you need to treat this kind the poisoning which is happened due to um, uh, this boletus clitocybe inocybe since the symptoms are cholinergic you need to give an anti cholinergic drug therefore the drug of choice for the treatment of this kind of uh, mushroom poisoning is definitely an anti cholinergic drug which is atropin so atropin is the drug of choice for the mushroom poisoning which is happened due to boletus clitocybe and inocybe okay you can remember this mnemonic bill clinton in america bill clinton in america this is the mnemonic you could remember b stands for boletus clinton c stands for clitocybe i i n stands for inocybe so america stands for atropin so atropin is the drug of choice for for boletus clitocybe inocybe you can remember this mnemonic okay now coming to the fourth species which causes uh, uh, early mushroom poisoning that is amanita muscaria amanita muscaria this also causes delay early mushroom poisoning amanita muscaria here the main thing you need to remember the main content although the name is muscaria the amount of muscarin is very low muscarin is very very low here okay so the main content is not muscarin in fact the main content is is called as mucimol so in the case of uh, boletus clitocybe inocybe the main content was muscarin whereas in the case of amanita muscaria the muscarin amount is very low and the main content is mucimol now here the symptoms are 
since the muscarin is very low there is no cholinergic symptom rather the symptoms are basically excitatory symptoms mainly the excitatory symptoms are the main symptoms which happens during the amanita muscaria poisoning now coming to the treatment since the symptoms are excitatory the main treatments are one you need to give a symptomatic treat treatment symptomatic treatments supportive treatments you need to give regarding the drugs the main treatments are since it is an excitatory symptoms you need to bring it down you need to calm it down therefore the treatments are mainly benzodiazepines like midazolam or uh, you can give barbiturates to bring down the excitation you can give this kind of uh, uh, benzodiazepine or barbiturates like thiopendone so these are the very commonly used drugs in the case of amanita muscaria poisoning benzodiazepines and barbiturates here the symptoms are excitatory so to bring it down you need to give a uh, benzodiazepines or barbiturates here also you can remember this mnemonic to increase the muscle to increase the muscle you can uh, drink boost or bond vita where the first b stands for benzodiazepines the second b stands for barbiturates barbiturates m stands for the muscaria species so in the case of muscaria species uh, the drugs are b boost and bond vita you can remember that is benzodiazepine and barbiturates now coming to the so here we have covered the early mushroom poisoning drugs that is boletus clitocybe inocybe and muscaria amanita muscaria species now coming to the delayed mushroom poisoning the main species i told is amanita phalloides okay now now coming to that amanita phalloides which causes a delayed which is, is an example for uh, delayed mushroom poisoning amanita phalloides so let's understand a few fact about uh, amanita phalloides species so this is considered to be one of the most toxic mushroom most toxic mushroom or the most one of the most uh, poisonous mushroom so amanita phalloides is considered to be one of the most toxic as well as one of the most poisonous mushroom they are in fact called as a death cap they are also called as death cap mushroom the other name of amanita phalloides species is death cap mushroom now here the main content in the case of amanita phalloides species the main content is amatoxin the content here is amatoxin in fact this amatoxin actually inhibit the liver function the liver function will be inhibited it also inhibit the kidney function so this is a really toxic kind of uh, compound amatoxin that is the main cause for this amanita phalloides mushroom poisoning the amatoxin is the content now coming to the treatment in the case of uh, amanita phalloides mainly the treatment will be symptomatic coming to the drugs although there is no antidote for uh, this mushroom poisoning some of the life saving drugs include you can remember penicillin g then silimarin silimarin is also called as silibinin silimarin is also called as silibinin another one uh, the fourth one is cysteine that is n acetyl cysteine so in the case of a uh, uh, amanita phalloides poisoning you can remember this mnemonic psc psc where p stands for penicillin g s stands for silimarin and c stands for cysti so although there is no specific antidote these are one of the life saving measures uh, apart from the symptomatic treatment the life saving measures include penicillin g silimarin and n acetyl cysteine and in fact um, amanita phalloides is one of the most toxic or the most poisonous mushroom now coming back to the question which of the following drug can be used as a life saving measure in the case of amanita phalloides poisoning i asked you to remember psc where p stands for penicillin g s stands for silimarin 
and uh, C stand, stands for N stays 16. The, so the correct answer would be definitely E choice, both C and D. Question is, which of the following drug is a reversible, reversible inhibitor of MAVO A enzyme? A choice, mac maclobimide. B choice, chlorgelin. C choice, phenylacin. D choice, silicilin. And E choice, safinamide. So before coming to the answer, let's understand about uh, monoamine oxidase, which is abbreviated as MAVO. Monoamine oxidase. This monoamine oxidase is basically a mitochondrial enzyme. It's a mitochondrial enzyme and the full name is monoamine oxidase and now the main function of MAVO or monoamine oxidase is in the metabolism they, the ma major function is they help in the metabolism of monoamines monoamine compounds they helps in the metabolism of monoamine compounds now which are those monoamine compounds one is adrenaline one is noradrenaline the third one is 5-hydroxytryptamine 5-hydroxytryptamine is also called as serotonin also it helps in the metabolism of dopamine it also helps in the metabolism of phenyl ethyl amine so these are some of the important substrates or the important compounds which is metabolized by this monoamine oxidase enzyme MAVO enzyme okay now mainly MAVO monoamine oxidase are of two types one is monoamine oxidase A the second one is monoamine oxidase B these are the two isoforms of monoamine oxidase enzyme now MAVO A MAVO A is mainly seen in GIT placenta as well as in the liver Whereas monoamine oxidase B, MAVO B, is mainly seen in the brain, platelets, as well as liver. You can remember this mnemonic GPL. GPL. Whereas here you can remember BPL. So monoamine oxidase A and monoamine oxidase B, these are the different uh, organs where uh, these enzymes are seen. Now uh, monoamine oxidase A mainly helps in the metabolism of adrenaline, noradrenaline and 5-hydroxytryptamine that is serotonin. So MAVO A mainly metabolizes adrenaline, noradrenaline and this serotonin whereas MAVO B mainly metabolizes dopamine dopamine as well as phenylethylamine is mainly metabolized by MAVO B enzyme okay now coming to the inhibitors since there are mainly two MAVO enzymes we have told it's MAVO A and MAVO B how many inhibitors would be there yes there will be three MAVO inhibitors three MAVO inhibitors would be there which are they one would be MAVO A plus MAVO B inhibitor. MAVO A plus MAVO B inhibitor. The second one would be MAVO A inhibitor. Third one will be MAVO B inhibitor. So these are the different three types of MAVO inhibitors. MAVO A plus MAVO B inhibitor. MAVO A inhibitor as well as MAVO B inhibitor. Now coming to the first one that is MAVO A inhibitor plus MAVO B inhibitor now since it, um, uh, it's a, it is a non-selectively inhibits both these enzymes they are also called as non-selective MAVO inhibitors they are non-selective MAVO inhibitors now which are the drugs coming under this category you can uh, remember this tip remember this mnemonic no tip no means non-selective non-selective so which are the non-selective inhibitor you can remember this uh, mnemonic tip tip so t stands for trenyl cypromine 
ट्रेनाइल साइप्रोमिन आई स्टैंड्स फॉर आइसो कार्बोक्सिसिड आइसो कार्बोक्सिसिड एंड पी स्टैंड्स फॉर फेनेलेसिड सो दिस आर द वेरी थ्री मेली थ्री दिस थ्री आर द मेन नॉन सेलेक्टिव मावो इनहिबिटर्स and they are basically these all these uh, uh, all these inhibitors uh, they are basically irreversible inhibitors they are irreversible mavo inhibitors they are irreversible mavo inhibitors so you can remember this uh, tip uh, this mnemonic no tip okay tranyl cypromin isocarboxacid and phenylacin so they are non selective mavo inhibitor now coming to the second category that is uh, mavo a inhibitor it is also called as selective mavo a inhibitor it's also called as selective mavo a inhibitor and you can remember this mnemonic a uh, monoamine oxidase for a, a amc annual maintenance charge amc a stands for mavo a inhibitor and uh, mc m stands for meclobimide meclobimide and um, c stands for chlorgelin so these are the two important drugs which are uh, selective mavo a inhibitor and the most important one is meclobimide and meclobimide is a reversible mavo a inhibitor it is also called as reversible inhibitor of mavo a mavo a rima reversible inhibitor of monoamine ox mono mavo a so it is also called as um, rima meclobimide okay whereas chlorgelin is an irreversible inhibitor irreversible inhibitor okay reversible in yeah, actually it is not used in the market it is not in the clinics actually just try um, learn this example chlorgelin belongs to mavo a inhibitor category so this is all about um, mavo a inhibitor and the main use of mavo a inhibitor they are mainly used in the treatment of depression the main use of uh, mavo a inhibitors are uh, they can be used in the treatment of depression now coming to the third one it is mavo b inhibitor it is also called as selective mavo b inhibitor they are selective mavo b inhibitor and you can remember this mnemonic the drugs belonging to this category b stands for bjp bjp is associated with rss rss so b bjp b stands for the mavo b inhibitor mavo b inhibitor r stands for r stands for rasagilin S stands for seligilin and the second S stands for safinamide safinamide so these three drugs are the main uh, drugs belonging to uh, mavo b inhibitor category out of this rasagilin and seligilin are irreversible mavo b inhibitor are irreversible mavo b inhibitor whereas safinamide is a reversible mavo b inhibitor okay you can remember this mnemonic rss okay so now coming uh, now one more point you need to remember mavo b inhibitor they are mainly used in the treatment of parkinsonism whereas mavo a inhibitor was mainly used in the treatment of depression whereas mavo b inhibitors the main use is in the treatment of parkinsonism now coming back to the question here the question is uh, which of the following is a mavo a inhibitor and it should be reversible the answer i told you is that uh, remember amc a stands for mavo a inhibitor m means meclobimide and c for chlorgelin whereas meclobimide is the reversible one and chlorgelin is the irreversible one so here the question is a reversible inhibitor so the correct answer would be a choice meclobimide whereas chlorgelin is an irreversible inhibitor phenylacin is a non selective inhibitor seligilin is a mavo b inhibitor safinamide is also a mavo b inhibitor okay this question is which of the following 
adrenergic receptor is acted upon by noradrenaline a choice alpha 1 b choice alpha 2 c choice beta 1 d choice beta 2 and e choice all of the above except d choice so mainly you need to know which all the which are the important adrenergic receptors so adrenergic receptors are mainly alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 and beta 2 beta 3 is also there and the most important one is alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 and beta 2 and you need to know uh, the action on these receptors by four major compounds one is adrenaline the second one is noradrenaline the third one is uh, dopamine and the fourth one is isoprenaline so adrenaline acts on all these receptors that is alpha adrenaline acts on alpha 1 it acts on alpha 2 it acts on beta 1 it acts on beta 2 that means adrenaline acts on all these four receptors whereas noradrenaline acts on alpha 1 it acts on alpha 2 plus it acts on beta 1 it does not acts on act on uh, beta 2 the main action is on alpha 1 alpha 2 and beta 1 now coming to dopamine the main receptor of uh, dopamine is uh, one is dopamine receptor d1 receptor plus it acts on alpha 1 receptor plus it acts on beta 1 receptor whereas isoprenaline the main action is on beta receptors that is beta 1 receptor and beta 2 receptors okay now coming back to the question which receptor adrenal receptor is acted upon by noradrenaline the answer is alpha 1 alpha 2 and beta 1 this is the correct answer is e choice all of the above except d that is beta 2 uh, noradrenaline does not have any action mainly alpha 1 alpha 2 and beta 1 so the correct answer is e choice this question is which of the following heterocyclic ring contains four nitrogen atoms a choice purine b choice tyridine c choice tetrazole d choice all of the above and e choice none of the above so let's uh, look at each choice the first choice is purine so purine is actually the combination of two rings so this particular uh, six membered ring is called as uh, pyrimidine now this pyrimidine combines with a five membered ring called as imidazole so this uh, five membered ring is called as imidazole so pyrimidine and uh, imidazole combines to form combines to form purine so this is the structure of purine now purine contains how many nitrogen atom yes it contains four nitrogen atoms now coming to the second choice that is pyridine so pyridine also contains this pyrimidine structure which is nothing but a six membered ring with a two nitrogen atom at the alternative position so this pyrimidine is there in the case of pteridine also so we are going gonna try the structure of pteridine so pteridine contains this pyrimidine structure along and it is fused with the pyrazine structure so pyrazine is a six membered ring with two nitrogen atom at the first position and the fourth position so this is the structure of uh, 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 pteridine so pteridine is a fusion of pyrimidine plus pyrazine so pyrimidine and pyrazine combines to form pteridine now pteridine contains how many nitrogen atom 1 2 3 and 4 so this also contains four nitrogen atom now coming to the last choice that is tetrazole as the name indicates tetrazole so tetrazole uh, is actually a five membered ring so this is the structure of tetrazole it's a five membered ring containing four nitrogen atom Uh, in this particular fashion so 1 2 3 4 and the number of nitrogen atom is 4 so this is the particular this is the structure of tetrazole 
so the correct answer for the question all of this purine pteridine and tetrasol contains four nitrogen atoms so the correct answer would be d choice all of the above question is which of the following is called as the date rape drug a choice ghp b choice flu nitrosipam c choice gbl d choice ketamine e choice all of the above so before coming to the correct answer let's understand what is a date rape date rape drug so they are nothing but they are drugs used to they are drugs used to assist in doing the sexual assaults so they are drugs used to assist in doing sexual assaults they are called as the date rape drug now which are the most common date rape drug there are mainly three commonly coming date rape drugs the first one is called as the gbl sorry ghb there is the gamma hydroxy butyrate ghp is the abbreviated form of gamma hydroxy butyrate so this is one of the very commonly used date rape drug the second one is flu nitrosipa flu nitrosipa it's a benzodiazepine drug drug belonging to the benzodiazepine category the trait name is rohypnol so flu nitrosipam is a commonly used date rape drug the third one the third one is actually uh, called as ketamine which is used as a dissociative anesthetic in the clinic dissociative anesthetic it is used as a dissociative anesthetic in the clinic so these are the three uh, commonly misused drugs in the case of uh, and called as the date rape drug let's come to the first one that is the ghp called as the gamma hydroxy butyrate it's uh, also called as the st uh, the trait name uh, or the street name for this particular ghp they are they are called as liquid g they are called as liquid g it is also known under the street name liquid ecstasy coming to flu nitrosipine as i already told it's a benzodiazepine category of drugs coming under the hypnotic category sedative hypnotic category the street name for flu nitrosipine is rufis it's known under the name rufis whereas ketamine is uh, known with the name special k special k so the street name of ketamine is uh, special k now why these three drugs are very commonly coming under the um, date rape drugs is mainly due to their physical characteristic mainly they don't have any special color they don't have any special order they also don't have any special taste now due to these three properties it's very easy to add this thing uh, these drugs to the it can be easily added to the drinks it can be easily added to the drinks so that the victim will not come to know whether it has been added to the drinks or not so that's why that's make these properties makes it uh, uh, easy for these drug to make as a date rape drug the no color no odor no taste now what is the effect of these drug let's come to the effect of these drug effects of these drug so this uh, while you take this drug it can result in the loss of consciousness it can result in hallucination it can result in the loss of memory that is amnesia it can result in drowsiness also now due to this uh, due to this loss of consciousness hallucination amnesia uh, drowsiness the victims the person who has uh, taken this or the victims will be physically helpless they will be unable uh, they will be unable to refuse the sexual uh, assault unable to refuse sexual assault the victim will be unable to is uh, the victim is unable to remember what has happened the memory 
or it, amnesia might have happened so it, it will be or she will be unable to remember what has happened and um, that's we that makes the uh, is come these three drugs coming under the day rape categories and when you are uh, adding uh, these three drugs along with the alcohol all these effects will be boosted up so when you are adding with alcohol if you are mixing it with alcohol all these effects will be aggravated will be increased okay now we, uh, which are uh, uh, these are the three commonly coming uh, day rape drugs they are also called as club drugs they are also called as club drugs the other name of date rape date rape drugs are club drugs and just to summarize we have already told uh, gamma hydroxy butyrate then flu nitrosepam flu nitrosepam then ketamine these are the three common date rape drugs apart from this zolpidem which is a uh, newer ben non benzodiazepine drug solpidem can also be misused uh, as a date rape drug another example is uh, mdma mdma is methylene dioxymethyl amphetamine mdma can also be used as a club drug another example is uh, lsd lysergic acid dithylamide another example is uh, gbl gbl which we have already uh, which we have come in the ch uh, choice gbl so gbl is uh, nothing but uh, uh, gam butyrolactone gbl is nothing but uh, gamma butyrolactone so gbl is also coming under the category uh, club drugs cocaine also comes under the club drug category marijuana cannabis can also comes and is also coming under the club drug category alcohol itself is a club drug or a date rape drug actually. so among this the most commonly misused drug as a date rape drug are the gamma hydroxy butyrate flu nitrosepam ketamine these are other drugs which are also coming under the date rape ca drug category or the club drug category now coming back to the question uh, which of the following is a date rape drug category so gamma hydroxy butyrate is a date rape drug flu nitrosepam or rohypnol is a date rape drug gamma butyrolactone is a date rape drug ketamine is also a date rape so the correct answer for this question is e choice all of the above so hope you understood this question this question is which of the following part of nephron is the site of action of thiazide diuretics a choice pct b choice descending lh c choice ascending lh d choice dct and e choice collecting duct so before coming to the correct answer let's understand a few points about diuretics so diuretics are basically they are drugs which uh, increases the volume of urine formation so they are drugs which increases the volume of urine formation there are also drugs which increases the rate of urine formation there are also drugs which increases the loss of sodium as well as water in the urine so this is the important point of diuretic they increases the volume of urine formation they increases the rate of urine formation they increases the loss of sodium and water in the urine and mainly used in the treatment of edema pulmonary hypertension now uh, diuretics are drugs which acts on the kidney to increases the urine formation so in the part of the kidney where diuretics act is called as nephron so as you all know nephrons have nephron rough diagram of nephron will look like this so this area is called as the bowman's capsule glomerulus is here this is called as the bowman's capsule this horizontal part is called as pct or proximal convoluted tubule this u shaped region is called as loop of henle lh or loop of henle this in the loop of henle this downward portion this is called as the descending loop of henle descending loop of henle whereas this uh, 
this part he is called as or the thick part in the loop of henle is called as the ascending loop of henle now this horizontal portion is called as the distal convoluted tubule and this bottom this portion is called as the collecting duct so the filtration will happen through these uh, tubules and the urine urine will be coming out through this okay now so this is the rough diagram of nephro now the diuretics uh, which acts on this nephron has specific site of action now mainly the important diuretics are number one the weak diuretics like uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor it's a weak diuretic Ex one of the main example is acetazolamide so carbonic anhydrase inhibitor like drugs like acetazolamide mainly act on the proximal convoluted tubule now coming to the second important diuretic that is also a weak diuretic called as the osmotic diuretic osmotic diuretic one of the main example is mannitol glycerol etc so osmotic diuretics mainly act on the proximal convoluted tubule plus this descending part of the loop of henle that is descending loop of henle the main site of action of osmotic diuretics are the descending loop of henle along with the proximal convoluted tubule now coming to the third important diuretic that is the loop diuretics loop diuretic is also called as high ceiling diuretic or it is also called as high efficacy diuretic the main example is frusimide kind of drug so they are strong diuretics they are uh, high efficacy diuretic and the site of action and the site of action is this this thick part of loop of henle where the maximum reabsorption happen so the site of action of loop diuretic is descending sorry ascending loop of henle ascending loop of henle where descending loop of henle is the site of action of osmotic diuretics where ascending loop of henle is the site of action of loop diuretics now coming to the fourth important diuretic that is uh, the medium efficacy diuretics called as the thiazide diuretics one of the main example is hydrochlorothiazide hydrochlorothiazide so hydrochlorothiazide acts on this part called as the distal convoluted tubule so the main site of action of thiazide diuretic is distal convoluted tubule in fact the thiazide diuretic mainly act on the early part of distal convoluted tubule so the site of action of thiazide diuretic is early distal convoluted tubule now coming to the last important diuretic that is the potassium sparing diuretics potassium sparing diuretics examples are spironolactone main examples is spironolactone then amidoride is there triamterin is there triamterin so the site of action of uh, potassium sparing diuretic is the the late part of distal convoluted tubule this part the late part of distal convoluted tubule along with the collecting duct so the site of action of potassium sparing diuretic is the late distal convoluted tubule plus the collecting duct okay now coming back to the question Uh, the which of the following part of nephron is the site of action of thiazide diuretic we have told that the early distal convol dis early distal convoluted tubule so the correct answer is d choice distal convoluted tubule proximal convoluted tubule the main uh, the drugs which act on the pct uh, is mainly the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor uh, descending loop of henle is the main site of action of osmotic diuretics ascending loop of henle is the main site of action of loop diuretics collecting duct is one of the main site of action of a potassium sparing diuretic question is from the anatomy physiology section and the question is blepharitis is the inflammation of a choice bone marrow b choice bile duct c choice urinary bladder d choice glans penis e choice eyelid so before coming to the correct answer let's have a detailed discussion on the inflammation uh, of various organs and the terminology is used for um, such inflammations so coming to the first one the inflammation of uh, brain is called as encephalitis 
So encephalitis means inflammation of brain. Now what is the inflammation of spinal cord spinal cord called as it is myelitis. So inflammation of spinal cord is called as myelitis uh, whereas inflammation of brain is called as encephalomyelitis. Now what is the inflammation of both this brain and spinal cord? Yes, it is encephalomyelitis. Encephalomyelitis is the inflammation of both brain and spinal cord. Now coming to the fourth one, inflammation of meninges is called as meningitis. Now coming to the inflammation of nerve, it is neuritis. Inflammation of bone is called as osteitis. Inflammation of joint is called as arthritis. So inflammation of bone is called as osteitis and inflammation of joint is called as arthritis. Now what is the inflammation of both bone and joint? Yes, it is osteoarthritis. Now coming to the next inflammation. Inflammation of bone marrow is called as osteomyelitis. Inflammation of bone marrow is called as osteomyelitis. Inflammation of tendon is called as tendonitis. Inflammation of vertebrae is called as spondylitis. Inflammation of hip joint is called as coxitis. So coxitis is the inflammation of hip joint. Inflammation of eye is called as ophthalmitis. Whereas the inflammation of eyelids are called as blepharitis. Inflammation of cornea is called as keratitis. Whereas the inflammation of uvea is called as uveitis. Now coming to the next uh, inflammation, inflammation of uh, retina is called as retinitis. Whereas the inflammation of conjunctiva is called as conjunctivitis. Now coming to the inflammation of lacrimal gland, the gland which produces the tears, the inflammation of lacrimal gland is called as dacryoadenitis. Dacryoadenitis. So dacryoadenitis is the inflammation of lacrimal gland. You can remember this uh, letter cry. cry. When you cry, tears will come from the lacrimal gland. So the inflammation of lacrimal gland is called as dacryoadenitis. Now coming to the inflammation of adipose tissue is called as steatitis. Inflammation of adipose tissue is called as steatitis. Whereas inflammation of dermis and uh, epidermis is called as uh, dermatitis. Now coming to the inflammation of subcutaneous tissue is called as cellulitis. Cellulitis is the inflammation of subcutaneous tissue. Now coming to the inflammation of mouth and oral cavity, both are called as stomatitis. Remember, stomatitis is not the inflammation of stomach. Inflammation of stomach is called as gastritis, whereas the inflammation of mouth and uh, oral cavity is called as stomatitis. Now coming to the next inflammation, inflammation of uh, teeth is called as odontitis. Odontitis. Inflammation of gum is called as gingivitis. Inflammation of uh, lips are called as chilitis. So chilitis is the inflammation of lips whereas uh, inflammation of tongue is called as glossitis. So glossitis is the inflammation of tongue, whereas uh, inflammation of pharynx is called as pharyngitis. Now inflammation of tonsil is called as tonsillitis. Inflammation of intestine is called as enteritis. 
inflammation of colon is called as colitis. Now coming to the inflammation of rectum is called as proctitis. Proctitis is the inflammation of rectum and the inflammation of anus is called as anitis. Now liver, inflammation of liver is hepatitis. Whereas uh, inflammation of gallbladder is called as cholecystitis. Now coming to the inflammation of bile duct is called as cholangitis. So cholecystitis is the inflammation of gallbladder and cholangitis is the inflammation of bile duct. Coming to the inflammation of pancreas, yes pancreatitis. Now inflammation of kidney is nephritis. Whereas inflammation of pelvis is called as pilitis. So inflammation of kidney is called as nephritis and inflammation of uh, pelvis is called as uh, pilitis. Now coming to the next inflammation, if the inflammation of uh, kidney and pelvis happens together it is called as uh, pilonephritis. We have already told inflammation of pelvis is called as pilitis and inflammation of kidney is called as uh, nephritis. So inflammation of kidney and pelvis is, to, it is together called as pilonephritis. Now coming to the inflammation of uh, urinary bladder it is cystitis. Inflammation of uh, gallbladder was called as cholecystitis whereas inflammation of urinary bladder is called as cystitis. Now inflammation of ureter, ureteritis. Urethra, it is urethritis. Now, the inflammation of nose and the nasal cavity is rhinitis. Inflammation of sinus, sinusitis. Inflammation of larynx, laryngitis. Inflammation of bronchus, bronchitis. Now coming to the next inflammation. Inflammation of uterus is called as metritis. Metritis is the inflammation of uterus. Now if the inflammation happens in the inner lining of uterus or in the endometrium, it is endometritis. It is called as endometritis. Inflammation of vagina is called as vaginitis. Now coming to the inflammation of mammary gland, it is called as mastitis. Whereas the inflammation of uh, nipples, they are called as thylitis. So thylitis is the inflammation of nipples. Now coming to the inflammation of uh, testic, testis, it is called as orchitis. Whereas the inflammation of gland penis is called as balanitis. So balanitis is the inflammation of gland penis, orchitis is the inflammation of testis, thylitis is the inflammation of nipples. Now myocardium, yes it is myocarditis. Now coming to the inflammation of vein, it is inflammation of vein is called as phlebitis. Phlebitis is the inflammation of vein, whereas inflammation of artery is arteritis. Now the coming to the inflammation of umbilical cord, it is called as omphalitis. Inflammation of umbilical cord is called as omphalitis. So we have told that inflammation of vein is called as phlebitis and inflammation of umbilical cord is called as omphalitis. Therefore, inflammation of umbilical vein is called as omphalophlebitis. Omphalophlebitis. Whereas the inflammation of umbilical artery is called as omphaloarthritis.
So these are the, some of the very important uh, uh, inflammations and the terminologies used for the inflammation of various organs and tissues. Now coming back to your question, blepharitis is the inflammation of uh, each choice eyelid. So inflammation of eyelid is called as uh, blepharitis. So the correct answer is E choice. This question is related to chemistry and the question is which of the following is a dicarboxylic acid containing compound? A choice succinic acid, B choice malic acid, C choice malic acid, D choice malonic acid and E choice all of the above. So let's uh, uh, come to the first choice. So first of all, what is a dicarboxylic acid compound? What is the meaning of dicarboxylic acid containing compound? As the name indicates, there will be two carboxylic acids. So this is the carboxylic acid functional group. This is the COH. RCOH is the carboxylic acid functional group. So there will be two carboxylic acids in that com compound. That is called as a dicarboxylic acid compound. Now coming to the first choice, that is succinic acid. The succinic acid is basically a dicarboxylic acid compound. And the structure look like so this is the structure of uh, succinic acid there are two carboxylic acids CO, uh, COH CH2 CH2 COH okay so there are two carboxylic acid separated by two carbon atoms this structure is called as succinic acid now in this succinic acid uh, so this is the fu uh, functional group COH so this carbon is actually the alpha carbon alpha carbon okay so if you attach a hydroxy group if you attach a hydroxy group to that alpha carbon atom this particular carbon atom the structure would become like this okay so we just attach the OH group to this alpha carbon CH CH2 group so it became CH and this is the OH group so the structure would become like this and the name of this compound is called as malic acid this is malic acid malic acid so malic acid uh, is the hydrated or you can tell that it is alpha hydroxy i have attached a hydroxy group so it is alpha hydroxy succinic acid okay so this is also a dicarboxylic acid because you can see a coh group here coh group here so malic acid is also a dicarbox uh, two, two carboxylic acid containing compound that is dicarboxylic acid now malic acid is also the ionized form of malic acid is called as malate this you might have studied it in the biochemistry that is the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle or the TCA cycle tricarboxylic acid cycle Krebs cycle malate is one of the intermediate in the Krebs cycle okay so malate is ionized form uh, and the parent compound is called as malic acid so both succinic acid and uh, malic acid is uh, is it a dicarboxylic acid compound dicarboxylic acid containing compound now in this malic acid if i remove this oh from this carbon and one hydrogen atom from this carbon th that this would become so if i remove one oh and hydrogen that will be removed as a water molecule the structure would look like this there will be a formation of double bond between those carbons and it would become like this so I have just removed OH and hydrogen from here and this, uh, it is removed as a water molecule. The compound will, would become like this and this compound is, uh, is also a dicarboxylic acid compound and this is called as malic acid or fumaric acid. Malic acid or fumaric acid. So this could be either malic acid or fumaric acid. Now what is the difference I will let you know now. So this is the uh, structure of uh, either malic acid or uh, fumaric acid. There is a double bond between these two carbons. Whereas in succinic acid, there is no double bond. It is a saturated compound. The unsaturated form is called as the malic acid or fumaric acid. Now let's move to the difference actually. So once again, I'm drawing the structure of uh, that uh, unsaturated dicarboxylic acid. So as I told you, this could be either malic acid, don't confuse with the malic acid the spelling is malik m-a-l-e-i-c whereas in the case of uh, uh, this uh, this structure this was malic acid m-a-l-i-c m-a-l-i-c okay now uh, let's understand about this malic acid or it can also be called as fumaric acid now what is the difference now if the same groups 
like uh, the same groups that is the carboxylic acid is on the same side of the double bond now if you look at this structure the same groups like carboxylic group is on the same side of the double bond and hydrogen is on the same side of the compound so this is a cis compound and cis compound is called as malic acid whereas in this compound if this uh, same groups are on opposite side for example carboxyl groups are on, on the opposite side and hydrogen is also on the opposite side now if you look at this compound coh are not on the same side they are on the opposite side and hydrogen is also on the opposite side so this is a trans compound now the trans form of this compound is called as fumaric acid so this is the difference between malic acid and fumaric acid malic acid is the cis form whereas fumaric acid is the trans form and both are dicarboxylic acid containing compound there are two carboxylic acids now coming to the next uh, uh, other dicarboxylic acid containing compound so um, apart from this thing you take this example tartaric acid tartaric acid is also a dicarboxylic acid containing compound the structure of tartaric acid is like this So this is also a dicarboxylic acid com uh, containing compound. Two COH is there. So this is called as tartaric acid. So apart from uh, succinic acid, we have studied about succinic acid. We have talked about malic acid. We have talked about malic acid. We have talked about uh, fumaric acid. Apart from this, tartaric acid is also a dicarboxylic acid compound. Now a few more compounds which contains uh, carbox dicarboxylic acid. Let's start with the other ex other, other examples. So COH COH. So this is called as oxalic acid. So this is also a dicarboxylic acid containing compounds. Two COH is there. Now in this oxalic acid, so this structure is oxalic acid. Now if I introduce one carbon atom between these two carboxylic acid this is called as malonic acid malonic acid so if i introduce one carbon between these two carboxylic acid it will become malonic acid now between the coh if i introduce two carbon atom if i introduce two carbon atom which we have already discussed this is called as yes we have already discussed this is succinic acid so it is also a dicarboxylic acid containing compound. Now if I, in between this uh, uh, carboxylic acid, if I introduce three carbon atoms, this is called as glutaric acid. So this is also a dicarboxylic acid containing compound. The difference is that between this carboxyl group, there are three carbon atoms. Now between this uh, COH, If I introduce four carbon atoms, so between this carboxyl group, if I introduce four carbon atoms, there is COH, CH2, 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 four carbon atoms. This is called as adipic acid. Now, if I between this carbon atom, if I introduce five carbon atoms, five carbon atom. So I'm just writing it five times, CH2 five times. Here it was four times. Here it is five times. This is called as Pimelic acid. Pimelic acid. So basically, oxalic acid, malonic acid, succinic acid, glutaric acid, adipic acid, pimelic acid, they are all dicarboxylic acid. You can remember this mnemonic OMS GAP. Oxalic acid, malonic acid, succinic acid, glutaric acid, adipic acid, pimelic acid, they are all dicarboxylic acid. Apart from this, Tartaric acid is also a dicarboxylic acid compo containing compound. Apart from this, uh, uh, malic acid, malic acid, fumaric acid, they are all dicarboxylic acid containing compounds. So these are a few examples for compounds containing two carboxylic acid, that is dicarboxylic acid compound. Now let's come to the choice. Uh, Christian, uh, the succinic acid we have already discussed is a dicarboxylic acid containing compound. Malic acid is a dicarboxylic acid containing compound. Malic acid is a dicarboxylic acid containing compound. Malonic acid is a dicarboxylic acid containing compound. So the correct answer for this question would be E choice, all of the above. So the question is, what is the oxidation state of chlorine in chloric acid? A choice, minus 1. B choice, plus 1. C choice, plus 3. 
d choice plus 5 and e choice plus 7. So first you know, need to know what do you mean by chloric acid. Then once you know the molecular formula, it's easy to find out the oxidation state. So let's um, understand uh, uh, about the chloric acid. First of all, the acid what you know is HCl. The common acid what you know is HCl. And what is the name of that? Yes, hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid. HCl is hydrochloric acid. Now, in this HCl, if I add one more oxygen, it would become HClO. Now, what is the name of HClO? Yes, it is hypochlorous acid. Hypochlorous acid. Now, in this uh, formula, molecular formula, if I add one more oxygen atom, HClO will become HClO2. And what is the name of this compound? Yes, it is chlorous acid. So, HClO2 is called as the chlorous acid. Now, if I add one more oxygen atom, it would become HClO3. And the name of this, is, this compound is chloric acid. So, this is, the, this is the question what they have asked. The oxidation state of chlorine in chloric acid. We will come to that. Now, if I add one more oxygen atom, HC, it will become HClO4. What is the name of this compound? Yes, it is perchloric acid. So these four compounds, you need to know hypochlorous acid, chlorous acid, chloric acid, perchloric acid. Okay. So if you know this molecular formula, it's easy to find out the oxidation state. So let's start uh, start with the HCl itself. So you know that uh, in uh, for any compound, if you add the oxidation state of the each of the atom, it should become zero. Now in the case of HCl, you know that hydrogen oxidation state is one, that is plus one. And uh, oxidation state of chlorine, let us take it as x, and the sum of this oxidation state should be 0. So 1 plus x is equal to 0, so x is equal to minus 1. That means in the, the in this in the hydrochloric acid, in the case of hydrochloric acid, the oxidation state of chlorine is minus 1. Now let's take the next example that is HClO. Name of name of this compound is hypochlorous acid. Hypochlorous acid. So oxidation state of hydrogen is so one. Let us take the oxidation state of chlorine as x and uh, sorry uh, chlorine is x and oxidation state of oxygen is minus two. So the sum of the oxidation state should be zero. Therefore, one plus x minus two is equal to zero. That means x minus one is equal to zero. That means x is equal to plus one. That means, in the case of hypochlorous acid, the oxidation state of chlorine is plus 1. Now, let us take the uh, example of uh, uh, HClO2. HClO2 is chlorous acid. Chlorous acid. So, let us start. Uh, oxidation state of hydrogen is plus 1. Let us take the oxidation state of chlorine as X. And oxygen is uh, minus 2. However, 2 atoms are there. So, minus 2 into 2. And the sum of this uh, is should be 0. That means 1 plus x minus 4 is equal to 0. That means x minus 3 is equal to 0. That means x is equal to plus 3. That means in uh, chlorous acid, the oxidation state of chlorine is plus 3. Plus 3. Now let us take the next example chloric acid that is HClO3, HClO3 is chloric acid. So hydrogen is plus 1, chlorine let us take X and oxygen atom it is minus 2. However, 3 atoms are there so minus 2 into 3 and the sum should be 0. That means 1 plus X minus 6 is equal to 0. That means X minus 5 is equal to 0. That means x is equal to plus 5. That means in chloric acid, the oxidation state of chlorine atom is plus 5. Now, let us take the last example that is perchloric acid. Perchloric acid is HClO4 perchloric acid. So, hydrogen the oxidation state is 1, chlorine is x and uh, oxygen is minus 2. However, 4 atom is there. So, minus 2 into 4, the sum should be 0. That means 1 plus x minus 8 is equal to 0. That means x minus 7 is equal to 0. That means x is equal to plus 7. That means in perchloric acid, the oxidation state of chlorine is plus 7. 
okay whereas the oxidation state of uh, chlorine in chloric acid is plus 5 in chlorous acid is plus 3 in hypochlorous acid is plus 1 whereas hydrochloric acid is minus 1 now coming back to this question oxidation state of chlorine in chloric acid we have already discussed this is chloric acid so the correct answer will be definitely d choice plus 5 so the question is from biochemistry and the question is which of the following pathway involves the production of glucose from pyruvate a choice glycogenolysis b choice gluconeogenesis c choice glycogenesis d choice glycolysis and e choice tca cycle so two terminologies you need to know one is genesis what is genesis and what is lysis so genesis means the synthesis or formation of a compound synthesis or formation of a particular compound is called as genesis whereas lysis is nothing but the breakdown the breakdown of a particular compound to a different compound is called as lysis now let's look into each of this choice so the term here the term lysis is there glycogenolysis the breakdown lysis means breakdown and the breakdown of glycogen so glycogenolysis means breakdown of glycogen now glycogen will be uh, broken down to glucose so this process is called as glycogenolysis now where does this process happens it happens in the cytosol or cytoplasm now mainly the cytoplasm of liver and skeletal muscles are the sites for or the location for glycogenolysis so it, it is the conversion of glycogen to glucose or the breakdown of glycogen to glucose is called as glycogenolysis now coming to the second choice gluconeogenesis gluco means glucose genesis means synthesis so it is nothing but synthesis sorry it is nothing but the synthesis of glucose synthesis of glucose now from where it from a non carbohydrate compound from a non carbohydrate compound if glucose is synthesized from a non carbohydrate compound if glucose is synthesized that process is called as gluconeogenesis you can remember this n n indicates non carbohydrate compound non carbohydrate compound now normally glucose could be synthesized from glycogen however glycogen is a carbohydrate compound whenever you take a carbohydrate food that will also be converted to glucose that food stuff is a, basically a carbohydrate con compound now whenever glucose is synthesized from a non carbohydrate compound that process is called as gluconeogenesis now which are those non carbohydrate compound from which glucose is synthesized one of the main non carbohydrate compound is pyruvate so that means pyruvate will be converted to glucose that process could be called as gluconeogenesis also lactate is a non carbohydrate compound from which glucose will be synthesized so that is also that conversion of that conversion of lactate to glucose is also gluconeogenesis another non carbohydrate compound is propionate that means propionate also could be converted to glucose another non carbohydrate compound is glycerol glycerol could be converted to glucose another non carbohydrate compound from which glucose is synthesized is basically amino acids especially glucogenic amino acid glucogenic amino acids that means all this pyruvate lact or lactate or propionate or glycerol or glucogenic amino acid could be converted to glucose and all these compounds are basically non carbohydrate compound therefore the process is called as gluconeogenesis now where does this process happen yes it is cytoplasm only cytosol and mainly it happens in the cytoplasm of liver and kidney so this question also could be asked so gluconeogenesis happens in the cytoplasm of liver as well as kidney and it is nothing but the synthesis of glucose from a non carbohydrate compound like either pyruvate or lactate or propionate or glycerol or glucogenic amino acids now coming to the third choice yes again glycogenesis genesis means synthesis and glyco means glycogen that means glycogen will be synthesized from a particular compound and what is that compound yes it is nothing but glucose 
that means the conversion of glucose to glycogen or the synthesis of glycogen from glucose is called as glycogenesis now where does this process happen yes it is cytosol or cytoplasm mainly so the cytoplasm of liver and the skeletal muscles are the location skeletal muscles are the location for the uh, for the glycogenesis process that is synthesis of glycogen from glucose now coming to the fourth choice that is glycolysis so uh, glycolysis is nothing but lysis means breakdown and it is the breakdown of glucose it is the breakdown of glucose either to pyruvate or lactate so the conversion of glucose to pyruvate or lactate is called as uh, glycolysis and in fact if glucose is converted to pyruvate that is called as aerobic glycolysis aerobic glycolysis whereas if glucose is converted to lactate it is called as anaerobic glycolysis now where does this process happens yes it is in the cytosol cytoplasm of all cells so this question also could come the location or the site of location of glycolysis is cytosol of all cells and it is nothing but the conversion of glucose either to pyruvate or lactate now coming to the last choice that is uh, tca cycle so tca cycle is also called as krebs cycle it is also called as citric acid cycle because citric acid uh, uh, is one of the intermediate in the tca cycle or krebs cycle and the process is the conversion of in tca cycle acetyl coa will be converted to will be oxidized to carbon dioxide and water with the production of energy that is atp so this is called as the conversion of acetyl coa or the oxidation of acetyl coa to carbon dioxide and water with the release of energy is called as a tca cycle and in fact it is the final common oxidative pathway of all the food stuff final common oxidative pathway it is the final common oxidative pathway of carbohydrates lipids and proteins now where does this happen yes it happens in the not in the cytoplasm it happens in the mitochondria where it happens in the mitochondria whereas all other process what we have discussed happens in the cytoplasm cytosol okay now coming back to our question uh, which of the following pathway involves the production of glucose from pyruvate so pyruvate is a non carbohydrate compound so the conversion of a non carbohydrate compound to glucose we have already told it, it is gluconeogenesis so the correct answer would be definitely b choice gluconeogenesis this question is which of the following drug is not a convulsant a choice bicuquilin b choice triclinin C choice physostigmine D choice pilocarpin E choice drusin so first of all we need to know what is a convulsant so al although convulsants does not have any clinical see they does not have a, they don't have any any clinical significant do not have any clinical significance they are not used clinically that means they don't have any clinical significance then what is it used for so one of the main use of this convulsion is to create the experimental animal models so convulsions are mainly used to create experimental animal models mainly the uh, animal models for seizures so whenever you develop an anti convulsion drug we can test it in this animal model to create that uh, animal model uh, or the to create that animal model we can use that convulsion drug or to induce that animal model we can use this convulsion drug another use uh, which were done earlier it was it was used as a chemical weapon it was used as a chemical weapon so they does not they do not have any clinical significance however they are used to create uh, animal models of seizures they were used as a chemical weapon now coming to the examples for these convulsions 
Coming to the examples, convulsions. You can remember this mnemonic. Try the try the brand. Try the brand Nike. Try the brand Nike pants. Try the brand Nike pants. Try means striking. Striking. There is try. So striking is a convulsion term. The means the pain. The pain. The pain is used as a convulsion. Brand. The B in the brand stands for bicuculin. Bicuculin. Bruising. B for bruising. B for benzodiazepine antagonist drug. Benzodiazepine antagonist drug. And the main example for benzodiazepine antagonist is flumazenin. Flumazenin. So, bicuculin, bruising, flumazenin, they are, they are also used as a convulsions drug actually. Now, Nike stands for nicotamide. Nikitamide, which is a respiratory convul respiratory stimulant also. Nikitamide is also a convulsant. Now P pants in the pants P stands for pentylin tetrazole. Pentylene tetrazole. Abbreviated as PTZ. Pentylene tetrazole is a convulsant which is very commonly used to induce the uh, seizures in the animal models. Now, the other name of uh, PTZ or pendylene tetrazole is, they are also called as leptazole. They are also called as metrazole. So, P stands for pendylene tetrazole. Another uh, drug starting with P, picrotoxin. Picrotoxin also, it is also a convulsant. P stands for pilocarpine at high dose can be used as a convulsant. Pilocarpine. It is a cholinergic drug at high dose can be used as a convulsant. So you can remember this mnemonic, try the brand Nike pants. These are the examples for the convulsions drug. Now coming to the question, which of the following drug is not a convulsant? Yes, bicuculin is a convulsant, striking is a convulsant, pilocarpin is a convulsant, brucin is a convulsant. So however, physostigmine is not a convulsant. So the correct answer is physostigmine. Answer is C choice physostigmine. The question is, which of the following is called as primary sodium phosphate? A choice H3PO4, B choice NaH2PO4, C choice Na2HPO4 and D choice Na3PO4. Now if you look at this answers, we know that H3PO4 is called as the phosphoric acid. H3PO4 is called as phosphoric acid. Now, these other choice B, C and D, they are uh, basically the sodium salt of phosphoric acid. Now, if you look at uh, the structure of uh, phosphoric acid, the molecular formula is H3PO4. Phosphoric acid is also called as orthophosphoric acid or simply phosphoric acid. Now, if you carefully look at the molecular formula of H3PO4, there are mainly three hydrogen atoms and these three hydrogen atoms are replaceable hydrogen atom. That means, uh, from this H3PO4, if I replace one hydrogen atom with one sodium atom, it would become NaH2PO4. So that is a sodium salt of phosphoric acid. Now, in this H3PO4, if I re replace two hydrogen atoms, if I replace two hydrogen atoms with the two sodium atoms, then the structure would become, the molecular formula would become Na2HPO4. Now, in this phosphoric acid, if I replace all these three hydrogen atoms with the three sodium atoms, then the molecular formula will become Na3PO4. So, since three replaceable hydrogen atoms are there, you can synthesize mainly three sodium salts of phosphoric acid mainly three sodium salts of phosphoric acid could be synthesized similarly potassium salt or ammon ammonium salt whatever thing so mainly depends upon the replaceable hydrogen atom okay so these are the sodium salt of phosphoric acid now coming to the name of this compound that is a uh, NaH2PO4 
so sodium is there so you can put sodium how many hydrogen atom is there two hydrogen atom is there so sodium dihydrogen phosphate so the name of this compound is sodium dihydrogen phosphate now if you look at this molecular formula there is how many sodiums are there yes two sodium so you can call it as disodium how many hydrogen atom is there one hydrogen atom so disodium monohydrogen phosphate so na2hpo4 is called as disodium monohydrogen phosphate now let's look at this uh, uh, molecular formula that is na3po4 so it is simply trisodium phosphate or simply sodium phosphate or trisodium phosphate so na3po4 is called as trisodium phosphate now if you uh, if you look at this molecular formula that is the first one na h2po4 how many sodium atoms are there yes there is one sodium atom so it is called as it is also called as mono basic sodium phosphate it is also called as mono basic sodium phosphate whereas in, in na2hpo4 there are uh, two sodium atoms so you can call it as di basic sodium phosphate So the other name of Na2HPO4 is dibasic sodium phosphate. Whereas if you look at uh, this molecular formula, that is Na3PO4, which was sodium trisodium phosphate. There are three sodium atoms, so it can also be called as tribasic sodium phosphate. Tribasic sodium phosphate. Now NaH2, since one sodium is there and uh, we have uh, produced it by replacing one hydrogen atom this uh, NaH2PO4 is also called as primary sodium phosphate it is also called as primary sodium phosphate whereas here we have produced this compound by replacing two hydrogen atoms so it is also called as secondary sodium phosphate now the last compound we have produced by replacing three hydrogen atoms so it is also called as tertiary sodium phosphate so these are the three names of each of this compound so uh, nh2po4 is also is called as sodium dihydrogen phosphate or monobasic sodium phosphate or simply primary sodium phosphate similarly these two compounds also have three names or oh, it is also called as uh, with the different names so these are the three names for each of this compound now coming to the first compound that is sodium dihydrogen phosphate and the second compound also disodium hydrogen phosphate mainly these com uh, two compounds are mainly used in buffer solutions they are, they are used in buffer solutions to prepare buffer solutions because they can control the H plus ions in the solution so they both of them are used in buffer solutions preparation of buffer solutions whereas uh, na3po4 mainly it is a saline laxative it is a saline laxative sorry it is a saline laxative it is used as a saline laxative and it is uh, uh, this property this laxity property could be used to uh, uh, cl cleanse the um, uh, colon before colonoscopy okay to uh, clean the colon before the colonoscopy okay so this is the use of uh, uh, na3po4 it is used as a saline laxity and also used to prepare the bowel before colonoscopy whereas uh, nh2po4 and uh, na2hpo4 they are used in buffer solutions now how this three compounds are prepared so let's take the first one that is uh, nh2po4 the second compound was uh, Na2HPO4 and the third compound was Na3PO4. Now, how this three sodium salt of phosphoric acid is prepared? Okay, so you simply take 
phosphoric acid that is H3PO4 treat it with sodium hydroxide you will get you will uh, the, this one hydrogen atom will be replaced from phosphoric acid and you will get NaH2PO4 and water molecule so here the molar ratio between phosphoric acid and sodium hydroxide is 1 is to 1 it is 1 is to 1 1 mole of H3PO4 and 1 mole of NaOH now if you uh, react if you do this reaction with uh, 1 mole of H3PO4 and 2 moles of sodium hydroxide that is the mole if the molar ratio is 1 is to 2 you will end up with uh, Na2HPO4 two sodium atoms will come here will be replacing this hydrogen so it will be Na2HPO4 and uh, water molecule now if you treat phosphoric acid with uh, 3 moles of sodium hydroxide three hydrogens will be replaced and you will get Na3PO4 and three moles of water that means to prepare Na3PO4 you need to use the molar ratio of 1 is to 3 so this is how the sodium salt of phosphoric acid is prepared you treat it with the sodium hydroxide at a different molar ratio you will be able to get the different salt in 1 is to 1 ratio you will get NaH2PO4 in 1 is to 2 ratio you will get Na2HPO4 and in 1 is to 3 you will get Na3 PO4. Now coming back to our question, which of the following is called as the primary sodium phosphate? So we have already discussed that uh, sodium dihydrogen phosphate or mono basic sodium phosphate with the molecular formula NaH2PO4 is also called as the primary sodium phosphate. So the correct answer will be B choice NaH2PO4. B choice NaH2PO4 is the is also called as the primary sodium phosphate. The question is which of the following is an octapeptide? A choice oxytocin, B choice vasopressin, C choice glutathione, D choice angiotensin 2 and E choice bradykinin. So first of all we need to know what is a what is a peptide or what is an octapeptide okay so before coming to know what is an octapeptide we need to know what is a peptide okay so normally peptides as you all know peptides are basically they are chains of amino acids they are chains of amino acids that means amino acids are linked together to form peptides now how they are linked together by by a bone called as peptide bond so if amino acids are linked together by a peptide bone that is called as a peptide so for example let us assume this is one amino acid this is another amino acid this is a third amino acid and if they are linked together by a peptide bone like this peptide bone like this this is a peptide bone then we can call it as then we can call it as a peptide now my question is what is the minimum number of amino acid that is required to form a peptide yes the answer is 2 so this is the first amino acid and this is the second amino acid and if they are linked together by a peptide bone they could be considered as a peptide that means the minimum um, uh, number of amino acid that is required to form a peptide the answer is 2 and such peptide which is formed by two amino acids are called as they are called as dipeptides and that means in dipeptides the number of amino acids are two okay now similarly so as we told uh, di in dipeptides the number of amino acid is two two amino acids are there in the case of uh, tripeptide the number of amino acids will be three when the number of amino acids are formed and they are linked by peptide bone that is called as a tetrapeptide they are called as tetrapeptide if the number of, number of amino acids are 5 then it is called as a pentapeptide if the number of amino acids are 6 then it is called as hexapeptide similarly if the number of amino acids are 7 it is called as heptapeptide whereas if the number of amino acids are uh, 8 and they are linked by peptide bone that peptide is called as oct 
octapeptide. That means in octapeptide, the number of amino acids are 8. And assume that if there are 9 amino acids and they are linked by peptide bone, such peptides are called as nonapeptide. So in nonapeptide, the number of amino acids are 9. Similarly, if 10 amino acids are there and they are linked by peptide bone, they are called as decapeptide. Okay. So, remember the number of amino acid uh, present in each of these peptides. Now, uh, coming to the important examples for each of this peptide, let us take the first example that is a dipeptide. So, as we have told, there are the, the number of amino acids are 2 and the important examples of dipeptides are, one is aspartam. So aspartam, you know that it is an artificial sweetener. It is an artificial sweetener. It is used as an artificial sweetener. So in aspartam, the number of amino acids are 2. So aspartam is, is an example for dipeptide. Another example for dipeptide is carnosin. Carnosin. Carnosin is an antioxidant. Carnosin is an antioxidant and it is made up of two amino acid therefore carnosin is an example for dipeptide now coming to the uh, next uh, peptide that is tripeptide that means the number of amino acids are three and the important example you need to remember is uh, glutathione so glutathione is an example for Glutathione is an example for tripeptide and glutathione is in fact an antioxidant. So the glutathione antioxidant is an example for tripeptide and it is made up of three amino acid. One more example if you could remember the, thi the hormone, the thyrotropin releasing hormone, TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone also contains three amino acid. Therefore, TRH is also an example for tripeptides. Now coming to the next uh, uh, peptide that is the tetrapeptide. So tetrapeptide you know that uh, the number of amino acids are 4 and the important example you, you can remember is en endomorphins. Endomorphins are examples for tetrapeptide that means four amino acids are there so basically endomorphins are uh, they are op uh, natural or op endogenous opioid neuropeptides they are opioid neuropeptide they are natural that is endogenous opioid neuropeptides so endomorphins uh, mainly endomorphin 1 and endomorphin 2 they are made up of four amino acid so they belongs to the tetrapeptide category. Now coming to the next peptide that is pentapeptide. So as discussed the number of amino acids in pentapeptide will be definitely 5 and the important examples you need to remember is encephalins. So encephalins are examples for pentapeptide that means it is made up of uh, 5 amino acid. Similar to uh, endomorphins these are also opioid neuropeptides endogenous opioid neuropeptides same as that of endomorphins. Endomorphins was also an opioid neuropeptide and encephalins are also opioid neuropeptide and that is an example for pentapeptides. Now coming to the um, uh, next one that is the six, uh, hexapeptide that means it is made up of 6 uh, amino acids so hexapeptide me are peptides that which are made up of six amino acids and the examples you need to remember are angiotensin 4 it is not that important but uh, try to remember angiotensin 4 remember the numerical it is 4 angiotensin 4 is an example for hexapeptide now coming to the uh, uh, seven amino acid containing peptide that is heptapeptide seven amino acid and the example is angiotensin 3 angiotensin 3 okay now coming to the uh, eight amino acid containing peptide that is octapeptide this is very important octapeptide the number of amino acids are eight 
and uh, the important example you need to remember here is angiotensin 2 this is very commonly it's more abundant and it is a very important uh, angiotensinogen peptide that is angiotensin 2 so angiotensin 2 is very important you need to remember the number of amino acid present in angiotensin 2 is 8 so they are they belong to octapeptide category in fact this angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor in our body it is a potent vasoconstrictor it constrict the blood vessels it's a potent vasoconstrictor so that the bp will increase angiotensin 2 is an octapeptide and it is a potent vasoconstrictor now coming to the I mean, uh, um, peptide with uh, 9 amino acids, yes, as discussed it is called as nonapeptide. The peptide with the 9 amino acid is called as nonapeptides. And the important examples are oxytocin, vasopressin, oxytocin and vasopressin so was the oxytocin and vasopressin you know that it is secreted by the posterior pituitary gland posterior pituitary they contain nine amino acid and they belong to the nonapeptide category one more example you need to remember in the case of uh, nonapeptide is bradykinin so bradykinins are basically inflammatory mediators they are also a potent vasodilator it's a potent vasodilator and they are basically the mediators for inflammation and they contain nine amino acids so they belongs to nonapeptide category so oxytocin vasopressin and bradykinin they are examples for nonapeptide now coming to the last one that is the the peptide made up of uh, uh, 10 amino acid yes the answer is decapeptide so decapeptide contains 10 amino acids and the important examples are angiotensin 1 angiotensin 1 and gonadotropin releasing hormone gnrh so gnrh and angiotensin 1 contains 10 amino acid and they belongs to the category called as decapeptide now so these are the important peptides um, we have started with dipeptide tripeptide tetrapeptide pentapeptide hexa hepta octa nona and the finally the decapeptide now apart from this um, these peptides you need to remember a couple of uh, other hormones also as well as some peptides which contains amino acids now the important ones are certain pancreatic hormones so the, in the you know that the pancreatic cells or islets of pancreas contains mainly three cells one is alpha cells the second one is beta cells and the third one is delta cells you know that beta cells secrete which hormone yes insulin beta cells of pancreas secrete insulin what about alpha glucagon alpha cell secrete glucagon and delta cell secrete somatostatin somatostatin so alpha cells of pancreas secrete uh, glucagon then beta cell secrete insulin and delta cell secrete somatostatin all these are actually peptides uh, glucagon insulin and somatostatins are basically peptides and uh, glucagon is made up of 29 amino acids 29 amino acid whereas insulin is made up of 51 amino acids whereas somatostatin is made up of 14 amino acids somatostatin is also called as growth hormone inhibiting hormone growth hormone inhibiting hormone it is other name of stomatostatin so glucagon contain 29 amino acid insulin 51 and somatostatin 14 amino acid apart from this thing you need to remember um, other some of other hormones like the adreno the adreno corticotropic hormone ACTHs so ACTH contain 39 amino acids 39 amino acid and one more hormone you need to remember is uh, uh, calcitonin calcitonin hormone is also a peptide hormone and it is made up of 32 amino acids 32 amino acid whereas ACTH is made up of 39 amino acid apart from this you need to remember uh, two uh, couple of GI peptides like secretin and gastrin 
so there are also uh, peptides uh, gastrointestinal peptides and secretin is uh, made up of uh, 27 amino acids whereas gastrin is made up of uh, 17 amino acids so they are all peptides ACTH calcitonin secretin gastrin all these pancreatic hormones they are they are all peptides now one more thing you need to remember about uh, the amino acids the number of amino acids present in certain um, proteins like one the very important one is hemoglobin so hemoglobin is actually a protein it, it is made up of a large number of amino acids and the, if the question is what is the exact number of amino acids present in hemoglobin the answer is 574 574 hemoglobin is made up of 574 574 amino acid whereas myoglobin they are transport proteins all these hemoglobin myoglobin transport proteins and myoglobin is made up of 153 amino acids 153 amino acid so remember the number of amino acids present in hemoglobin as well as myoglobin apart from this couple of antibiotics like uh, actinomycin D so this is an anti-cancer anti and actinomycin D. Actinomycin D is an anti-cancer antibiotic. It is also a peptide and the number of amino acids present in actinomycin D is 20. Actinomycin D is also called as dactinomycin. They are anti-cancer antibiotic. Now one more thing, uh, anti one, one antibacterial antibiotic called as bacitracin is also a peptide. Bacitracin is also a peptide and it is made up of 16 amino acids okay so the number of amino acid in hemoglobin 574 myoglobin 153 actinomycin d 20 and bacitracin uh, 16 so these are the important uh, proteins peptides and which are and the number of amino acid present in each of these now coming to our question which of the following is an octa peptide octa means the number of amino acid is 8 now we have told that oxytocin contains uh, 9 amino acids, vasopressin contains 9 amino acids, the other name of vasopressin is what? Yes, antidiuretic hormone ADH, so it contains uh, 9, glutathione is a tripeptide that means uh, 3 amino acids, bradykinin we have told it is uh, made up of uh, 9 amino acids. Angiotensin 2 is very important. It's a potent vasoconstrictor and it is made up of 8 amino acid. Therefore, it is an example for octapeptide. So, the correct answer for this question is definitely D choice angiotensin 2. This question is which of the following is more potent? More potent. A choice morphine, B choice alphandanate. C choice ramifentanyl, D choice fentanyl, E choice sufentanyl, and e, F choice carfentanyl. So first of all, we can uh, we need to know more. We, we know that morphine is a potent opioid analgesic. It is a potent opioid analgesic. It's a strong painkiller. It's a potent opioid analgesic. However, Compared to morphine, this fentanyl group of drugs, fentanyl group of drugs, fentanyl group of drugs are in fact, they are more potent compared to morphine. They are more potent than morphine. So this is the first point you need to under, under, understand. Fentanyls are more potent than morphine. Now let us compare the relative potency of this fentanyl group. So you can remember this mnemonic CSF, CSF, RAM, RAM, CSF, RAM. Okay. So C stands for carfentanyl. S stands for sufentanyl. F stands for fentanyl. R stands for ramifentanyl. A stands for alfentanyl. And M stands for morphine. So let us analyze the relative potency of each. The relative potency. 
so as i've already told fentanyls are more potent compared to morphine so let us assume uh, the morphine has a potency of 1 1x x let us put it put it as x so now compared to morphine this alfentanyl is 20 times more potent compared to morphine therefore it would be 20x so compared to morphine alfentanyl is 20 times more potent now ramifentanyl is 100 times more potent than morphine so it is 100x whereas fentanyl is, uh, is also 100 times more potent than morphine so rami fentanyl and uh, ra, uh, fentanyl are 100 times more potent to morphine so it is 100x whereas su fentanyl is 1000 times more potent compared to morphine 1000 times more potent com uh, compared to morphine whereas car fentanyl it is 10000 times more potent compared to morphine so we can remember this mnemonic csf ram morphine is x alfentanyl 20x ramifentanyl 100x fentanyl is also 100x su fentanyl 1000 times and car fentanyl 10000 times so among this fentanyl the most potent fentanyl is car fentanyl most potent so it is 10000 times more potent compared to morphine now coming back to our question which of the following is more potent as i have told morphine is x uh, 20 times x rami fentanyl is also just 100 times fentanyl is 100 times su fentanyl is 1000 times whereas car fentanyl is 10000 times so the correct answer for this question is f choice car fentanyl which is the is the more potent fentanyl group of drugs this question is which of the following is poly oxyethylene sorbitan monosterate a choice between 20 b choice between 40 c choice between 60 d choice between 80 and e choice span 80 so from this choice first you need to understand what kind of uh, compound they are tweens and spans so basically they are surfactants they are surfactant compounds so surfactant means they can decrease the surface tension surfactant is also called as surface active active agents surface active agents or surfactants they have the ability to decrease the surface tension now tween and span it's coming to the tween and span they are surfactant as we told they are surfactant tweens and spans they have surfactants and the surfactants are of different types like anionic surfactant is there cationic surfa surfactant is there however tween and span belongs to a category called as non-ionic surfactant non-ionic surfactant so teens and spans are examples for non-ionic surfactants now let us look at uh, each of this uh, example let's take span as the first example span so span they are actually non-ionic surfactant and it is an ester it is an ester compound it is an ester compound now what is an ester ester is basically you know that it is formed by the uh, combination of the hydroxyl group and the carboxyl group so hydroxy group and the carboxyl group combine to form or condense to form the ester compound okay so span is uh, is basically an ester span also, and as well as teen is also an ester actually now the ester of which alcoholic group and which carboxyl group so, so span is, the alcoholic group comes from this a compound called as sorbitan and the carboxyl group comes from the coh of fatty acids fatty acid so the, that means span is the ester compound or ester of alcoholic group of sorbitan and the acid group of fatty acids now there are different types of uh, spans uh, one is a span 20 the bottom ones are span 20 span 40 span 60 and span 80 now the difference uh, uh, what about the difference in this number is based on the which fatty acids sir okay so if it is 20 the fatty acid will be basically the the fatty acid will be lauric acid 
If it is 40, the fatty acid will be palmitic acid. And if the number is 60, the fatty acid will be stearic acid. And if the number is 80, the fatty acid will be oleic acid. Okay. So, you please remember 20, 40, 60, 80. You can remember this mnemonic LPSO, LPSO. So, uh, if it is 20, it is L, 40, P, 60, S and 80. Okay. LPSO. Okay. So, this number 20, 40, 60, 80 indicates the fatty acids used. Okay, fatty acids in that particular compound. Okay, so once again we revise. Uh, span is the ester of the alcoholic group of sorbitan and the acid group of fatty acids, and mainly lauric acid, palmitic acid, stearic acid, and oleic acids are the fatty acids involved. Let's look at uh, each of the span. So the first one we told is um, span twenty. Span twenty. So span twenty, as I already told, it is an ester of sorbitan and the fatty acid. So it is called as Sorbitan, sorbitan monolaurate. So span 20 is chemically sorbitan monolaurate. Whereas span 40 is sorbitan monopalmitate. Whereas span 60 is sorbitan monosterate whereas span 80 is chemically sorbitan monoileate okay so i uh, told you lpso 20 40 60 80 so it is chemically sorbitan mono fatty acid ester sorbitan monolaurate monopalmitic monosterate and monoileate so that is the difference between span 20 40 60 and 80 now coming to the next uh, non ionic surfactant that is um, uh, tweens the first thing you need to understand if you add to the span surfactant if you add uh, a 20 molecules of 20 molecules of ethylene oxide 20 molecules of ethylene oxide into the the span surfactant that it will become tween so tween is nothing but the combination of span plus 20 molecules of ethylene oxide. One more point you need to remember when you add this ethylene oxide, when you add this ethylene oxide, the water solubility will increase. So, ethylene oxide will increase the water solubility. Increase the water solubility. So, ethylene oxide uh, increase the water solubility. Therefore, tweens are more soluble compared to span. Tweens are more soluble compared to the span compound because teens contains teen surfactant contains ethylene oxide ethylene oxide increases the water solubility so among span and tween if the question is which is more water soluble the answer is uh, tween now let us look at uh, the different types of uh, tweens so just uh, uh, like what we have mentioned for the span tweens are of tween 20 tween 40 tween 60 tween 80 so here, uh, apart from the sorbitan groups, apart from the sorbitan group, that ethylene oxide has come. Since 20 ethylene oxide has come, we will call it as poly, poly compounds, polyoxyethylene. So uh, tween 20 is polyoxyethylene because 20 molecules of ethylene oxide are there. So polyoxyethylene, the remaining part will be the span, that is sorbitan mono. And whenever 20 comes, the fatty acid will be, yeah, which one? Yes, laurate. So, mono laurate. So, tween 20 is chemically polyoxyethylene sorbitan mono laurate. Simply sorbitan mono laurate, I told you, it is span 20. Now, if you add 20 molecules of ethylene oxide, it will become uh, tween 20. Similarly, uh, tween 40 is polyoxyethylene sorbitan mono, yes, 40 means it will be palmitate monopalmitic. Similarly, tween 60 will be polyoxyethylene sorbitan monosterate and 80 will be polyoxyethylene sorbitan mono, yes 80 stands for oleate, oleate. Okay. So, you can remember LPSO 20, 40, 60, 80. Only thing if it is span, 
you can just write sorbitan the chemical name will be sorbitan mono fatty acid whatever fatty acid if it is tree you need to add the word poly oxyethylene you need to add poly oxyethylene along with the span that is sorbitan okay so that is the difference between tween surfactant and um, uh, span surfactant now coming back to our question uh, which of the following is uh, poly oxyethylene sorbitan so simply uh, simply sor sorbitan monosterate means sorbitan stearate means it will be span it will be span and uh, as i told you lpso 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 stearate will come at the 60, so it will be span 60. Now, if you add a polyoxyethylene group to this, if you add a polyethylene oxide or ethylene oxide to this thing, span 60 will become tween 60. So, the correct answer for this question will be C choice tween 60. Okay. This question is which of the following type of glass, glass containers, which of the following type of glass containers is used in the pharmaceutical preparation is called as treated soda line glass a choice type 1 glass b choice type 2 glass c choice type 3 glass and d choice type 4 glass so first of all you need to know uh, as per the usp united states pharmacopoeia glass containers used in the pharmaceutical preparations can be of four types glass containers used in the pharmaceutical preparations are of four types they are one is type 1 glass the second one is uh, type 2 glass the third one is type 3 glass and the fourth one is type 4 glass so these are the four types of glass glass containers as per the USP now which are the what is this type 1 type 2 type 3 and type 4 so type 1 actually it is made up of borosilicate glass so it is also called as type 1 is also called as borosilicate glass so borosilicate glass is nothing but the type 1 glass now type 2 glass is the treated soda line glass type 2 glass is also called as treated soda line glass now type 3 is called, also called as regular soda line glass whereas type 4 is also called as general purpose soda line glass so these are the different types of glass containers and the names of each of these glass containers now you can remember uh, this mnemonic uh, type 1 every institute has one Bose so you can remember one for Bose Bose means borosilicate borosilicate so one you can remember type 1 is borosilicate now coming to type 2 2 you can write it like TWO to, so 2 for treated so T T. Okay, so type 2 glass is uh, the treated soda line glass. Now coming to the type 3, you can remember 3 roses. 3 roses. Type 3 is 3 roses. R means roses means regular. So type 3 is regular soda line glass. Whereas type 4, you can remember 4G connection. 4G connects. Type 4, 4G connection. G means general purpose soda line glass so one bose two for two treated three rows r means regular and four g means four type four is called a general purpose uh, soda line glass general purpose soda line glass okay so these are the different glass containers and their uh, names actually now what all for what all purpose this uh, different glass containers are used so let's look into that normally type one glass is mainly used for the parental purposes type 1 they are mainly for parental purpose that is for the like water for injection so type 1 the borosilicate glass mainly used for the parental purpose parental use water for injection is an example for that also it is used for the lab uh, glass apparatus in the lab uh, mainly the glass apparatus what you use are made up of borosilicate glass so that is belongs to the type 1 
Now coming to the type 2, type 2, type 2 is the treated soda lime glass, mainly they are uh, mainly used as uh, for infusion fluids. Type 2 glass, the treated soda lime glass is mainly for is used for the infusion fluids like the blood, plasma, etc. Okay, so mainly for the infusion fluids, they are also used for large volume as a, as a large volume containers, large volume containers. So type two glass or the treated soda line glass mainly for the infusion fluids. Now coming to the type three. Type three is the three for uh, roses. So regular soda line glass. They are mainly for solid dosage forms. solid dosage forms like uh, tablets powders so these are the purpose of type 3 or regular soda line glass now coming to the type 4 type 4 type 4 we have told general purpose soda line glass mainly for uh, non parental use non parental use so mainly this uh, um, oral prepar preparations or the topical preparations are mainly uh, filled in this type 4 glass mainly non parental use type 4 glass okay so these are the important points you need to remember with respect to type 1 uh, the, the different types of glass containers type 1 type 2 type 3 type 4 the different names of each of this glass and the different purposes for which this glass containers are used so coming back to our question answer discussion here the question is uh, which of the glass containers is called as uh, treated soda lime glass so i asked you to remember treated you can remember two two can be written as tw so t and t so the correct answer for this question will be b choice type two glass this question is which of the following is not a neurodegenerative disease not a neurodegenerative disease a choice alzheimer's disease b choice als c choice huntington's chorea d choice prion's disease and e choice none of the above so first of all we need to understand what is a neurodegenerative disease neurodegenerative disorder or neurodegenerative disease so they are basically they are caused by the loss of neurons loss of neurons or loss of the nervous cell or degeneration of neurons degeneration of neurons so this will result in various complications and uh, the important neurodegenerative disease includes number one is uh, parkinson disease Parkinson's disease, it's a neurodegenerative disease. Number two, Alzheimer's disease, Alzheimer's disease, it's a neurodegenerative disease. Another important one is uh, Huntington's chorea, Huntington's chorea disease. Another important one is uh, amyotropic lateral sclerosis amyotrophic lateral sclerosis amyotrophic lateral sclerosis abbreviated as ALS another one is multiple sclerosis multiple sclerosis abbreviated as MS okay so for the time being let's look uh, look into what all these uh, disorders so as you all know in parkinson in parkinson disease there will be decrease or the loss of uh, dopaminergic neuron dopaminergic neuron so loss or the decrease of dopaminergic neuron results in parkinson disease now coming to alzheimer's disease one reason is the deposition of amyloid plaques in the hippocampus another reason is that there will be loss of or the loss of cholinergic neurons loss of cholinergic neurons so apart from the deposition of amyloid plaques there will be loss of cholinergic neurons in the case of alzheimer's disease now coming to huntington's chorea here there will be loss of gabaergic neurons 
GABA ergic neurons. Now you all know that GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter and there will be loss of a GABA ergic neurons resulting in Huntington scoria. Whereas in the case of ALS, there will be loss of neurons. There will be loss of neurons in the spinal cord. In the spinal cord. Medulla cortex spine cerebral cortex so loss of neurons in the spinal cord medulla cortex results in uh, result in this kind of uh, ame amyotropic lateral sclerosis which is a motor neuron disease als is a motor neuron disease characterized characterized by the loss of neurons in spinal cord medulla cortex uh, now coming to the multiple sclerosis so here basically there will be loss of myelin sheath in the neuron loss of myelin sheath so as you all know myelin sheath is a covering over the axons so the loss of myelin sheath in the neurons will cause uh, multiple sclerosis that is also called as a demyelination loss of myelin sheath is called as demyelination okay now another important uh, 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 neurodegenerative disease include uh, prion's disease prion's disease so that is also a neurodegenerative disease Another one is called as SMA, abbreviated form is SMA, that is nothing but spinal cord, spinal, sorry, spinal muscular atrophy, spinal muscular atrophy, abbreviated as SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. Another one is uh, spino cerebellar ataxia so these are all examples for neurodegenerative disease prion's disease sma spinal muscular atrophy and the spino cerebral ataxia and the common uh, neurodegenerative commonly seen neurodegenerative disease include parkinson disease alzheimer's disease huntington's chorea als and multiple sclerosis now coming back to your question which of the following is not a neurodegenerative disease so as you know uh, as we have discussed alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative disease als the abbreviated form of amyotropic lateral sclerosis is a neurodegenerative disease huntington's chorea is a neurodegenerative disease Brian's disease is also a neurodegenerative disease. So the correct answer for this question will be E choice, none of the above. Thank you.